introduction of my story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler So many books have been written on the War of the Rebellion that, at first thought, another on the same subject might seem unnecessary and of no interest. Yet, what is there of the unwritten history of the two and three-quarter millions of brave men who gave up all for their country and for our country? What is there of their dark and anxious hours, their secret meditations, their silent tears at the midnight watch, and their anxious hearts aching for victory, country, and home. Perhaps that explains why we find a fascination in each new tale of experiences, in the dull monotony of drill and camp routine, of the wear and tear of exhausting marches through heat, blinding dust, rain and sleet, and through hail and drifting snow, of the dash and dangers of skirmish and picket line, and of the roar, shock, and smoke of battle. We feel that this volume should possess a new interest from the fact that it is written from the ranks, of things one could feel as well as see, and not by higher officers on horse, well-fed and comfortably bedded, or by war correspondents looking through a glass, neither of whom could sympathetically appreciate a tithe of the trials and hardships of a private soldier's life. For more than three years preceding the war, I acquired the habit of keeping a diary, and from the day I enlisted gave it special care and attention on reaching home the last time it was laid by and hardly referred to until one year ago when I began to copy and rewrite, as I then supposed for my grandchildren. But in doing this, it grew into a larger and more interesting volume than I had anticipated. Since its completion, I have been urged by so many to offer it to the public that I have finally concluded to do so. I cannot very well eliminate my little love story or the little girl from this volume. It would spoil it for every old soldier. She must have a place in my book, as she later became the best part of my life, until death separated us. I sincerely regret that I could not bring in every member of Company A to whom I owe a debt of gratitude for their many acts of kindness that will never be forgotten and can never be paid in this world. But to do this would fill many volumes, so I have confined myself only to those incidents which came under my personal observation. End of Introduction Chapter 1 of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad. Chapter 1 Ours was a very silent breakfast on the 5th of September, 1861. At the table on my right side was Prentice, my only brother, older than I by three years. Next to him sat his young wife, and at the head of the table opposite me, our mother, looking pale and worn. She had passed a sleepless night, for Prentice had told her, on our return from the village, 
late the evening before that I had enlisted for three years and must leave that morning. She only pretended to eat, realizing that was my last breakfast under the old roof for a long time and perhaps the very last. Once or twice she tried to speak, but her voice failed her, and as I felt the tears coming into my own eyes, I arose from the table and passed into the next room. Mother immediately followed, and after one or two painful efforts, said in broken tones, Prentice tells me you have enlisted. I could not speak, could only answer by a half-conscious nod. Her head was resting on her hand when her tears were falling rapidly. As soon as I could speak, I said, Oh, mother, mother, don't. Do not grieve so. I did not know. I did not realize that you would suffer so. In my zeal to serve and save our country, I had forgotten my duty to you. Forgive me, mother. I should have told you many weeks ago of my intentions. I could say no more. My heart was too full. I have expected it for a long time, she said, and have been looking forward with dread to this hour. Oh, Marion, how can I? How can I give you up and still I know I must? If my own blood and my own life would satisfy our country's needs, how willingly would I make the sacrifice? Have you thought how much it means to you? Have you carefully counted the cost, the dangers, the privations, the hardships and sufferings you must endure, the giving up of home and friends and all the possibilities of the future for perhaps an unknown grave. There may be months of suffering from burning fever and painful wounds, or in the prison pen where only God can reach to pity, to save and comfort you. Have you the moral courage to endure all this for your country? I was walking the floor, dashing the tears from my eyes, and could only say, Oh, mother, but her words flowed on like a torrent, and she continued, Marion, can you stand erect and face the storm and shock of battle? Can you obey orders when it means to charge the enemy's lines and works against storms of balls, shells, grape, and canister? I speak of these things at greater length that you may be prepared to do your duty without a murmur or complaint, but... Oh, Marion, my dear son, it's not on account of all this I fear for you. She hesitated. The tears started from her eyes, and her voice gave way. What is it, mother? Speak on. Tell me all. Tell me the worst you fear and dread that I may be stronger and on my guard. Oh, the vices, the profanity, the gambling... I would rather a thousand times you'd fall in battle in the line of duty than to have you return home a victim of vice and vicious habits, a drunkard and a gambler. Oh, my son, that would kill me. It would kill me. I sprang to her side, knelt at her feet, put my arms gently around her neck as her head was bowed down on her hands, kissed her, and then controlled my voice to speak. Don't, mother, don't grieve so. I can't stand it. I would rather fight all the rebels in every battle in civil war and endure all that you have pictured out before me than see you suffer so. Forgive me, she said, as she raised her face to mine. I will try to be brave and bear it, as you must be brave and bear so much. With the tears running down my face, I said, Mother, I now promise you, not in my strength, but by the help of him whom you so early taught me to love, obey, and reverence, that no act of mine shall ever cause you to blush in shame. You have been a good, kind, and faithful mother, 
And since father died, you have had a double care. To part with you now, with the uncertainty of ever returning, is the greatest trial and hardest battle I shall have to fight. It is not from a sudden impulse that I go. Ever since the first gun was fired on Fort Sumter, and more especially since the humiliating defeat of our army at Bull Run, I have felt that I must go, and only for your sake have deferred so long. I am young, healthy, stout, and unmarried. Why should I not go? Your father and father's father were both through the revolution. They did all they could to give us a good government. Why should I not help to defend it and save it? Mother, I am proud of the patriotic blood that coursed through your veins and father's, which so generously transmitted to us. And now I submit to you, if you were in my place, unmarried as I am, young and healthy, could you stay at home? Wouldn't you go? I was walking the floor. Slowly and tremblingly, she arose to her feet and throwing her arms around my neck said, Yes, my son, you may go. I know and feel that I can trust you. Then, mother, with your permission and blessing, I will go cheerfully. As the conveyance drove up to the door, she took both my hands in hers and said, as she looked me in the face, Yes, my son, go, and may God bless and keep you. And do not forget that morning, noon, and night your mother is praying for you. I kissed her tenderly and sprang into the wagon with my brother, my cousin, Stephens Wright, who had enlisted with me the night before, and Lewis, a near neighbor's son who had not yet enlisted. With a long hilly road before us, we could not reach town before noon. Prentice, Stephens, Lewis, and Wright kept up quite a brisk conversation, mostly concerning the war and its probable results. Prentice made the statement, I firmly believe that we shall save the Union in the end, but the conflict will be long and severe, and I pray God that in this great struggle for supremacy, slavery may be destroyed. I listened to their conversation for an hour or so, as we moved slowly along over the rough, stony road, but could take no part. My feelings had been too deeply stirred during the morning, and my heart was too sore. Mother's last words were continually ringing in my ears while I was thus thinking to myself, if I should become so low, debauched, and degraded as some men I had seen, I would richly deserve the bitterest contempt of every vile cur in, in the land, for I could have no excuse. As I was thus musing, we reached the hotel barn at a quarter to eleven, giving us an hour to look around before dinner. We soon met Captain Crosswaite, a veteran of the Mexican War with whom I had a slight acquaintance. He greeted me with a hearty handshake. I then presented to him my young friend who had just left the academy to enlist in our company. The captain gave him a cordial welcome and invited us to his office where young Lewis put down his name on the roll. We all went to the hotel for our dinner as it was not quite ready, I stepped out to the desk, took the Bible that mother gave me from my pocket, and with pen and ink wrote on the fly leaf her parting words, and signed my name in full. An hour after dinner, the parting by brother and cousin at the barn was a severe trial. The mist gathered in my eyes and my voice trembled while giving them the messages to deliver to my friends. My brother, seeing that I was liable to break down, took me by the arm and led me away a few steps out of hearing. Is there anything you wish to say to me in confidence before we part? Or, to speak more plainly, have you formed any attachment that you would wish me to know? 
Thank you, Prentice, for your kindness and interest. Yes, a word to you would relieve my mind. You remember May? You have seen her often. She is as good as she is beautiful. She is very young, not yet seventeen, and will attend the academy next term. She is a warm friend of mine. I claim nothing more. Be kind to her, Prentice. She has no mother, and all her surroundings are not congenial. I shall write her as soon as I reach camp. Well, said Prentice, I have not been indifferent to your partiality to May. She is a noble girl, and more of a woman at less than seventeen than many women at forty. I notice, too, that she is very shy and cautious and possesses much more tact and real true beauty, grace and dignity than one girl in a hundred. I thank you, Prentice. You must have looked at her through my eyes. I fear several others may have the same opinion. Don't worry, Marion. I'm a close observer and can assure you the regard is by no means all on your side. Well, Prentice, if I live to get home and she lives, I... I did not finish the sentence. We had reached the barn. Now, boys, goodbye. We have played together from childhood, and we three have always been brothers and never have been separated before. This leaving home for what I knew... I must meet in the future, tearing oneself away from so many kind friends with such warm hearts requires more nerve than to stand up before a battery of rebel guns. Goodbye, boys. Drive on. I can't stand it any longer. They soon were out of my sight. End of chapter one. Chapter 2 of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Going to Camp Chapter 2 After the boys left us, Lewis and I felt quite alone and wandered around town, dropping into the groceries shops, and stores, and in nearly every one we found a few volunteers who seemed to be inclined to knot together in twos and threes, all very reticent. There was no hilarity, no boisterous conversation. In fact, I was much surprised at the quiet character of each little group, and then I said to myself, perhaps the boys may feel much as I do, Maybe they are thinking of the pleasant homes they have left, of the many warm friends they may never meet again, of the future possibilities, long cherished but now annihilated, of father's last farewell, mother's last message and embrace, and sister's tears and sobs as the doors closed. Oh, there was enough to think about, and I, myself, thought how I wanted to be all alone, where I could commune with myself and my God, where I might, unobserved, indulge in a few tears, just to ease that little ache in my heart. I loved my home and friends as my life, and to part from them thus was a hard and cruel necessity. Duty and love of country were the only incentive. The adventure and thirteen dollars per month promised could not be considered as against the sacrifice. We spent an hour or so witnessing a drill on the east side of the public square by the captain and an ex-Mexican soldier, and then a long time watching the farmers pour into town from all directions until the sun dropped behind the hills. At 8 p.m. our recruits numbered about 40. At 9 we went to the hotel where the boys were gathered, and then fixing their blankets on the floors for their first bivouac, 
Thus ended my first day as a soldier, the longest and most exciting I ever witnessed. Going out after breakfast, we found the town filling up with teams and people from the country. Twenty more recruits came in early, making in all about sixty. Some ten good teams and wagons lined up along the main street, one being loaded with provisions. The public square and main streets were full of people, who were there to bid their sons, husbands, and friends farewell. For thirty or forty minutes the scene was truly heartrending, exceeding anything I ever witnessed. Parents parting with their boys, young wives with their husbands, sisters giving the parting kiss in tears, and somebody's sister parting with somebody's brother, and if his arm did steal gently around her neck or waist, no one made remarks. All were sad, and every heart was full of sorrow. More pathetic than all was a mother of a fine and cultured appearance, parting with her son, the last and youngest of three. Her husband and two elders had enlisted in the same company and regiment. The father was killed in his first battle. One son escaped, and the other was captured. And now, God pity her, she was giving her youngest, and all she had to her country. Who on earth could give more? Only a few steps from her was a young wife, parting from her husband, a fine, manly fellow about twenty-three or four years of age. Close by were two lovely girls parting with their betrothed. I think I never saw more anguish real, deep, heartbreaking agony than was manifested by these two girls. Their sobs at parting melted my heart, and a flood of tears paid tribute to their sorrow. Oh, I can't stand it any longer, I thought to myself, turned around, and walked to the wagons, climbed into the one designated, and took my seat by the side of Lewis. My heart and head were full, and while I was thinking over what I had witnessed the last thirty minutes, one of the boys called my name and asked, Where are you at, and where are you going? Before I could gather my senses sufficiently to answer, the team started and we bade farewell to Angola. In looking around, I found our load consisted of eight, including the driver, Two strangers in the back seat, Alan Jim in the next, Lewis and I in the third from the rear, and Jap on the high seat with the driver. Al and Jim were brothers, both fresh from school. Both seemed cultured and refined in their appearance, and when I learned their names, I knew I had seen their father often. He was quite well known over the country as an ardent Union man, and radically opposed to slavery and the saloon. Of course, he had some enemies. When our train reached the crossing east of the little village of Pleasant Lake, we found a large gathering of men, women, and children who were there to greet us, and another load of provision which dropped into line and moved along with us. Al, Jim, Lewis, and I formed a group by ourselves, and soon were engaged in discussing the war and its different phases. Lewis asked the question, Do you think, boys, that the agitation of slavery by the North brought on the war? Or, in other words, are the abolition agitators responsible? Not in the least, said Al. The agitation of the slavery question has mostly been induced by the South asking and demanding more and more each session of Congress. The interests of the two systems, free and slave labor, are directly opposite. You remember Lincoln's words, a house divided cannot stand, a government cannot exist, half slave and half free? No, said Jim. 
The war was inevitable. It had to come. Southern supremacy and the arrogant rule of the slave power could not be suffered by the Almighty any longer. The hypocrisy of this nation in claiming to be a free government while holding four million souls in chains was an insult to heaven and a menace to our Christian civilization. Is it not a fact, said Lewis, that the southern states could not longer compete with the push, energy, and intelligence of the free states, and when they lost Kansas and Nebraska, slavery was doomed, unless they can win in this contest and succeed in founding a slaveholder's empire? A voice from the back seat. Don't you believe, boys, the nigger is the cause of the war? Ugh, said Jim. Did the Negroes fire on Fort Sumter on the 12th of last April? Did the slaves call conventions and pass ordinances of succession? Did they loot our national treasury, plunder our arsenals, and attempt to assassinate President Lincoln on his way to Washington? Well, responded the voice, a good many abolitionists went down south and stole their niggers and ran them to Canada. Is it not a fact, said Jim, that since the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law, more free Negroes have been stolen and sold into slavery than have actually been stolen and made free? My dear sir, please read an article entitled The Era of Slave Hunting by Horace Greeley, in which he shows plainly that there were very many men, north and south, who made it their special business to capture free Negro citizens, men, women, and children, and rush them into slavery? The Kentucky Yeoman, a democratic pro-slavery organ, said not more than two years ago that the work of arresting fugitives had become a regular business along the borderline between the slave and free states, and many of those engaged in this business were not at all particular as to the previous condition of those arrested. Well, said the voice, I'm not going to fight for the nigger. The father says, and he swears by Jefferson, that when this gets to be a nigger war, I had better come home. He thinks the North ought to and will rise up and stop it. Lewis, quite indignant at this remark, said, You, sir, ought not to have enlisted in the Union Army. Your place is farther south. You'll get this kind of stuff shot out of you in less than three months. This is a war, said Al, to save the Union and to save those who are trying to destroy it. Not waged by the government for conquest it is not a war to liberate the slaves, but those of us who live through it will find that it may be absolutely necessary to abolish slavery in order to save our government. Well, said Jim, I have not a single doubt as to the final result. I have faith in God, and that notwithstanding our unrighteousness, he will have mercy and save us, not with, but from, our great national sin. He will not side with the oppressor. We heard no more from our friend in the back seat. He and his partner had found a pack of cards and were entertaining themselves, occasionally using large adjectives to give emphasis. We were now well along in the next county with hard clay level roads and moved forward rapidly. The day was pleasant, the sun not too warm to be uncomfortable, and the boys generally enjoying themselves, some singing John Brown, the Star Spangled Banner, and Red, White, and Blue, while others were talking and laughing at someone's funny story. On reaching Waterloo, our train halted on the main street for a few minutes, while a large crowd of men, women, and children greeted us with warm-hearted cheers. Only a short stop here, 
and our wagons moved on to Auburn, the county seat, where our teams were cared for and we were most cordially received by the patriotic citizens who escorted us to seats under a large bowery. The chairman called the meeting in order to make a few remarks and then introduced Reverend Ward, a fine-appearing man with dark brown hair, full medium height and size, fascinating eyes and good, clear, soft voice that not only charmed but held his audience spellbound for thirty minutes. I had heard many welcome addresses, but few that excelled this. It came from the heart, and reached the heart of all those who heard it. He paid a very high tribute to Abraham Lincoln and his type of patriotism as compared with the infamous treasonable sectionalism of John C. Calhoun and his successors. He explained the cause of the war as he believed every soldier should understand why he was called upon to defend his country. He spoke of the so-called right to succeed and claimed that no such right ever did or can exist. Is one state greater than all the other states? Is a part of a government greater than the whole? He asked. If one or more states can lawfully succeed, then counties may succeed from states and townships from counties, and our government will be bound only by a rope of sand. In closing, he turned to the boys and addressed them in melting tones of love that warmed their hearts and brought tears from their eyes. I wish I could reproduce the last half of the address and photograph the faces that responded to the sentiments expressed. As soon as he closed, the boys crowded around and shook him by the hand, showing their appreciation of his remarks. We were then conducted to two large tables, loaded with everything good and substantial, and all being hungry, ate heartily and were filled. After rising, the captain proposed three cheers for the loyal ladies of the village, which was responded to with a will, and three more rousing cheers for the citizens. As we climbed into the wagon, Jim said he didn't know which was better, the dinner or the address. Lewis thought he could have lived through to camp without the address, but would have collapsed without the dinner. The spirits of the boys seemed to be softened down by the address and dinner, said Al, after an hour on the road. Their minds have turned into a purer channel. And so it was. We heard very little profanity and no cards, so far as we could see, had yet been introduced. The conversation became general and the kindliest feelings prevailed. We were all very ignorant of military organization and tactics. We knew nothing of platoons, squads, companies, regiments, battalions, brigades, etc. We knew as little of the duties of company officers, especially lieutenants and non-commissioned officers. Many questions were asked, but few were answered, for all alike were ignorant. Tiff thought he would rather be a sergeant than anything else. Jim asked, What is the sergeant's duties? Well, said Tiff, their duty is to assist the surgeons during battle in caring for the wounded. How many sergeants in a company? asked Lewis. Someone answered, Nine. How many companies in a regiment? was asked. Another answered, Ten. Thunder, said Jim, if it takes ninety sergeants to hold the wounded while two surgeons chop off their legs and arms during a battle, we must look a little out to provide wooden pegs to walk home on. And this led us down where we indulged in a hearty laugh. This was really the first hearty laugh I had indulged in since leaving home which seemed many days ago. From this on, the conversation was lively and cheerful. 
all taken apart, which shortened up the distance fully one half. Here is Spy Run, I said, which has borne that name since August 20th, 1794. Near here, on this creek below, the Indians were severely chastised by General Wayne on that date. I have made this crossing several times, and am glad to say that we are near our journey's end. And quite soon, after passing over a ridge, the city was plainly visible. Then the wide open common on the north, the river and bridge, a turn to the left, a turn to the right, then across the old canal, then one turn to the right again, and we stopped our procession in front of an old warehouse where we all got out, glad to be on the ground and straighten out our limbs. Rough board tables were soon provided, running the whole length of the building, on which our cooked provisions brought with us were soon loaded. We made coffee enough for seventy hungry men, and when this was ready, we helped ourselves to anything we liked. Roast chicken, boiled beef, biscuit and butter, pie, cake, and all kinds of sauce and jellies. It was a real picnic supper. We reached our quarters about sundown, and when supper was over and our things packed away, it was time to arrange our beds for the night. So much had been crowded into the last two days that they seemed the longest I ever had experienced. I find that days are frequently measured by events as well as hours and minutes. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. May, Chapter 3. To treat the subject of this chapter fairly, we must go back a few winters when the schoolmaster boarded around and taught from forty to sixty scholars for sixteen or eighteen dollars per month. My school that winter was six miles from home, if I went direct, but if I went by the way of May Gordon's home, it was seven. The Gordons, quite early, located some two miles from us, which made them quite near neighbors. There were three little girls in the family, Marge, May, and Floss. In three or four years from their arrival, the mother's health failed, and after a long illness, she passed away. As soon as I thought it would be proper, I called on the little girls for a play and visit, as had been my habit for a long time, having always received a warm welcome from the mother and children. I found them, on this occasion, clustered together in the little playhouse I had helped them build, all feeling very sad. May was sobbing while the others were trying to comfort her. I picked her up in my arms, as I had done a hundred times before, and carried her out to see the birds and gather some wild flowers. But every minute or two she would sob and the tears start from her eyes. Don't grieve so, my little girl. Will you tell me your trouble? My mother said before she went away that she'd come for me some day if I'd be a good girl. I've tried so hard to be good, and she hasn't come yet, and I'm so lonesome and tired waiting. But May, would you go away and leave me? Do you know that I would grieve for you just as you are now grieving for your mother? and feel just so very, very lonesome. I couldn't live if you'd go away. Why, Marion, do you love me so much? Yes, May, better than all the little girls and boys in this great big world of ours. Oh, I'm so glad of that. Now I'll not cry anymore. 
I didn't know that anybody loved me but Mother. No one has told me so but you. Mother always kissed me when she said she loved me, and then I knew it. There, Marion, I'm glad you did that. Now I know it, but I guess you had better not any more. It might not be proper for you. I know you love me now, and I'll try and be so good and happy. As I started to go home, May clung to my neck till I promised I'd come back the next day. And I continued my visits as often as I could for a year or so until the father married a widow with one child, a daughter about May's age. Then he soon sold his place and bought a larger one out of our neighborhood. I had seen but little of the family since they left till I commenced my school. Then I would walk an extra mile to call on the girls, visit a few hours, and pass on. May, from a child, was really my favorite. She was so cheerful and gentle and kind, and moved around the house with so much ease and dignity that I could not help watching her to the amusement of her sisters. One Sunday, at the latter part of my term, when the days had gotten longer and warmer, I started earlier from home and called at Mr. Gordon's home. May was not in and no one knew where she'd gone. Then I thought I'd cut across the woods and fields and save some travel. As I reached the edge of the wood, there within a step was May, leaning her head against the tree, sobbing till her whole body shook. Her grief was so intense that she did not hear me till I spoke her name. May, what is the matter with my little girl? Are you in trouble? Can't I help you, May? Won't you tell me? She raised her face and, smiling through her tears, said, Oh, no, you can't help me, Marion. I wish you could. Tell me, May, and I will try. You remember, she said, you got Father's consent for me to go to the Academy next term. He has recently changed his mind and a half hour ago told me I couldn't go. Do you know why, May? Yes, I think I do, but if you will excuse me, Marion, I would rather not tell. Oh, I was so disappointed that I came out here where all alone I could cry away my disappointment. But I am glad you came. It has made me feel better to tell you. You were so kind to intercede for me. Now, my little girl, dry your eyes. I will see your father. I will go to the house around on the north side of the arbor, and you take the path down by the spring. Wash the tear stains off, and you'll see that this school business will be settled all right. I had to go quite a distance to get around a brush fence and met Mr. Gordon close by the arbor. We shook hands and sat down. I commenced quite abruptly. How about May, Mr. Gordon? I suppose you will send her to the academy as you intended? He looked at me and smiled. Aren't you taking quite an interest in my little girl for a young fellow? I saw he was not offended, and I knew his weak points and intended to storm them first. Yes, Mr. Gordon, I am, but not in the sense that some might infer from your words. I do feel a deep interest in May and all young people. And when I find one possessing the very rare natural ability and possibilities of May, I cannot help but feel that it is just criminal for a parent to neglect to give the opportunity when they are as able as you are. I know I did promise you, but she is so useful at home that my wife can't spare her. Well, hire a girl then and give your own child an equal chance with her stepsister. No hired girl can fill her place. Then hire two, I said. You speak plainly. I know that, Mr. Gordon, but I must speak and speak plainly. It's for your good, and some day you will thank me for it. I know you wish to stand well with your neighbors. Everyone does, and they are beginning to notice how you discriminate. 
last Saturday at the sale, I heard Davis telling a crowd of 20 or more how you are making a cultivated lady of one member of your family and a drudge of May. I took the matter up for you and told Davis his talk was all suds, that you sent Marge three terms and that May will commence next term and not go less than three terms and more if she wishes. That shut off his wind and the blowgun left. Well, well, said Gordon. I'm glad you told him that. I'll show him myself and shut off his wind, too, if I have to use my fist and hire a dozen girls. Then May shall go, you mean? Yes, sir. I promised you that May shall go next term. All right, Gordon. Now, one more word before I go. I hesitated a little. Speak on. Don't be afraid. I just want to tell you that you have a jewel in your house and don't know how rich it is. Why, what do you mean, May? Yes, I mean May. If you will give her the opportunity you are able to do, she will grow into such a woman as everyone will love and honor. You will be proud of her, and I shall be proud too that I had the honor of playing with her when she was a child and little girl. I started to go. Won't you stay to dinner? He asked. No, thank you. Not today. Perhaps next time. Call any time. Uh, always welcome. As I reached the gate, I saw May come out of the arbor. My, my, I didn't know she was there. She must have heard every word. She may think I put it on pretty thick, but I didn't. But thought I... she'll be happy, though. Child as she seems, she sometimes makes my heart thump. After another week in school, I went home Friday evening. Sunday, after an early dinner, I started back to my district. This being my last week, I must call at Mr. Gordon's. May was in the garden wearing a neat, dainty white straw hat with her rich brown glossy hair in a large braid hanging down below her waist. She saw me before I did her and, with the freedom of a child, ran to the gate to meet me and held out both hands, which I took in both of mine, just as I always had done. Oh, mister. Stop, I said. You rogue, don't you ever call me mister again. Just call me what you did when you were a little tot and I a great, big, awkward boy when we played in the barn and orchard and you made me carry you on my neck and called me your horse and tried to make me drink out of a pig trough. Then she gave a ringing laugh and said in a shy, low tone, You never seemed awkward to me, Marion. Now, what is it, my little girl, since you have discovered my name? I was so afraid you wouldn't come. I wanted so much to thank you for what you did for me. Father seems kinder. He says I may go three terms anyway, and as many more as possible. I'm so glad and happy, and I owe it all to you. I guess it's always you, Marion. Stop, you little flatterer, before I box your ears. Well, it's all true. And she gave me a look with those dark blue eyes that were worth more than a king's crown. Come, Marion, let's go in. I did so and found both her sisters in the parlor. Now, girls, I said, my school will be out next Saturday. I give you a cordial invitation. Will you come? I'm sorry, said Marge, that it's so soon. Floss and I have enjoyed your calls so much. And she gave a sly glance at May. Yes, said Floss, a miss of twelve. Marge and I will miss your visits. It will be very lonesome here now on Sunday afternoon. We passed a very pleasant two hours, and as I bade them goodbye, May followed me down the walk to the gate when she said in her shy low tone, Marion, I'll not be here to see you again, for I go on Tuesday. And now I wish I could make you listen to me while I try to tell you how thankful I am for what you've done for me. Oh, May, don't mention it. Don't I know that it has been more pleasure to me than to you, and 
"'Twould be selfish for me to accept thanks when really I'm the one that gets the most enjoyment out of it. Oh, but I owe you so much, I can never forget at what risk you saved my life when I was a child and almost lost your own. Now, May, please don't. I'm as glad as you are that your future looks brighter. What I did for you long ago, anyone could have done. It just happened that I was close by. Yes, but there were a dozen older than you close by, and they were too frightened to move. There are some things, Marion, that I can't forget, and don't you ever forget that I shall always remember them. I'll never forget my little girl, and if at any time I can help you, will you let me know, May? I surely will. Goodbye, Marion. She flew into the house, and I did not see her again for more than 18 months. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In Camp Chapter Four We were quite a jolly family in the old war house. The captain with two or three others started for home early the next morning to raise more men to fill out the company, and, before leaving, issued his first order, putting the camp under military discipline. Drill hours were ordered, and guards detailed to enclose the camp while none were to leave without a pass. But the duties were not heavy. A light guard, two hours on and eight off, and a small detail to police the grounds was stationed. There was much leisure to read the dailies, discuss the war news, and tell stories. A recruit from Williams County, Ohio, by the name of Knox, who claimed to have had some experience, assumed the duty of drill master. He was a man of fine personal appearance, dressed well, and was sufficiently vain to enjoy the distinction. In the afternoon, a few of us procured passes and visited Camp Allen, occupied by the 30th Indiana Regiment, now almost full. We watched them for nearly an hour drilling by companies, then all the companies were formed in battalion, and for half an hour this drill was intensely interesting. Then the battalion moved across the open plain by the front in a symmetrical line, as if all were inspired by the same motive, and came to a halt in perfect order for dress parade. It was a rich treat and marvelous to us. Camp Allen lay west of the city, in a large bend in the river, nearly enclosing four or five acres of ground. The drill and parade ground was on the north, an open common, very smooth and level. There was one row of barracks on the west side of the campground, close to the river, fronting the east, and one row attached to the north end of this, running to the east, fronting south. Each barrack, I judge, was about twelve by twelve feet, built of inch lumber with board roof and floor, and each was provided with box bunks filled with straw. Then came the Sabbath, the first in camp, and the third day from home and farm. How long the days are, I thought. How old will I be when my term of service expires, should I live through, if every day should be as long as the three last seemed? I wonder if I am missed at home. I wonder if they would know me now. I spent nearly the whole day in writing letters, long cheerful ones, and perhaps an hour or so reading the war news. About 10 a.m., Knox took about 30 of the boys to the college grounds and gave them an hour's drill. At 5 p.m., 
religious services were held by Reverend Moffat, an enlisted man from Angola at nine, taps and lights out. The next day, Monday, I got my first daily, which said, quote, Confederates defeated at Brownville, Virginia. General Polk occupies Columbus, Kentucky. A detachment of rebel forces attempting to cross the Potomac repulsed with heavy loss, unquote. Well, I hope all would be accomplished before we reach the front. I distinctly remember ever hearing Mother say when I was a little fellow that I was the most unselfish boy she ever saw. Knox and a captain in the 30th had been working with our boys to get them to enlist in his company, telling them that our regiment could not be filled before spring. Knox claimed he was offered a commission if he would enlist in our company, but from recent developments realized he had no chance. He was offered a lieutenancy in the 30th Regiment if he would furnish 30 men from our company. On learning this, about 15 of us boys got together and quietly elected a committee of five to draw up a protest which, by signing, each one agreed to remain with us. To draw up the paper, our scribe went off by himself. When nearly through, on turning around was face to face with Mr. Knox. "'Excuse me,' said he. "'You handle a pen nicely and write a beautiful hand. From the size of your manuscript, I infer your writing up the Civil War.' Do you know, said he, that very many who can write well a few words or lines they can't make as nice a page as you do, so plain and as easy to read as print? I thank you, Mr. Knox, for the compliment, said our scribe, and will excuse you at once as I wish to finish my work without further interruption. Just one word said he, in a very pleasant and almost irresistible manner. When can your committee meet me at my room? Any time, sir, said the scribe, but not today. Say at 2 p.m., I'll send you word. All right, Mr. Knox, good day. The balance of the committee were seated behind a pile of lumber and heard the conversation and as soon as the drill master was out of hearing, they all had a hearty laugh. Well, said one, that fellow has plenty of cheek, and if as persistent in everything else, ought to make a good soldier. Yes, said Al, he might if he had as much brains as cheek. By working very quietly, nearly all the boys were induced to sign our protest, and as the days passed by, none of them left us to join the 30th Indiana. The next morning, early, we left the old ware room for Camp Allen, where we went into the barracks assigned to us, and soon, after getting our quarters nicely policed, the captain came riding into camp on his spirited black horse. After a cordial greeting, he ordered us to form and follow him. He led us by the shortest route to the common, or the north side of the city, where we found forty recruits, enough to fill up our company. They then formed with us, and we marched back to camp through the business part of the city, with a full martial band and our company flag unfurled. As soon as practical, our committee called on the captain at his quarters and handed him our package marked Private, which he opened soon after we left, and it was well for Mr. Knox that he was absent. The captain had a furious temper, and when excited was like a small tornado. The next day he sent for Knox, and after giving him a good lecture, ordered him to enlist in another regiment. The advice was taken, 
and the next we heard from him he had enlisted in a company from his own state. The captain had been recommended for lieutenant colonel of our regiment, and we had received orders to hold an election for company officers, captain, first and second lieutenants, and orderly sergeant. From almost the first day in camp, I had been acting as orderly, had called the roll, drawn and divided the rations, made all the details and company reports. For several days the boys had been anticipating an election and had freely discussed the persons whose names seemed to be the most prominent as candidates. Several of the boys called on me early in the morning and urged me to be a candidate for second lieutenant. I refused on the grounds that Burge expected the nomination and that I knew nothing of the duties and really did not feel competent. It don't matter to us how or what you feel, they said. We want your consent to accept and we'll look after the rest. Well now, boys, it really won't do, I said. You know who has set his heart on this place from the time of his enlistment, and he will be sorely disappointed and feel hurt if he doesn't get it. I enlisted to serve in the ranks and have never had an ambition beyond being a private soldier in this war for the Union. We can't help what he expects, said they. We were not consulted and now have a right to choose. Well, boys, I thank you sincerely, and will think the matter over and let you know at one o'clock. Hardly had the boys gone when a message came from Burge to call and see him. As I entered his barrack, I found him quite sick. His face was flushed with fever, and the hand he extended was hot. Do you wish to see me? I asked. Yes, I have heard that you are a candidate for second lieutenant. I am not. The boys had just come from me when your message came. They did urge me to consent. At first I refused and finally told them I would let them know at one o'clock. Oh, said Burge, the tears starting from his eyes. If you will refuse to accept and do what you can for me, I will remember you with gratitude. I want the position, have expected it, was promised it, and my health is such that I can't stand the service in the ranks. In fact, with my health, I should not have enlisted to serve as a private. Well, Burge, let me say in all kindness that I think you ought not to have enlisted at all. Your health hardly warrants you in going into the ranks or accepting a lieutenancy. You cannot fill either place in justice to yourself or your country. And I don't think anyone had any right to promise you or me an office in this company. The boys should have the right to choose their own officers. But, Burge, I don't think that your only motive was a commission and the higher wages that inspired you to enlist. I would despise any man whose heart did not burn with patriotic emotions at such a time as this. Oh, do not misunderstand me. I wanted to go. My heart aches to serve my country. My father and two brothers are at the front now, and I would rather die for my country, if that were to help save it, than to live and see it destroyed. I thought, he continued, that I might serve as second lieutenant and survive. If I were only healthy and strong like you, I would be willing, yea, glad, to serve in the ranks and equally proud of the honor. Now, Burge, let me put your heart at rest. I enlisted to serve as a private, anywhere, and to do anything and everything possible that my country shall demand. And, bless your heart, Burge, I will not accept the place you covet so much. With tears in his eyes, he bade me goodbye. I returned to my quarters, feeling better for the sacrifice, and when the boys appeared for my answer, I soon convinced them that I would not feel justified in accepting their kind offer. 
The three men that enlisted, expecting commissions, were not disappointed. All were elected, and the boys gave me ninety-seven of the one hundred votes for orderly. From this time commenced my duties as orderly sergeant in earnest. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In Camp. Chapter 5. To give in full the necessary qualification and duties of an orderly sergeant would take more time and space than I can spare. His fitness depends much on his natural disposition and power of self-control. To succeed well, he must be well stocked with good common sense, and be able at all times and under all circumstances to govern himself. And if able to do this, he will gain and hold the confidence and respect of every man in the company. His language must be pure, and his heart and hands clean. In short, he must be a gentleman, and if a consistent Christian, he always will be a gentleman, and this will add wonderfully to his usefulness and qualifications. He must always be kind, but not inconsistently indulgent, always dignified, but not arrogant. He has a hundred men to study and a hundred men to serve, all his equals, and many of them may be his superiors intellectually. His office, so important to the company, must not make him feel his superiority. The position is given him by the boys, and he owes it to them, to be faithful, kind, patient, and cheerful. He must be willing to share equally with them in their hardships and privations, and, when necessary, be the first to encounter danger. He must have their respect, love, and sympathy, or his place will be a hard one. Altogether, the orderly has more to do than all the other officers in the company, and, unless very careful and prudent, he will be blamed the most but he is nearest the boys if fitted for this place, and patient and discreet he can do more for them than any other officer, and all the boys will stand by him to the very last, even unto death. At Reveille, no matter at what hour, he must call the roll. He must report all sick in quarters and all unfit for duty to the surgeon make his morning report to the adjutant, detail camp guards, and make all further details as called for by the adjutant. Drawing and dividing rations is the most difficult of all his duties. I usually took three men with me to the quartermasters to draw rations for every man reported present in camp for that day. We had ten messes. Number one, seven men. Number two, twelve. Number three, seven. Number four, thirteen. Number five, twelve. Number six, ten. Number seven, eight. Number nine, eleven. And number ten, ten. The orderly is provided with a tin cup and a butcher knife, and with these two articles must divide all the rations equally per capita to each mess, etc. To number one, seven one-hundredths, to number two, twelve one-hundredths, and so on. It was very easy to understand, but not very easy to execute. We drew beef at this time, bony meat, flanky meat, good roasts, poor roasts, round steak, and shoulder steak, 
Now we had to cut and divide equally to each mess so that each man would have his full share of each kind of meat. We couldn't weigh, we guessed. With bacon and salt pork it was less difficult. Sugar, rice, coffee, and beans we measured in a tin cup and then guessed. Crackers, hardtack we counted, and potatoes when we got them we divided by guess. At drill, the orderly must get out the company, call the roll, be able to account for every man absent, then take his place at the head of the company. The boys were getting quite proficient in squad drill, but as yet had had but little experience in company drill. The captain and first lieutenant had been trying for a few days to move the company forward by the front, but in going a few steps we warped out of line and soon got as crooked as a worm fence. But now they had conceived a new plan to hold the boys in line and were quite confident it would work. They asked me what I thought of the plan. Good, I said. Of course it will work. Can't help it. Tomorrow morning, said Captain, I will go downtown and buy a quarter-inch rope long enough to reach from one extreme of the company to the other. Place each end in the hand of the file leaders and then keep them up to the line and I know it will work. Yes, it will work, said our first lieutenant. I wonder we didn't think of that before. Of course it will work, said I, and just think how sensible and simple it is. It will make it so easy for you and the boys, too, and will obviate all necessity of swearing, and that's worth more than the rope. I've been so disgusted, said the captain, with the company drill that I often wish I were back on the old farm. The other day, when you and I were having so much trouble trying to make the boys move by the front, and just when they got into the mix-up, that captain of Company H of the 30th stood over on the left, leaning against a tree, laughing to split. Well, said Lieutenant, it is laughable. I could hardly help it. Not for me, said the captain. I felt like swearing. I believe our boys must be dumb said the lieutenant. I know I understand the drill as well or better than Captain Jones of the 30th, and still, without any apparent effort, his company moves off like a machine. Yesterday I watched his company, stood where the captain couldn't see me, and I was surprised. He moved his company rapidly by the flank, then, without a halt, gave the order. Left face, by the front, march! and they moved full twenty rods in a perfect line. Then the command, left wheel. Then the command, about face, right wheel. And each time they went around like a gate. And it's strange, continued the lieutenant, that captain is only an ordinary fellow and very illiterate. I confess I don't understand why we have such luck. Well said the captain. If he is illiterate, his boys are sharp enough to make it up. You are too easy, captain. Use more authority. Make them obey orders. Or, in other words, said the captain, swear a little harder. Oh, no, no. You're more awkward at that than the boys are in the drill. They say you need more practice. I was a member of the commissioned officer's mess, which gave me special opportunities, and I learned something new every day. The idea of using a rope to keep the boys in line would never have got through my thick head. I couldn't see why it wouldn't work, but I hoped they would be careful and not let anybody see them. I went to bed thinking about the rope and the drill and dreamed that it was a grand success and brought forth astonishing results, and my dreams hardly ever failed. As early as possible, I formed the company and took them to the north and west side of the field into an L, covered by a dense hedge, brought the company to a front, and turned them over to the captain, who pulled the rope out of his pocket, tied a knot in one end, and handed it to me. 
walked down the line, dressed up the company, ordered them to stand with elbows at touch, drew on the rope, tied another knot, and handed it to the file leader on their left. Now, boys, said the captain, there's no reason why you can't move in line by the front. The file leaders must keep their eyes on some object straight ahead of them, and be sure to guide neither to the right nor left. Some of the boys smiled, and I thought I heard Wright laugh. "'Attention, company,' commanded the captain. "'Left, left, left, be ready at the word, left. Left by the front, forward, march.' And we started, but not all together. The line expanded, making the rope too short, pulling the file leaders around in front. The boys, seeing the trouble, crowded together, the rope slackened, dropped to the ground. Two boys got their feet fast in the rope and, in trying to save themselves, fell headlong to the front, and without an order, all came to a halt. Then the boys laughed. Attention, commanded the captain, and the boys quieted down. Now close up right dress. Already mark time left, left, already at the command, left, left. Company forward, by the front, march. This time we did better. Kept our line, for perhaps two rods. Then, as before, the line expanded, shortening the rope, pulling the file leaders to the front. Then, to remedy the mistake, the boys again crowded together. The rope dropped. Half the company walked over it, and three or four came down in a heap. Again they halted without an order, and the woods rang with their laughter. The captain was warm, and the lieutenant overcome with heat. "'I think I know why the company contracts and expands,' said the lieutenant. "'Well, out with it. This is a mighty hot place, and I'm getting hotter every minute.' "'You see,' said the lieutenant, the file leaders have no guide. We want two stakes in front of each, directly in line with the right and left file leader, just the same, Captain, as you used to use in lining off for lane offense. I see, I see, said the Captain. Should have thought of that before. Lieutenant, you're a prodigy. If you get killed in battle, I'll have you brought home and put into the National Museum. I had forgotten that you had made a specialty of engineering. Orderly, dress up the company. Lieutenant, step down the line in front of the company. Count your steps. Go to the front, twenty rods or so. Plant one set of stakes on the right and left the same distance. Then go twenty rods or so farther and plant your other two stakes in line with the left and right file leaders. I saw several of the boys smile and was sorry to hear Wright snicker again, for I had set my heart on this project and was so sure it would work that to fail would be a great disappointment. When the lieutenant returned, the captain said, we're all ready now, and boys, if you don't make it this time, it's your fault. Right dress, keep elbows at touch, mark time, left, left, be ready at the word. Left, left, company forward by the front march. At the word march, all started as one man, and for four rods or more, we kept a perfect line. Then, for some reason, the line expanded till I was pulled around in front, and then contracted till the rope fell to the ground with the result more disastrous than either time before. Three men caught their feet and fell, and two more fell over them, and they were all in a pile. Halt, said the captain. But the command was unnecessary, for the whole company was convulsed with laughter. The captain and lieutenant tried to look sober at first, and I was afraid by the pucker of Captain's mouth he might swear, but he didn't, for in a minute they both laughed as heartily as the rest of us. "'Orderly, take the company to camp,' said Cap. 
I did so, feeling much better for a hearty laugh. And it did all the boys good, too, for I don't believe they'll ever have as much real fun during their whole three years of service. But what of my dream? It is like a broken pitcher. I shall place very little confidence in my dreams hereafter. I had worked very hard all day, and, being tired, crawled into my bunk and dropped to sleep while the captain and lieutenant were out. It must have been about ten o'clock when I was awakened by hearing an earnest conversation in a low tone. Well, what shall we try next, Cap? I'm collapsed. Either you and I don't know enough to drill a company, or our boys are too dumb to learn. I fear your first proposition is too true. Why, this boy Wright can take this company and make that front movement in perfection in one hour. I have watched him, and I know. Just a day or two ago, he had out a squad of forty men, and I was surprised when he marched them by the front in perfect order. Then, while on the move, gave the command, left wheel. Then, about face, right wheel and twas all done in a jiffy as well as Company H of the 30th can do it. Why didn't you turn over the company to him today? Because I'd had humiliation enough for one day. It might have done you good. My conceit has all been knocked out of me, and I guess yours has gone down several degrees. I will say further, Lieutenant, we have given the tactics no study. How much of you? Hardy lies here on our table, and we hardly look at it, much less study it. Wright is studying that book every minute, went off of duty, and I tell you, he's a crackerjack. You're blue tonight, Cap, and all off. Don't tell me that fellow of hardly ordinary ability and no culture can excel one of the white experience with a college education. He cannot, said Cap. In conceit, I'll confess, I was too conceited myself, and suppose I knew enough to drill a company just by glancing over Hardy's tactics. But for conceit, Lieutenant, you'll take the plum. We can't depend on what we learned in school or college. We must study it out here for ourselves, or resign. I am actually disgusted and sick. As I came in from our drill today, I passed through the quarters of the 30th, and that cussed second lieutenant yelled out, loud enough for all in camp to hear. Hello, Captain. Did you get your boys all corralled in? What did you say, Cap? Did get mad and swear at him? Oh, no. One wouldn't get mad and swear as hot as I was, but if I'd been near enough, I would have kicked the little cuss out of the camp. And been court-martialed, said Lieutenant. Yes, and been court-martialed, but I've got it fixed now. On my way in, I called on Nelson, the West Point cadet, and offered him the first vacancy that occurs in our company, and he put his name down on my roll. But that vacancy would of right go to the one next in rank, said Lieutenant. Can't help that now. It's done. He refused to accept when it was offered to him. Well, it don't seem hardly right, said Lieutenant. Under the circumstances, perhaps it's for the best, for it will give us a great advantage in our company drills. As I quietly turned over in my bunk, I said to myself, How nicely and easily that was done. An orderly sergeant's right to promotion transferred without his knowledge or consent to one outside and unknown to the company. All done quietly with the best of intentions and no doubt for the good of the service. And just then all became quiet and I dropped to sleep again. Nelson made his appearance quite early. A fine-looking fellow, about twenty-five years of age, hardly medium height, quick and muscular, light hair, handsome eyes, a very clear, penetrating voice, and although fresh from West Point, there was no affectation or indication of superiority. 
On our way to the drill grounds, he asked, What is the trouble, orderly? Nothing serious, if you understand the drill and have confidence in yourself, the boys will soon have confidence in you. On reaching the field, I halted the company, brought them to a front. Nelson then stepped four or five paces in front of the center. He showed us how to stand with our weight on the right foot. Take a medium step, each one try to keep in line before we start, and when you move, be sure that each one of you feel the touch of the elbows next to you, and if you will try to cooperate with me, tomorrow we will march across this field by the front. He held a cane horizontally in front of him and gave the order, Attention company, mark time, left, left, all be ready at the word march. Left, left, company by the front, forward, march. He walked backwards, keeping step by the motion of his cane, perhaps twenty rods, and then he ordered halt. There was neither curve nor kink, for the line was almost a perfect one, and the boys were delighted. He then moved forward even with better success, walking at the head of the company. Then, while moving, gave the command, right wheel, then about face, left wheel, then by the front. And the whole thing that seemed so difficult yesterday was accomplished in less than two hours. As we were about to leave the field, he said, Boys, you have far exceeded my expectations, and if you will get out here by one thirty, we will go across this field by the front. We were there promptly and did go across the field several times by the front and did it as nicely as Company H of the 30th. The experience of our captain and the first lieutenant, I found, was not unusual. All the new company officers had the same trials to begin with, but like them, finally mastered the drill. But it was quite evident to all that Nelson was the best drill master in the regiment. Our first death in the company occurred that night. A very robust young man by the name of Brooks, some twenty-two years of age, had been ailing only a few days and was not supposed to be at all dangerously ill. His death, so sudden and unexpected, cast a gloom over the whole company. Eight companies were mustered in today. Three men refused to muster and were drummed out of camp, and two were rejected out of our company on account of physical unfitness. End of chapter 5「My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad » by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Home on Furlough Chapter 6 Lewis and several others returned to camp last night from their visit home, and with furloughs in our pockets, four others and myself took the same team and wagon and started for home at 4 a.m. We stopped at the Sowers Hotel, five miles out on the Plank Road, to feed our team and get breakfast, and then made one more stop for feed and dinner, reaching home at 8 o'clock in the evening. I was warmly received and glad to find Mother feeling well and looking cheerful, I had written her and May twice every week, Thursdays and Sundays. In May's last letter, she stated that on account of scarlet fever, the school had closed for a few weeks and she had returned home. I spent a very pleasant hour with my folks and then went to my room, tired, sleepy, and glad to have one more night's rest in my clean, soft bed. The next day, Sunday, bright and beautiful, we all went to church, a precious privilege to one who had spent several weeks in camp. I received many invitations after church to go home with some of our neighbors, 
but to me there was no place like home. I could not think of losing a single hour from the home circle, which I knew now how to appreciate better than ever before. My room and bed were so inviting that I retired quite early and dropped to sleep with a pair of dark blue eyes watching over me. Another bright and beautiful October day and an appointment to meet a friend ten miles from home called me out early. At 6.30 I was ready and said to Prentice, I'm going to Hart's Corners and on my return will call on May and be at home at or about dusk. I parted with my friends and started back at half past nine. As I approached Prescott's house, which is back from the road nearly twenty rods, out tripped May, tied up for a walk. Oh my, how she had grown in the last eighteen months! I drove up close to the fence, jumped out, put down the top, drew my hat down over my face, and with my back toward her, stood till she opened the gate. Then I turned around quickly and said abruptly, Will you ride with me, Miss Gordon? For an instant she seemed completely dazed, and the blood rushed to her face. Then impulsively she gave me both her hands, as she always did. Oh, Marion, this is too, too good to be true. It is such a surprise. How came you here? Where have you been? When did you get home? Well, May, it will be just a little too, too good if you'll just step into the buggy and ride with me to your home, and then I'll answer all your questions unless you prefer to walk. Oh, yes. No, I forgot. I'll get in. Would rather ride. I'm so glad you came. I got home Saturday evening. Yesterday I went to church and this morning started from home very early to meet a friend some three miles down the road and thought on my way back I'd call on May Gordon. Now I'm accounted for. But how does it happen that I pick you up in the road here some three miles from home? I have been here a week, she said. You certainly remember Arthur Prescott. He received a very dangerous wound and was sent home some four weeks ago and was the next day taken down with fever and for two weeks or more he has been lying at the point of death. He has been so very sick and his mother is so frail and worn out and I was so sorry for her and Arthur that I felt I must come and help them. Yesterday the doctor pronounced them out of danger, and as they have help now, I concluded to go home. Oh, yes, I remember Arthur well. He went to school, to me, when I taught at Hurley's Corners. He is not only a very fine young man, but possesses rare mental ability. I don't know why it was, but my temperature suddenly dropped several degrees as I thought over my own words and what might be to me an irretrievable loss. Say, May, and my voice took a minor key, if I should be brought home very sick with a wound or fever and mother should be very frail like Mrs. Prescott and I should be so dangerously sick like Arthur... Would you feel so very sorry for Mother and me that you would come and help us? She had dropped her head and was silent a moment, and then, raising her eyes to mine, looked me in the face, as if to read the very thoughts of my heart, and asked in a low, earnest tone, Will you send for me, Marian? Yes, I will send for you, May. Then I will come. And you will not forget this promise, May? I will not forget this promise, Marian. Then the small lump which I had felt in my throat left entirely, and my voice became natural. Well, May, I have made quite a discovery today. What have you discovered, pray? That you are glad to see me, and you can't deny it. 
You almost crushed my hand, she answered, and I fear I shall not recover from it for many months. I hope you won't until I return, if I ever do. Why, Marian, you were always so good and kind when we were children and played together. To atone for the loss of your hand and the pain I have caused you, for which I'm very sorry, I have brought you a present, the best of the kind I could find in the city. And I handed her the package. A Bible! Just what I've wanted, but never expected one so nice. It is really the finest I ever saw. Oh, I thank you so much. You are almost better than a brother, though I never had one, so I don't know. It has always seemed to me, since I was a little girl, as though you ought to have been my brother. Well, May, I'm mighty glad I ain't. Why, Marion, how can you? How ungrateful to a would-be sister— did you know, she said, as though wishing to get off from thin ice, that this book is not esteemed very highly and sometimes meets with ridicule in our home since my mother died and the new mother came into our home? I have heard so, I said. I remember your mother just as she looked and appeared when I used to play with you girls. Tell me about her, May. I could not help but reverence her then. Oh, I shall never forget my mother. The memory of her goodness and kindness is the one bright spot in all my past life, and how much I have missed her, no words can tell. I remember well how she used to take us three little girls into her room and read to us from her Bible, and then we would all kneel down around her while she prayed for us. And it seemed to me then that if she was just talking to God, who was right there in the room. And then I felt sure I could feel his divine presence, which I did so long to enjoy while I lived, or rather I wanted more to go right along with her to heaven. And I remember, too, so well the day she died, how we three crowded around her bed, and just almost as her life was going out, she pointed upward with her trembling hand, and in a loud whisper said, See, see, children, the Savior has come. May bowed her head, and for many minutes we rode in silence, and then when she could command her voice, she resumed, You remember that large Bible in our parlor? Yes, I said. That is my mother's. I say is, because it is so closely identified with her life that we girls always call it hers, and every time we open it we think of her as not being dead, but living and loving as when here. All the rest of my mother's religious books have been put away in closets, and infidel and spiritualistic books and papers fill the case. The banner of light is paramount to all else. May I thank you sincerely for what you have revealed of yourself today. Had I not held your confidence and respect, you could not have talked so freely of your mother and yourself. Your respect and confidence are a most potent incentive and will help me to live a life above temptation and reproach. You will notice, May, when you get home, that I have marked a great many passages in the New Testament that I so much like to read. Oh, I am glad of that. When you get back to the army and pick up your Bible, we may both be reading the same verses at the same time. I had paid no attention to my horse and found, when too late, that I had gone far beyond the corner where I should have turned and must go full two miles farther to reach Gordon's. May, I do feel proud of you. You have done so well in your studies and have acquired so much that you didn't get out of books. But I owe very much of it to you, Marion. 
Father changed wonderfully after your talk with him, and has been very kind and indulgent since. But, May, you don't understand me. You have grown in more ways than one. There is a very decided improvement that you owe me nothing for. When you came down the walk and stood at the gate, I noticed the change, and it fairly made me tremble. Don't you know, Marion, that it is very wicked to flatter? She said, smiling. Well, May, I haven't seen you before today for eighteen months, and you remember I called you my little girl then, and I would hardly dare do that now. And just how you have made the transition from a little girl to a fine, graceful woman in so short a time is a problem I can't solve. Don't try, Marion. It might unfit you for your duties in camp. Too much mental labor might unbalance you. Oh, see yonder is a little gate. Do you remember my last words when I parted with you there, more than eighteen months ago? I really feel anxious about you, Marion. Your memory and imagination are much too active, an alarming symptom of dementia. Dividing rations among so many men and looking after all the details will, I fear, get you off your base. And now, since we are here at my home, let me admonish you that my new mother keeps a big book, and any action on your part not strictly in line with the latest and most approved forms of decorum will be written down and remembered against you. Say, May, I long since learned that she doesn't like me very well. May laughed heartily. I guess I know that better than you. It's not you, however, but your tight-laced theology. But let's change the subject. Put the horse in the barn, feed, and go to the house for dinner. We found the family at the dinner table, and room for us. Then May and I went into the parlor and took our old seat on the couch. I felt depressed. I could not come to see her again. I must go back to camp in a few days, and I felt, too, that I might have mistaken gratitude for affection. She is young, and she might refuse me, and it would almost break her heart to do so, but she would if she felt she ought though it might be with tears. I know what I will do. A happy thought came into my mind. Yes, I'll have that settled before I leave. My depression left me, and the minutes and hours slipped away too rapidly. I asked her about her school and studies and of our mutual acquaintances that had enlisted. She replied, all the young men that have honored me with their friendship are gone or going soon, and those that are too indifferent to the demands of their country to make the sacrifice are unworthy of my esteem. May, I'm glad that you said that without premeditation, for I know it came from the heart. As I arose to go, I said, with a little quaver in my voice, May, I cannot call on you again, as every hour will be full of business till I must go back. But I have one request to make before I go. Will you be honest with yourself and answer it as your own heart and your own interest prompts? Well, surely, Marion, I will. Please ask it. Will you pledge me that you will make no engagement without first letting me know? She smiled. Marin, I'm not a ripe plum anxious to drop into every open mouth. In all seriousness, I cannot give so important a subject any thought or consideration while the Civil War lasts. I'm not ready. I will make you the pledge, and I will keep it, too, Marion. Now, what else? she asked. Will you write me at least once every week? I asked. Yes, I will write you every Sunday and Wednesday 
I'm less sick, and will you do the same, Marian? I will, and if you don't receive my letters regularly and promptly, charge it to uncertain males. Then she said, as she placed her hands in mine, If it will encourage and help you to know that I honor you for the sacrifice you are making, rest assured that this is true, and if it will lighten your burdens and give you courage to bear patiently your hardships, privations, and sufferings, please remember that I shall follow you with deepest interest and sympathy through all your campaigns and battles, and do not forget that every morning and night I shall pray our Father to bless and keep you safe that you may return to us. Her voice broke. The tears started from her eyes. She could say no more. I raised both her hands to my lips. I could not say goodbye, but turned round and left May standing in the door. End of chapter 6「VII. My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad » by Marvin Benjamin Butler This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Leaving for the Front Chapter 7 I went down the walk to the little gate where my horse was hitched climbed in my buggy, and started for home without once looking back. In a mental condition hard to analyze or explain, but conscious that not until now I had realized in full the sacrifice I was making for my country. Could I have looked that evening through an upper window, I might have seen a young girl on her knees with her face bathed in tears, and heard these very words, Dear Lord, watch over and protect him from all danger and evil, and help me to be patient and faithful through the dreadful years to come. I reached home at dusk, retired early to my room and bed, and dropped to sleep, repeating to myself, Do not forget that I shall pray our Father to bless and keep you safe that you may return to us. The most of my furlough I spent at home, and all my leisure hours with mother, whom I treated with the tenderest consideration. She had become wholly reconciled, and talked cheerfully of the future, urging me to be brave and patient, to bear all and endure all without a murmur. She spoke of her father's seven years' service in the Revolution, and how he often suffered from cold and hunger. But notwithstanding this, he was proud that he did what he could for his country, and so will you be, my son, and so shall I feel proud that I had a son to give. On the morning of the 14th, she bade me good-bye as pleasantly as though I would return in a few days, and that evening at 8 p.m. I reached camp and assumed again the duties of orderly. I soon learned the next morning that the regiment had been filling up fast and that our company had made rapid progress in drill while I was absent, now being second to none, not even Company H of the 30th. A few of our boys were very anxious to get into and see a battle. They were seated in front of my barrack one day, reading an account of a fierce engagement in the Middle West, and two of them declared in very emphatic language that it was an outrage to hold us here while so much fighting was going to waste. One was Jack, the regimental flag-bearer of Company C., and might have been a giant killer, for aught I knew. He stood full six feet high, and weighed one hundred and eighty pounds, finely formed, only twenty years of age, and, from his appearance and talk, 
as brave a man as ever carried a flag or fired a gun. The other we will call Mr. Gunsmith, nearly fifty, but stout and wiry, and no braver man trod the soil. These two represented about ten of the bravest men in our regiment, and I said to myself, if we ever get into battle, and I sincerely hope it will not be necessary, I'll watch these two men who know no fear. They seem to feel so different from what I do that I have no confidence in myself. Al, Lewis, Jim, and Bence heard the boasting, and when the crowd had disappeared, came into my barrack. Well, boys, I said, what do you honestly think of these fellows? They seem to be honest and feel brave, and I wish I had some of the sand they are throwing away. We will make this an experienced meeting for the inexperienced, and I wish you would express your minds freely. I will be the first to confess to you that I do dread a battle, and if the rebellion should be put down before we get to the front, I shall be more pleased than disappointed, but I shall try to do my whole duty in an emergency. You spoke my mind, said Jim. I'm naturally timid and have no thirst for blood, and a battle to me seems a terrible thing. But I enlisted to serve my country and shall do my duty under all circumstances or die trying. Jack will throw his flag and run the first volley, and Gunsmith will not get close enough to see the smoke. Well said Lewis. No one has heard me say that I was anxious to get into battle. I'm not. I dread it. But if we do, I'll stay by the line to the very last. Like Jim, I'll do my duty or die trying. I could not say it any better, said Al. I think we all feel about the same. A man is naturally a coward and dreads a violent death such as being torn to pieces with ball or shell. We are all made of the same clay, and if we are not needed, I shall be more than satisfied. I expect to do my duty, however, if to do it means to die. I have done no boasting, said Pence. I am not brave like Jack or Gunsmith, I think and know that I dread the awful carnage of battle, but I thought this all over before I enlisted and shall stay by you boys as long as I have any hair in my head. Well, boys, I'm glad you have expressed your mind so freely. I have heard so much blowing from these two fellows and a few others like them that I began to fear that I was the only one that really dreaded a battle. I shall watch Gunsmith, and Company C can watch Jack. Yesterday, Sunday, was a very pleasant day for me. About 9 a.m., Brother Prentice, Cousin Stevens, and J.C. Bodley and wife drove into camp. As soon as I could, I got excused from duty and spent the balance of the day with them. I showed them our methods of housekeeping, our board bunks fastened to the wall, and at noon we gave them a soldier's dinner of boiled beef, beans, rice, baker's bread, and coffee. We had no butter or milk, but plenty of sugar. Then at three o'clock we attended dress parade, which seemed to interest them very much. From the parade we drove to the hotel where we visited till a late hour, and in the morning they left for home. Another pleasant day was the next Sunday. Mother reached camp around nine. I took her to the hotel where I remained with her till she started home. Her visit was a surprise to me, for I had not expected to see her again. But she had heard that our regiment would be ordered to the front soon, and she said she must see me once more. 
it is better that we cannot lift the veil and look into the future. As she pressed my hand at parting, she noted the tears running down my face and only said, Goodbye, be brave, my boy, and God will keep you. On the 20th, we received our guns, the Springfield rifles, and our uniforms, and on the 22nd, our Colonel, Hugh B. Reed, received orders to get ready and report our regiment for duty. So, on the 23rd of November, 1861, I called the roll of our company at 4.30 a.m., and at 7.30 the regiment was in line. It never made a better display of war than on this occasion as it marched through the city to the station. Never thereafter were all the officers and men in line at the same time. The imposing scene was witnessed by thousands who thronged the streets on either side, and many hearts were aching as fathers, mothers, and wives rushed in to bid their loved ones farewell. At the depot we were formed in a hollow square to receive a beautiful flag donated by the patriotic ladies of the city. The presentation was by Mayor Randall, responded to by our adjutant Charles Case. At 11 a.m. the regiment got aboard and the train pulled out of the depot mid the cheers of thousands of people for the seat of war. We reached Indianapolis at 3 a.m. on the 24th after 15 hours of confinement in the cars. The train was very heavily loaded and a good portion of the way ran very slow. We remained in the cars till daylight when the regiment formed and marched to Camp Reed, named after our colonel, and for the first time went into tents. In the afternoon, Lieutenant Rose and I went nearly to the insane hospital for straw for our beds and brought back to our tent all we could carry. Our brave flag-bearer was in a sad state of inebriation all the way from camp and would frequently pass through the whole length of the train and in language too profane to repeat declared that this flag shall never trail in the dust. I'll carry it till I die. At 10 o'clock p.m. on the 26th, the regiment took a train on the Terre Haute and Vincennes Railroad for Evansville, which we reached at 12 midnight on the 27th. On our arrival here, we were agreeably surprised to find a bountiful dinner awaiting us at the market house furnished by the good people of that city. We put up our tents as soon as possible, but had for our beds the cold, frozen ground. I think I never suffered more from the cold than I did that night. It was like sleeping on a cake of ice. Lieutenant Burge and I procured a skiff and crossed over the Ohio to the old Kentucky shore. For the first time, I ever planted my feet on the soil of a slave state. I picked up a few small shells to send home to my friends. On returning to camp, I found a large package of letters, and among them was one from May, cautiously and discreetly written, but the more I looked it over, the more I could read between the lines. She wrote she was in school again, but her interest in the war had not abated in the least and with her daily she could keep in close touch with all the movement of our armies. Our sick list grew rapidly from sleeping on the damp, frozen ground. I went to the city and sat up with the two Grant boys who had the measles, and one of them was very dangerously sick. Our next move was to Henderson, Kentucky, which is located on the opposite side and down the river. The regiment started quite early and marched down on the Indiana side, reaching the landing opposite Henderson about 3 o'clock p.m. that day. I was left with a detail to load our regimental supplies on a small steamer. 
The supplies were all delivered on the bank and had to be carried down and onto the boat. My help was mostly convalescent boys that were hardly able to march. I think I never worked harder in my life than I did from 6 o'clock a.m. till 6 o'clock the next morning when we got the last box on the third steamer load and jumped on ourselves. On reaching Henderson, we passed through the city out to a beautiful grove about one mile where we found the regiment quartered in their tents. End of Chapter 7 Chapter 8 of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Henderson, Kentucky. Chapter 8 When our regiment reached the landing, it was ferried over the river, then formed and marched through the city with its martial music and colors flying, but met a very cool reception. Not a single cheer to greet the boys that were sacrificing so much. A most unfriendly reception, and we soon realized that we were in an enemy's country. Henderson County is very rich. It is reported that she has more than 4,000 slaves and ranks only second in the state for number. A good Negro is hired out for from two to $300 per year, the owner paying all doctor bills and clothing. Negro stock was down one-third or more now and no sales. The last auction sale was witnessed by a few of our boys who happened to be in the city the second day after reaching there. Governor McGoffin and all the state officers allied themselves with the Confederate cause and the state militia, enlisted under the pretense to protect the citizens of the state and preserve order, had been turned over by the governor with their arms and mustered into the Confederate service. The executive and state officers, however, did not represent the majority of the people. Some nine weeks after the surrender of Fort Sumter, Kentucky gave an aggregate vote for the Union of 92,365 against 36,995 succession in voting for her representatives in the 37th Congress, while at that time not a federal soldier stood upon her soil. The governor's attitude at the time can be more clearly understood by referring to his letter addressed to Abraham Lincoln in behalf of the Commonwealth of Kentucky and the response by the president dated a few days later, August 24th, 1861. His treasonable utterances encouraged the Confederacy to send in her rebel forces, and now the Union and Confederate armies were maneuvering for position and preparing for battle, while thousands of her citizens were joining each army, and no doubt some of the most destructive battles would be fought on her soil. The legislature convened September 3rd, but was not fully organized till the 5th, when McGoffin submitted a message based on the assumption of Kentucky's proper and perfect neutrality between the belligerents north and south of her, complaining that she had suffered in her commerce and prosperity from the acts of either but more especially that a federal force had recently been organized and encamped in the heart of that state without his permission. This message elicited no sympathetic response from the legislature fresh from the people and imbued with Union sentiments. On the contrary, the House six days thereafter resolved, 71 to 26, 
that the governor be directed to order by proclamation the confederate troops encamped on the soil of that state to decamp immediately i herein copy from my diary the last one of the resolutions referred to Quote, resolved that we appeal to the people of kentucky by the ties of patriotism and honor by the ties of common interest and common defense by the remembrances of the past and by the hopes of the future national existence to assist in expelling and driving out the wanton invaders of our peace and neutrality the lawless invaders of our soil unquote. the five resolutions were adopted in the house by sixty eight to twenty six votes and in the senate by twenty six to eight Magoffin promptly vetoed them the legislature as promptly passed them over his veto by an overwhelming majority the governor's adherence to the confederacy divided the people of the state neighborhoods families and severed long-standing friendships in many sections producing feuds that might last a generation the position taken by the legislature to hold their state neutral and quietly let an enemy destroy their government was quite unworthy of patriotic statesmen and resulted in kentucky's being the battleground of the rebellion my excessive lifting and overwork at evansville brought on hemorrhoids which confined me to my tent for nearly two weeks and for several days when the worst to a cot in the big regimental hospital tent our surgeon martin was a loyal man but utterly opposed to any interference with slavery he thought that it would be perfectly right to use the militia to return a runaway slave to his master but a flagrant act to secrete or help one to escape and perhaps of the two he would have let the union slide if to save it slavery must be abolished but he had many noble qualities with his few faults a big kind generous heart was one of them three slaves escaping from their master were making for the river and had nearly reached our camp when looking back over the level country they saw their master in hot pursuit they separated two of them took to the woods and one of them passed through our quarters and entered the large hospital tent where i was lying as he came through the door he cried out for the love of god save me oh hide me massa my master coming with his gun oh do for the lord almighty's sake this plea was too pathetic for the big-hearted doctor who had just finished emptying a large box of hospital underwear he at once ordered the runaway to jump into the box the doctor then laid back the boards and was busily packing the clothing on top when the master rushed in and inquired have you seen my three boys come along the road or come in camp what three little boys asked the doctor no no full grown running away why don't you let them run they'll get enough after a while the woman where i boarded in rome city indiana had a boy about fifteen see mister i don't care for rome or rome city did you see my three men three niggers you mean yes three niggers yes i saw three niggers running like the very devil but suppose they were chasing a rabbit are they yours yes they're mine which way did they go well, some devilish abolitionist coaxed them off don't you think yes i wish they were all hanged which way did they go demanded the planter i wish so too if it hadn't been for them we would have had no war you're right which way did they go come here to the door said the doctor can you see that tall walnut beyond this piece of low timber 
Well, they were making in that direction. What? Not that way. That's towards home. We can't help that, said the doctor. They're sharp and thought you'd take to the river, and they probably thought best to secrete till night and then cross. Think I could get the colonel to detail fifty or a hundred men to help me catch them? Perhaps, said the doctor. You just wait here half an hour and I'll find out. But we have no horses and the boys won't walk. Wait, said the planter. No, I'll go myself. You said the walnut tree? Yes, you will be safe to take that course, said the doctor, knowing full well that the darkies went in an opposite direction. Now the doctor was happy, as all men are when they do a noble, generous act. He gave his runaway some food and a canteen of hot coffee, piled a lot of straw around him in the box, and nailed down the cover on top, leaving plenty of air holes and marked the box. James Watson, M.D., Evansville, Indiana, hospital stores, this side up, ship with care, valuable. And the box and its precious freight, worth before they wore ten or twelve hundred dollars, was carried carefully to the landing, placed on the boat, and reached Dr. Watson that evening. After all was accomplished, the doctor turned to me and said, now, orderly, if you ever peach on me, I'll give you something more painful and harder to cure than hemorrhoids. I laughed heartily as I said, Doctor, if there's anything worse, I don't want it, and I assure you, I'll keep mum. Only a few days after this occurrence, four free Negroes were stolen from the neighborhood. Two of them, a father and son, were landholders, the father escaped, but the three men were taken south, and probably sold. The father offered his and his son's farm to anyone who would rescue them. The army could be used to recapture a drove of stolen hogs by the Confederates, or to capture and return a slave found in our camps, but the condition was such that we could not recapture these freemen stolen by and for confederates to put into slavery is it to be wondered at that a god of justice withheld speedy victory to us while we were so tender of the slaveholders rights and forgetful of the natural rights of man since reaching the enemy's country our duties were multiplying ten picket guards from each company must be detailed every morning, and about the same number for camp guard. A police squad to clear up the camp, a squad to go to the river to unload steamers, and these details must be so made that no favoritism is shown, and that no one should serve on any detail, only in regular rotation, which was not always easy to do if there were many sick. Our sick list was large. We had 20 absent sick in hospital and an average of four or five in camp every day excused from duty. Our rations now consisted of hardtack, bacon, salt, side pork, beans, rice, sugar, coffee, and a new food had just been issued to us called decimated vegetables. The boys called it desecrated vegetables. When first thrown into a kettle, it looked something like potato tops and pumpkin vines. The first day we drew the stuff, a picket detailed engaged one of the boys who remained in camp to get up a good breakfast and have it ready when they returned the next morning. As the time approached, he hung his three-pail kettle over the fire half full of water. Then he broke up and threw in a whole cake, enough for fifty men. It soon absorbed all the water and commenced to swell and burn. He then ran to the spring and dashed in another pail of water. Then he took two pails and asked one of the boys to come and help him. 
When he returned, he put in another pail of water, and it began to run over. Then he got another kettle, and his helper began to dip out, and the cook continued to pour in water. The helper dipped out till he had two more kettles full, and still it must have more water and more kettles. And the boys kept on till they had every kettle in the company full of soup, and said they lost enough to feed twenty men. I think I can safely vouch for this, for the boys told it, and I'm satisfied they were all as honest as George Washington, and perhaps entitled to more credit. I think this food would be very economical for the government to furnish the army. One cake would make all the soup a thousand men would want. We found it very satisfying, and it made excellent filling. We wanted but one meal. One day, our regiment marched through town on every main street, and our appearance at no time or place brought forth a single cheer. All were mute, except fifty or sixty colored and white boys who were located on a fence, and as we passed by, one of the biggest boys, I should judge about fourteen, said to the crowd around him, I'll tell you, boys, there's some men that ain't afraid of nothing. I thought the boy unconsciously hit it about right, for I knew one fellow in the rank that wasn't afraid of nothing. The weather for several days had been very disagreeable, snow, rain, and sleet. Our regiment was assigned to the division commanded by General Thomas J. Crittenden, his headquarters now being at Calhoun, Kentucky, on Green River, about 40 miles from here, in an easterly direction, and to the 13th Brigade commanded by Charles Cruft. Our brigade consisted of the 17th Kentucky, Colonel J. H. McHenry, the 25th Kentucky, by James W. Shackleford, the 31st Indiana by Colonel Charles Cruft, and ours, the 44th Indiana by Hugh B. Reed. On the whole, our stay at Henderson had been pleasant, notwithstanding nearly all the people had been unfriendly. They had regarded us as intruders on their soil sent there in violation of the rights of the state and the Constitution. Lincoln is a tyrant, a usurper, and represents sectionalism. Nature had done very much for the people around Henderson. The country was beautiful, a fine, healthful place, rich soil and good water. We all liked it. On the evening of the first day of January, 1862, we received orders to pack and get ready, and each prepare four days' rations in our haversacks, sixty rounds of ammunition in our boxes, and be ready to start on the morning of the second. Two companies, G and K, struck tents and moved down to Henderson and remained there until further orders. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Green River and Calhoun Chapter 9 Reveille at 5 o'clock a.m. and roll call followed immediately. At noon, the tents were all down, rolled up and loaded on wagons. Next, the packing of knapsacks with two blankets, closely folded, change of underwear, socks, a few trinkets, then the haversack with four days' rations was a new experience to us. 
How could we pack in a small haversack food enough to last one for four days? Raw bacon, hardtack, coffee, sugar, salt, some cooked beans packed in a small tin can. All of this in so small a space required time and skill. Also, a tin cup with a wire bale so that it could be held over the fire for boiling coffee. These two articles we tied on our haversacks. When all was ready, we put on our overcoats, cartridge boxes with 60 rounds, rubber blankets, knapsacks, haversacks, and canteens full of water, then shouldered our guns, and if we found our loads too light to march easily through the mud, half knee-deep, we could take a part of some sick boy's load. At 1.30 p.m., the order was given to fall in, and Company A took her place at the front of the eight companies with our wagon train in the rear. For some three miles, the road was passably good, considering the recent heavy rains. Then we came to a heavy timbered land and red clay soil, and for four days we walked through this red mortar, in many places half knee deep, and every day but one through rain, sleet, and snow. Our wagons were very heavily loaded, and the Teamsters were frequently compelled to double teams to get through the low, swampy places and up some of the worst hills. When we came to a halt for the night, our tents were unloaded and pitched, generally while raining hard on the driest ground we could find, and a fire started as soon as possible. The second night was a hard one. It had rained and, and snowed all day. Our clothes were wet through, our pants covered with mud to our knees, and our feet wet and cold. Each mess built a big fire in front of their tents and dried their clothing as much as possible, patiently accepting the condition as inevitable, without a murmur or complaint. On this short campaign, we soon found that our quartermaster, Dr. George W. McConnell, was master of the situation and just the man for the time and place. He did everything that he possibly could to make the boys comfortable. As soon as we would halt for the night, he would confiscate and bring in straw to fill our tents and anything else that was needed to prevent exposure and suffering if it could be found in the enemy's country. Our people at home know very little about mud. It takes the red clay mortar of Kentucky to stick to one's shoes and clothing. It will stick to the clothing until worn off and to the shoes till scraped off with a knife. The first day we moved only six miles, the second only eight and the last two about thirteen each, and reached Calhoun about three o'clock p.m. in time to put up our tents, gather some bushes to lie on, and some wood for fires to dry our clothing. It was a relief indeed to unload my knapsack, cartridge box, canteen, haversack, which was now very light, and gun. The second day, it seemed to me that my shoulders were cut down to the bone, and the next morning they were so sore that to move with my load was, every minute, extreme torture. The village of Calhoun may have had, before the war, from two to three hundred population, but now very few citizens were to be seen. The country immediately surrounding the town was very flat only a few feet above the river at high water, and the soil a heavy red clay. Bayous make back from the river, and fill the swamps during the winter and spring, and altogether it looks like a very unhealthful location for an army to encamp on. We spent the first two days fixing up our camp, ditching around our tents and policing the grounds, 
Soon after getting our camp in good order, a first lieutenant in the regiment took his pen and wrote in a large bold hand on a sheet of paper, No admittance except on business, and penned it on his tent. In less than an hour, every tent in his company had the same sign over the entrance of their tents. Nothing was said by any of the boys, and this was a silent rebuke that made him chafe for several days. The third day of our march, about noon, our regiment halted for an hour or more, and while I was eating my lunch, this same lieutenant came along and sat down by me. Are you tired, Lieutenant? I asked. Tired, I should say yes, but not only tired, but completely disgusted with this red clay mortar. Look at my boots and pants. Just put them on new at Evansville, and now I'm mud to my hips, and it will never come off till I wear it off. I'm tired of this kind of service and won't stand it much longer. I'll resign and go home. Shall I give you one word of advice, Lieutenant, and will you take it kindly? Yes, if given kindly. Now, what is it? Don't ever make that remark so your boys will hear it. I assure you, I'll not tell them. You must remember that you enlisted many of them and urged them by all the eloquence you possessed to leave home friends and families and enlist with you. And I remember hearing you tell while in camp that you used this expression on one occasion that brought down the house. We'll fight them till hell freezes over and then fight them on the ice. Oh, I just said that to get up a little enthusiasm. Well, Lieutenant, that place is not frozen over yet and you just stick to the service and the boys you enlisted till every button on your coat is shot off. Some of your boys are sick, and many of them are getting discouraged, and they need all the encouragement you can give them. We were interrupted here, and the conversation changed. The weather was very unfavorable to health. It rained nearly every day, and the sick list was growing fast. Company A had 30 very sick in the hospital, 10 in camp unfit for duty, and several more complaining. It was said that we had 6,000 soldiers here, and that more than 1,200 of them were in the various hospitals sick. They were sheltered from the storms, but some of the buildings were very unsanitary. Old vacant houses, long abandoned bar rooms, one church, and a Masonic hall. I visited our boys as often as possible and found many of them very sick, lying on rough army blankets spread over a small amount of straw with overcoats or knapsacks for pillows and one or two blankets over them. Some of the boys were too sick to recognize their best friends, and others were quite delirious. But not from one did I hear a complaint. How the parents and friends of these boys would have suffered had they known how loathsome these hospitals were and how destitute of those things necessary for the sick. The doctors and nurses were doing all they could to alleviate suffering. The prevailing diseases were pneumonia, typhoid fever, and camp disease. The unsanitary buildings, the water, and swampy location added daily to the number of sick and increased the fatality. Our boys got the impression that they were to go into winter quarters here, so they built fireplaces in their tents with stick chimneys outside, plastered over with red clay. By this means, they could dry out their tents and blankets. Only a few days after reaching here, our first lieutenant 
tired of the service and disgusted with the conditions at Calhoun, sent in his resignation, which, if accepted, would cause a vacancy in our company. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Green River and South Carlton. Chapter Ten. On the fourteenth of January, eighteen sixty two, we received an order to quote, await an order to move, unquote. and on the morning of the 15th received the order. Tents were taken down, rolled up and loaded on the wagons, knapsacks were packed, canteens, haversacks, and cartridge boxes filled, and when already our regiment took its place in the brigade and started for South Carlton in an easterly direction, up and by the river some twenty miles, but not so far across the country. I was left with a guard detail to go with the boats, and at 3 p.m. Matty Cook, with six flat boats lashed to her, followed by the Hattie Gilmore, all heavily loaded with army supplies and a few soldiers for guards, left the landing at Calhoun, and we were all glad. We reached South Carlton about dusk, and soon found our regiment, which had just arrived. There were so many empty buildings, our tents were not needed, and Company A took possession of a large frame building on the main street. We found the doors all locked, but the boys used a rail instead of a key and went in at the front door. The building had been used for a drugstore and doctor's office, and everything of value had been removed except one skeleton, which hung by the neck in one of the back rooms. This, of course, we had no use for, and it was not disturbed. I ate a little hardtack and raw bacon, wrapped my blanket around me, climbed on one of the counters, and got some sleep. South Carlton is nicely located some fifty feet or more above the river, and the landing is reached by a diagonal cut from the main street along the side of the rocky bluff to the water's edge. The rain had not abated, and the mud was as staple here as in Calhoun, only the country is more rolling and better drained. Soon after our teams began to haul supplies from the landing, Main Street was a sea of mud, and as it became thinned up by the heavy rains, it moved down the street to the cut, then dashed over the bank a torrent of mud into the river below, changing it from green to red river. From what little I saw of the village, I judged there were houses enough in South Carlton to accommodate three or four hundred population, but the citizens were so alarmed at the approach of the Yanks that they nearly all of them took their personal effects, locked their houses, and left. We remained in the storeroom till the 19th of January, when we went into camp about one mile south of town, in a piece of woodland a beautiful location for a camp. In the afternoon, Lieutenant Rose and I went about one mile after straw for our tent, and on returning to camp, I found a large bundle of letters, several from home and two from May. One was a reply to my Calhoun letter, in which I mentioned the unsanitary condition of our hospitals and the terrible suffering of the sick. In closing, she said, Quote, in our comfortable homes, with everything we need, I fear that we forget the sacrifices and sufferings of our boys. We do not comprehend a tithe of their privations, exposures, and hardships. 
From your description, the accommodation for the very sick are so much worse than I supposed that I almost go wild with anxiety for the friends I have in the service and sit for hours and wonder what can be done to make conditions better. Remember that you have many friends here that are all the time anxious for you and for their sakes as well as yours. Do try and be careful of your health. From one of your best friends, your little girl, May." Unquote. A few words from a letter just received from a friend living near Mr. Gordon's. After giving me some of the unimportant neighborhood gossip, closed by saying, quote, It is currently reported that Miss May Gordon is engaged to Arthur Prescott. Everybody speaks very highly of him and seem to think that she can never do better. Unquote. I doubt it myself, but I don't believe a word of it. She would have written me. Not a word of it is true. All of this and more ran through my head as I took the letter and wrote on the back of the envelope, quote, the last paragraph, all false, unquote and put it in my inside pocket. Buckner's army was at Bowling Green, and an advance of his force was anticipated, so every available man was detailed to chop, dig trenches, and build fortifications. The timber was thrown outward, the limbs cut off and sharpened, and when there was an open space left, Young saplings were cut off the right length, driven down, leaning outward about 45 degrees, and then sharpened to a point with an axe and shaving knife. Nelson and I were set to work making axe handles, of which there seemed to be a greater demand than we could supply, and many others were kept at the same work for two days. On the evening of the third day, after this alarm was received, I was ordered to take nine men with me and go south about three miles through a dense forest to the fork of the road, then divide into two equal squads and guard each road eighty rods beyond the junction. We were given an old-fashioned perforated lantern and a piece of candle about four inches long, which we lighted and started, but we had scarcely reached the road at the edge of the wood when the rain began to pour down, and darkness became intense as we entered the timber. After a long, silent, gloomy walk, by the aid of our little lantern, we found the fork of the road. I left four men at this point and took five down the left-hand branch, eighty rods, as near as I could guess, and stationed and instructed them, then returned and with the remaining four went along our road about the same distance. By this time it was raining so hard we each found a large tree and hugged up close to it for shelter. Then I blew out my light. Dave was next to me, not more than four feet to my right, but I could see nothing of him nor the tree. Oh my, how dark! Not a loud word was spoken and not a sound could be heard, but the fast-falling raindrops as they piteously poured down through the forest, drenching us to the skin. Full three hours or more had passed. I was chilled through and so sleepy that I could scarcely stand erect, and only by the sheer force of will could I keep myself from getting down by the root of the tree and yielding to the demand for sleep. The rain came from the east, so we stood on the west side of our respective trees for better protection. In raising my eyes and looking to the west, I discovered a small light, no larger than a candle, and called Dave over to me. I was wide awake enough then. For just an instant I felt a slight chill creep up my spine and run over the back of my head. 
You see it, Dave. How far is it? I should say about 60 rods, and seems to be intermittent, sometimes flashing quite bright, and then going out. It is slowly coming our way and oscillates up and down like a lantern. That can't possibly be a spy out such a night as this, Dave. It's just the time for such work, orderly. See, it has stopped. Now it moves this way. By this time, the four boys were all standing around my tree, quite excited, but very quietly watching. If it's a spy, said Hyatt, speaking very low, let's be ready, and if he don't halt, fill him full of balls. But look, he has started for our camp. We stood in the rain and watched this singular light till it slowly disappeared. Then we got under our respective trees and patiently watched and waited, expecting that we might hear a gun from some of the guards. But we heard none and anxiously waited. There it comes, said Mike. It is moving this way and will likely take this road. But in a short time, he seemed to be coming back on the same line that he took before. Now, boys, you watch this road, I said, and Dave and I will go about thirty rods west and, if possible, get on his line of march. We each took our gun and started out, one holding on to the other's coat, and after running against numberless trees and staggering like drunken men through the dense darkness, we stopped at what we thought was the proper position, and then the light seemed to be some forty or fifty rods directly to our front. It would frequently stop two or three minutes, then move toward us slowly. Now, orderly, said Dave, it's coming directly on this line. You watch the light. My gun is all ready, and you be sure and order a halt before it gets within twelve or fifteen feet. Not before, and if he don't halt, I'll blow a hole through him bigger than this candle. Don't shoot till I order him to halt, and I'll not order till he gets within ten feet, so that we can see by his own light who and what he is. Be sure and hold on, for we have all the advantage. Just as you say, orderly, I'd rather wait till I see him. This conversation was carried on in a low tone, and then we sat still, waiting patiently as the light approached very slowly, sometimes for a minute or two disappearing entirely, then appearing a little nearer us. Occasionally it would seem to jump ahead several rods and then apparently stand still. Be careful, Dave. Don't shoot till I halt, I whispered. The whole camp will be out here. Now it's coming fast. Dave raised his gun. The light flashed in our faces as I said, Halt! and went out entirely. Where is it? "'What in thunder is it?' asked Dave. "'It came so quickly, I couldn't shoot.' "'It's well you didn't, Dave. I was afraid you would. "'The light is a jack-o'-lantern. "'I never saw one before, and more than half believe them to be a fiction. "'But I guess there's no myth about this.' "'No,' said Dave. "'This was a dead sure thing, but where is it now? "'It has disappeared.' We have broken its circuit, and it will hardly appear on this line again tonight. End of chapter 10「Chapter 11 of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler this is a LibriVox recording in the public domain. South Carlton and Calhoun Chapter 11 
Dave and I went back to the road and found the boys quite excited. They heard me say, Halt! and saw the light distinctly as it flashed up in our faces at the time, but no gun was fired, and the light went out. Then I told them of the experience of an old soldier in Bonaparte's army in France, how he and a comrade were out on a picket, right in the face of the enemy, in a low, swampy country, on a dark, rainy night, and the same light appeared to them, coming slowly nearer and nearer from toward the enemy, and when within two or three rods, as they supposed, he gave the order to halt, and his comrade fired. The whole brigade rushed out, and when they learned the trouble, put them under arrest, and only their ignorance of the jack-o'-lantern saved them from punishment. Now, boys, this has roused and warmed us up, and I am glad it happened, for I'm afraid I was so chilled through that I should have fallen asleep before long, and now I'm going to run my chance with your consent and strike a light. We all got up in the huddle. One of the boys held an oil cloth over me, one took the candle out of the lantern, and I found a dry place on my clothing and commenced striking matches, but they seemed to be all damp and none good. I kept on, however, till I had used fifty or more, all with the same result. Well, boys, our destiny hangs on this match, for this is the last one, and this one was good and caught, so that we lighted our candle. I then looked at my watch, and t'was just... 4 a.m., and the rain still pouring down. One of the boys remarked that if Buckner or any of his subordinates move on us such a night as this, they don't know enough to go in out of the rain and much less to command an army. Let's build a small fire, and we all consented. The boys found a large hollow tree and pulled out some dry, punky wood with which we started a fire under a large tree. And to this little beginning, we added fuel until we had a rousing fire. The other five boys saw the fire and came over. They were wet like us and completely chilled through. But at the very first sight of fire, we began to feel warmer. At seven o'clock, while it was yet quite dark in the woods, we started for camp where we found some good fires and soon dried out our clothing. In a few days, we heard that Buckner's army commenced the movement on South Carlton, but on account of the impassable roads, it was compelled to return. Jack and Gun Smith seemed to be disappointed, but it didn't worry me any. There were a few men, and only a few, who occasionally found a little fault at the division of rations, but I never blamed them. Their duties were hard, and I wondered at their patience. At South Carlton, I had so much to do that one morning I called on the second sergeant and asked him to draw and divide the rations. It was really this sergeant's duty to do this, but I never called on him before. This he undertook cheerfully, and when nearly through, someone objected to the division of beef and charged him with partiality, which raised his dander, and he jumped up and commenced to pull off his coat. I heard the trouble and stepped in and said, Boys, we'll not have any trouble over a little matter of this kind. I've gotten through with my work now, and I will finish this job. John, I said in a low tone, you have done well, just as well as I could, but the only difference is I pay no attention to their fault-finding and hold on to my temper. It ran along for several days and grew worse instead of better, and one man in particular was continually dissatisfied with the rations his mess received. He was much older and had had so much more experience that it worried and chafed me. 
One day I called him out to one side and said, Comrade, you were in the regular army once, were you not? Yes, I put four years. Well, that gave you a rich experience. You saw a good deal of service in that time, and it's no boy's play in that army. You may bet your bottom dollar that everything always runs as smooth as a clock. Now, comrade, you know I'm almost snowed under with duties and have been, since we have so many sick to look after, but the dividing of rations bothers me more than all my other duties. In fact, it worries me because I'm not able to give satisfaction. You know, comrade, that it is a very difficult job to divide some of our rations accurately between so many men, and no two messes have the same number. Oh yes, I realize it's not easily done. Now, I have been thinking if I could only get you to help, sit right down by my side and advise, or for instance, take right hold and help me divide the rations, that it will satisfy the boys and relieve me of this worry which I find is wearing on me more than my other work. All right, orderly, I'll do all I can to help you, and I guess we both can make it. So the next morning, Comrade was on hand, and our beef was unusually poor. We had some steaks, some poor bony boiling pieces, and several pieces of ribs and flank, and one good sirloin roast. I asked Comrade to divide the meat to make ten piles and do the best he could, while I divided the other rations. When we got through, I looked it over and said... You've done well, better than I could do, for that meat was a tough proposition. Then I commenced to call off, and two messes refused to accept their beef. A few sharp words and insinuations followed, when Comrade jumped to his feet, pulled off his coat, and began to get his fists in good fighting trim, when I said, Boys, don't let's have any trouble. I'd rather eat all this meat than have any hard feelings. But Comrade was not easily quieted. He tried to do the very best he could, and no one could have done better. He turned to the boys and said, I'll have nothing more to do with the rations if you starve. Our orderly has all the time done as well or better than anyone else could or would have done, and if I hear anyone finding fault the hereafter, I'll dust their jacket or they will mine. From that time on, we had no trouble in dividing rations, and right here I will say that notwithstanding, I made many mistakes. The boys all treated me with the kindliest consideration from the very beginning of my services as orderly. Early in the morning, we received orders to pack everything and get ready to move, and all day we worked, even till midnight, to get everything on the steamers and barges. Our destination, we heard, was Calhoun, the slow of despond. When all through, Nelson and I were at the landing. I was very tired and sleepy. He lay down at the base of a huge pile of boxes containing army crackers or hardtack, but I concluded to go higher and climbed nearly to the top, found a good place out of the wind, wrapped my blanket and rubber around me, and soon dropped to sleep. About five o'clock in the morning, the boat hands commenced loading boxes of hardtack and began at the bottom of the pile. I did not hear them or awaken till my foundation gave way. Then I realized I was going head first somewhere through a box factory. When the workmen dug me out, they expected to find me badly injured. But I was not, and felt well rested by the good night's sleep and comfortable bed. The regiment marched across the country. I went by the barges in charge of our company supplies and reached Calhoun at noon. At the landing, I met an old friend whom I had not seen since we left Camp Allen. He belonged to Company B 
and was living at Gordon's when he enlisted. Well, Simmons, this is a good surprise. How in the kingdom came you here? You remember I was taken sick at Camp Ellen and was furloughed home, and now I'm here all ready to report for duty. Well, come with me, John, and tell me all the news. Do you see any of my folks? Yes, I met your brother at Gordon's the day before I left. He stayed there till dusk, and here's a package of letters, and he sends lots of love. All right, John, I thank you. By the way, how are they at Gordon's? They're old friends of yours and old acquaintances of mine. They're all well, but May, she was poorly a week or so and left school, but better when I left. Did she quit on that account, I asked? She said not. She said she concluded to take a vacation. She says she can't take much interest in her studies while the war lasts. Has she any near friends in the army, John? Well, now, I don't know. I asked her that question one day, how many, and she held up both hands with her fingers open and smiled. Is there anyone there now except their own family, John? None but Arthur Prescott, he has been there about a week when I left, is just able to go around on crutches. Well, John, I just learned from a friend in the neighborhood that May and Arthur were engaged. Did you hear that report? Yes, I heard that gossip. Did you see anything that confirmed it? Well, hardly on her part. She is so kind and good to everybody, especially every soldier, that it's hard to tell. I saw Arthur look at her several times as though he could say his prayers to her. By the way, she handed me a letter to give you. Maybe you're one that she is anxious about. I'm only one of a great many, John. She has a great many friends. That's true, Marion. She is a good friend to everybody, and more especially to the poor and friendless. As John left me, I opened May's letter first, from which I quote one paragraph. Quote, A few days ago, Father and I called on Arthur and brought him home to stay with us for a brief time, while his mother's visiting her sister in Michigan. Although improving, he suffers a good deal from his wound, but is very patient, and when I see him now so helpless and think how robust he was when he enlisted and that now he is likely to be a cripple for life. I can hardly keep back the tears. Oh, this cruel, cruel war! I cannot do justice to myself in my studies while I have so many friends in the service and have laid by my books for a while, go through my daily routine of housework mechanically, and then read my dailies." Unquote. My brother's letter was full of love and affection, and I hear with, quote, from it, a postscript hastily written at Mr. Gordon's. Quote, I found John Simmons at Gordon's. He promised to call on you. I had an interesting visit with May and found her the same bright, generous girl she was when a child. To her natural beauty and grace, she has added culture and refinement. As far as she has gone, she is very thorough, a great reader and thinker. In short, she is thoroughly posted on war, the position, condition, and movements of both armies. She prizes the book you gave her very highly, and asked me many questions about you, and then at last said, quote, I do feel a deep interest in your brother. You remember we were playmates, and when I was but a child, he saved my life, and in doing so almost lost his own, and now if he should be taken sick or wounded, I would be helpless to aid one to whom I owe so much. I have never been able to express my gratitude to him as I would like. He would never listen to a word, and that is why I take the liberty to talk so freely to you. And here, as her voice began to waver, she gave me her hand, but did not look up or say goodbye as she left me, and passed from the parlor up a flight of stairs to a room above. Yours affectionately, Prentice. Unquote. 
I sat for a long time in a deep study and said to myself, A generous, noble girl. God bless me, Gordon. She is crucifying herself for her friends. End of chapter 11「Chapter 12 of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From Calhoun to Fort Henry, Chapter 12 On reaching Calhoun, our regiment went in camp on the same ground we left on the 15th of January and each mess of Company A was now using the same fireplace and chimney they had built. When making my last monthly report, I found that we had thirty-five sick in hospital, ten excused from duty, and had lost five by death, reducing our number of available men to fifty. Eight of the sick were in Evansville, five in South Carlton, and twenty-two at this place. We also had eight more that were really unfit for duty, but refused to go to the surgeon to be excused, fearing that he might order them to the hospital. The resignation of our first lieutenant was rejected, but as he had been sick since reaching there on the 1st of February, he was granted a leave of absence and started for home, immediately. It rained here nearly every day, making the roads and streets almost impassable. There were heavy army wagons, cavalry, and artillery constantly moving along the main street, mixing the thin mortar with all kinds of filth and slops from the houses, and straw and manure from the stables. Hogs lived in the streets and wallowed through the mud. They were so poor and thin that when the sun shone, they were almost transparent, except for the heavy coat of red clay that stuck to their bristles. Half-starved, long-eared, and long-legged hounds vied with the hogs in filth. Old houses uninhabited, sheds, stables, log shacks, filthy pig pens, old wagons, boxes, barrels, and wood piles decorated the main streets on either side. Was it any wonder that we had so many sick in our company? Was it not a greater wonder that we were not all in a hospital or covered over deep down under this red clay? A hard battle would be much less fatal than to remain here. I don't mean to complain. It might have been necessary to occupy this place. I am just giving the terrible condition and results. February 7th, all the sick that were able were ordered to be sent to Evansville, where they can have good, healthful surroundings and care. I had just returned from a visit to our sick that were not able to be moved and who were to be left in Dr. Rarick's care. Most all were cases of typhoid fever. Many were in a stage of stupor. A few opened their eyes and tried to greet me with a smile. I went to young Steely's bed, spoke to him a few times, and tried to rouse him, but he was past recognizing anyone. His home was near Angola. Seeing these boys of ours in such a low, reduced condition, lying on rough blankets with a little straw under them, with nothing but an overcoat or knapsack under their heads, and most of them covered with bed sores, made my heart sick. If they were only at home, some of them might recover, but there, with those surroundings, there was little hope. That morning, the 8th, we received orders to move and as soon as possible everything was packed and loaded on the little side-wheel steamer, Nettie Gilmore. 
At 1 a.m. we bade Calhoun a long farewell and moved down Green River. The water was excessively high, overflowing the low lands and extending back through the swamps a long distance, bringing into the channel large amounts of down timber and filling the river with drift that resembled an endless raft floating down the current. On account of this, our steamer ran down about five miles and tied up at a landing. The night was cold with a strong north wind and as there was no chance for the boys to rest and keep warm on the boat, they all got off and built fires using the barrel staves, corded up along the river, which burned well but was rather expensive fuel for the owner. At 7 a.m. on the 9th, we again started down the river, stopping at Spotsville, where we changed from the Nettie Gilmore to the Baltic a large stern-wheeler, and from there on we had no trouble with driftwood, although the river was full. A vast amount of valuable property was going down the river into the Ohio. Fences, millions of rails, chicken coops, pig pens, corn cribs, hay and stacks of fodder, and now and then a good-sized log house. We reached Evansville about dusk passed on and stopped at Henderson, Kentucky, a half-hour, and then reached Paducah at 8 a.m. on the 10th. Here was an ocean of water. The whole country was flooded, the water up to the second story of the business houses along the river. The town, too, was full of water, and the people were navigating some of the streets with boats and rafts. Our boys said they saw pigs looking at them through the second-story windows, while dogs, cats, and poultry were running around on top of houses. Here were more steamers congregated together than I ever saw before, lying along the bank with volumes of black smoke rolling up from their tall chimneys and puffs of white steam vanishing in the air. Among them was one queer-looking little thing, a gunboat, probably for our protection, compared with the other steamers, looked like a tiny banty rooster. The boys called it a mud turtle, a sort of cross between a submarine fort, a dredging machine, and coal barge. It's unlike anything in the fleet, and to obviate asking questions, we called it a gunboat. We stopped at Paducah nearly an hour. Then the whole fleet commenced to move, the Baltic dropping in about the middle of the column, accompanied by our little gunboat running along on the right of our fleet as though our safety depended on her. Every steamer seemed to be loaded down to the water with infantry, artillery, cavalry, army wagons, mules, horses, army supplies of all kinds, and all the paraphernalia of war. And as the fleet turned up the Tennessee, we knew positively then that we were bound for Fort Henry, ninety miles up the river, an agreeable change to us from the poisoned mud and putrid water of Calhoun. It was a beautiful day. The soft, mellow breeze came down from the south where the robins sing and the roses bloom all winter. The rocky bluffs on the one side of the river and the wild, unbroken forests on the other furnished me a variety of interesting scenery to keep me on deck all day. Occasionally, here and there, a log cabin cropped out from a small clearing occupied by some squatter family. A half-dozen half-dressed children, the wife and mother poorly clad, and the lord of the shack and ranch sitting under the shade with his gun and two or three dogs at his feet and occasionally at landings we passed a few small towns or a cluster of houses where a group of negro children 
a few white lads and lasses and a few old gray-headed men and women had congregated and witnessed a sight such as they never saw before our boys would give ringing cheers for the union lincoln and the old flag but we heard no response in advance of us were seven gunboats the cincinnati st louis carondelet lexington tyler and conestoga the cincinnati being commodore foote's flagship the fleet landed two brigades of troops on the west side of the river and three on the east about four miles below the fort those on the west side were to advance and cut off any reinforcements from the new fort being built on that side while those on the east under general mclernand would work their way through the woods and swamps to gain the rear of the enemy and storm the fort if ordered as charles carleton coffin was on the cincinnati with commodore foote and was an eyewitness we will let him describe in his graphic way the bombardment of fort henry Quote, commodore foote had prepared his instructions to the officers and crews of the gunboats several days before they were brief and plain the four ironclad boats the essex carondelet st louis and cincinnati will keep in line the conestoga lexington and tyler will follow the ironclads and throw shells over those in advance to the commanders he said do just as i do addressing the crews he said fire slowly and with deliberate aim there are three reasons why you should not fire rapidly with rapid firing there is always a waste of ammunition your range is imperfect and your shots go wide of the mark and that encourages the enemy and it is desirable not to heat the guns if you fire slowly and deliberately you will keep cool yourselves and make every shot tell Unquote. with such instructions with all things ready deck cleared for action guns run out shot and shell brought up from the magazines and piled on deck confident of success and determined to take the fort or go to the bottom he waited the appointed hour the gunboats steamed up slowly against the current that the troops may have time to get into position in rear of the rebel entrenchments they take the channel on the west side of the island the essex is on the left of the battle line nearest to the island her commander is william d porter who comes from good stock it was his father who commanded the essex in the war with great britain in eighteen thirteen and who fought most gallantly a superior force two british ships the phoebe and the cherub in the harbor of valparaiso next the essex is the carondelet then the cincinnati the flagship with the brave commander on board and nearest the western shore the st louis these are all iron plated at the bows astern is the lexington the conestoga and the tyler the boats reach the head of panther island and the fort is in full view it is thirty-four minutes past twelve o'clock there is a flash and a great creamy cloud of smoke at the bow of the cincinnati an eight-inch shell screams through the air the gunners watch its course their practiced eyes follow its almost viewless flight your watch ticks fifteen seconds before you hear from it you see a puff of smoke a cloud of sand thrown up in the fort and then hear the explosion the commanders of the other boats remember the instructions do just as i do 
and from each vessel a shell is thrown. All fall within the fort, or in the encampment beyond, which is in sight. You can see the tents, the log huts, the tall flagstaff. The fort accepts the challenge, and instantly the twelve guns which are in position to sweep the river open upon the advancing boats. The shot and shell plow furrows in the stream and throw columns of water high in the air. Another round from the fleet. Another round from the fort. The air is calm and the thunder of the cannonade rolls along the valley, reverberating from hill to hill. Louder and deeper and heavier is the booming till it becomes almost an unbroken peal. There is a commotion in the rebel encampment. Men run to and fro. They curl down behind the stumps and the fallen trees to avoid the shot. Their huts are blown to pieces by the shells. You see the logs tossed like straws into the air. Their tents torn into paper rags. The hissing shells sink deep into the earth and then there are sudden upheavals of sand with smoke and flames, as if volcanoes were bursting forth. The parapet is cut through. Sandbags are knocked about. The air is full of strange, mysterious, hideous, terrifying noises. There are seven or eight thousand rebel soldiers in the rifle pits and behind the breastworks of the encampment in line of battle. They are terror-stricken. Officers and men alike lose all self-control. They run to escape the fearful storm. They leave arms, ammunition, tents, blankets, trunks, clothes, books, letters, papers, pictures, everything. They pour out of the entrenchments into the road leading to Dover, a motley rabble. A small steamboat lies in the creek above the fort. Some rush on board and steam up the river with utmost speed. Others, in their haste and fear, plunge into the creek and sink to rise no more. All fly except a brave little band in the fort. The gunboats move straight on, slowly and steadily. Their fire is regular and deliberate. Every shot goes into the fort. The gunners are blinded and smothered by clouds of sand. The gun carriages are crushed, splintered, and overturned. Men are cut to pieces. Something unseen tears them like a thunderbolt. The fort is full of explosions. The heavy rifled gun bursts, crushing and killing those who serve it. The flagstaff is splintered and torn as by intensest lightning. Yet the fort replies. The gunners have the range of the boats, and nearly every shot strikes the iron plating. They are like the strokes of sledgehammers, indenting the sheets, starting the fastenings, breaking the tough bolts. The Cincinnati receives thirty-one shots, the Essex fifteen, the St. Louis seven, and the Carondelet six. Though struck so often, they move on. The distance lessens. Another gun is knocked from its carriage in the fort. Another. Another. There are signs that the contest is about over, that the rebels are ready to surrender. But a shot strikes the Essex between the iron plate. It tears through the oaken timbers and into one of the steam boilers. There is a great puff of steam. It pours from the portholes, and the boat is enveloped in a cloud. She drops out of line of battle. 
Her engines stop, and she floats with the stream. Twenty-eight of her crew are scalded, among them her brave commander. The rebels take courage. They spring to their guns and fire rapidly and wildly, hoping and expecting to disable the rest of the fleet. But the Commodore does not falter. He keeps straight on as if nothing had happened. An eighty-pound shell from the Cincinnati dismounts a gun, killing or wounding every gunner. The boats are so near that every shot is sure to do its work. The fire of the boats increase, while the fire of the fort diminishes. Coolness, determination, energy, perseverance, and power win the day. The rebel flag comes down and the white flag goes up. Cheers ring through the fleet. A boat puts out from the St. Louis. An officer jumps ashore, climbs the torn embankment, stands upon the parapet and waves the stars and stripes. Hurrah! 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 You hear it echoing from shore to shore. In one hour and twelve minutes from the firing of the first gun, the fort, which the rebels maintained could protect the Tennessee, surrendered, opening up water communication into the heart of the Confederacy. This was Thursday, and should have been a day of thanksgiving, for that victory, from a military standpoint, was of national importance, and should have inspired the hearts of the discouraged, the doubtful, and the disloyal to greater devotion for their country. At 9 p.m., the whole fleet of transports assembled around the captured fort and celebrated the victory with martial music, patriotic speeches, and cheers from 10,000 boys in blue. End of chapter 12、chapter、thirteen of my story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From Fort Henry to Fort Donelson. Chapter thirteen. Very soon after the surrender of the fort, the gunboats were run back down the river to Cairo for repairs. Commodore Foote was also there, looking after the comfort and care of the men scalded on the Essex, the repairing of the boats, and reporting to the War Department the surrender of Fort Henry. On the Sunday following, when the bell rang for service, the Commodore was present. The minister being absent, he stepped into the pulpit, read a chapter, offered prayer, and preached from the text. Quote, Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me.、Unquote. He exhorted his hearers. Not only to believe in God, but to believe also in His Son and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. He, like General O. O. Howard, lived what he believed and lived it every day. Had we had more such men in command of our armies, less mistakes would have been made and more victories won. Before leaving Calhoun, our brigade had been transferred from Buell's to Grant's army, and attached to General Lew Wallace's division, a portion of which, including our brigade, was ordered to Donelson by the Cumberland. At eleven p.m., after celebrating the victory at Fort Henry with patriotic speeches, martial music, and cheers. The fleet of transports moved down the Tennessee to Paducah, which we reached some time during the early morning. I dated three letters, quote, on the Baltic, unquote, 
one to Mother, one to Prentice, and one to May. I kept nothing back, but expressed my mind freely and plainly of the conflict pending. I wrote Mother that our fleet would leave Paducah within a very brief time and move up the Ohio, then up the Cumberland to Fort Donaldson, which the rebels call the, quote, Gibraltar of the Confederacy, unquote. In closing, I said, quote, We shall capture the fort, but it will involve a hard fight and cost many lives. Whether I survive or not, rest assured, dear mother, that I shall try to do my whole duty and that I have never forgotten your parting words. To be plain and honest with you, I must say that I contemplate the awful carnage that must ensue with feelings of dread. Yet I feel no fear. I'm not afraid, and this condition of mind seemingly so contradictory. I cannot explain, but I have strong faith that I shall survive. Remember me as you promised. Your affectionate son, Marion. Unquote. In closing my letter to Prentice, I said, quote, You have always been a kind, indulgent, generous elder brother. If you could read my heart now, you would know that it is full of love and gratitude to you. Your affectionate brother, M. Unquote. My letter to May was written under proper restraint. I could not take the liberty to say what was in my heart, but all my words were carefully chosen and warm with the strongest regard, and I knew she could read much between the lines. I told her of the important victory at Fort Henry. Quote, and now with the capture of Fort Donaldson, we not only reach the heart of the Confederacy by two waterways, but it will eventually make it possible to open the Mississippi to the Gulf, thus cutting the rebellion in two. Better several thousand fall than lose Donaldson. Nashville will be surrendered soon after we capture the fort. Be patient and don't worry, my little girl. I feel confident I shall pass through unharmed. Remember me as you promised. Your best friend, Marion. Unquote. At 4.30 p.m. on the 12th day of February, our 12 steamers and our little teller or signal boat cut loose and were soon in line, the Baltic taking its place, the sixth from the front. Soon after starting, I sat down on the upper deck by myself when my old friend John Summers came up and sat down by me. Well, John, how is the health and how are you anyway? My health has improved wonderfully. I like this ride on the river. What's the news from home? Anything from Gordon's? Here's a letter from Marge. That may interest you some. I took it readily and read it through hastily, as the body of the letter was quite important. Then my eye caught a brief postscript signed by Marge, which said, quote, You see Marion often, you say. He's an old friend of our family, especially of May. Tell him that she will probably leave us next fall as her marriage is set for October 1st. Arthur has received a nice little fortune from his Uncle Arthur, but that, of course, has no influence with May. I asked May to write Marion, but she seemed indifferent. March. Unquote. For a moment, the blood left my head and face, and I felt dizzy. Then, controlling myself and voice, I said, John, Marge never wrote that letter. There is something materially wrong here. The whole letter is a fraud. What does it mean? I can't conceive who would forge her name. What object could anyone have? I'd almost swear that it is Marge's handwriting, but I'll write her again and, if possible, find out. 
Do so, John, but please don't mention me in your letter at all. Will you give me this letter? I wish to keep it. It will be a great favor. I'll find out the author if I live to get home. Yes, said John. Keep it, and when I get another, we'll compare. As John walked away, I looked it over carefully. It's a good imitation, I thought. I looked at the envelope. The stamp was stuck on carelessly, nearly bottom side up, and the folding in bad taste. I then took a pen and ink and wrote on the envelope, a forgery, and placed it in my inside coat pocket, out of my sight. But I could not put it out of my mind. May indifferent? No, that gives the whole scheme away. Bless her heart, it's all false. If there was one word of truth in her engagement, she would have written me as she promised. It doesn't fit in well with what she told Prentice a few days ago. Well, I have plenty to think of for the next few days. Before reaching Smithland, at the mouth of the Cumberland, we met other transports loaded with troops, which turned around and dropped in our rear, making fifteen in all. The five gunboats having gone on in advance. These transports, as they moved up the Cumberland with banners flying over the crowded decks, glittering with burnished arms, gay with uniforms, enlivened by numerous martial bands, made a grand imposing spectacle long to be remembered by those who witnessed it. The captain and I had been on deck most of the time since leaving Paducah, watching the fleet and the scenery along the river, and the drift, too, as it came down the stream and passed by us so rapidly, when all of a sudden he became deathly sick. I took him below and called in Dr. Martin, as soon as possible, and while helping what I could, I was taken in the same way. So awfully sick, I was frightened. I thought I would turn inside out and that everything but my boots would come up through my throat. As soon as the captain could speak, between his convulsions, he cried out, Oh, doctor, I'm poisoned. Oh, dear, I never was so sick. Hold me, doctor, I cried. I'm boiling over. I've got the cholera. Cholera, said the captain. Is it cholera, doctor? Stop your noise, I say. You'll have everybody down here that's on deck. Here, take this, captain. And he gave him a spoonful of medicine and then gave me the same. And when he went out, he said, Now keep quiet, boys. Don't be alarmed. You'll feel better soon. Say, orderly, do you think this is cholera? Well, I don't know, Cap. I never felt so sick before. Oh, dear, what pain! And my stomach began to heave and cramp. And that started Cap off again. I believe it's cholera. We caught it at Calhoun. The hogs were all dying with it there. Say, Cap, do you suppose a man could catch hog cholera? Before Cap could answer, he began to heave, and just then the doctor came with some more medicine and gave each of us a big dose. Say, doctor, do you suppose we caught the cholera from those hogs at Calhoun? I asked. Shut up, you gosling. Keep off the deck and quit looking down on the water, and you'll be all right. Keep off the deck. I'm sure I saw the doctor smile. Seasick, I thought. And on the Cumberland. How poetic! and I soon dropped asleep from the effects of opiates I had taken, and I did not wake up till roused by the cannonading up the river. 
I jumped out of my bunk and began to dress as the doctor came in. Well, said the doctor, how do you like the effects of standing on deck and looking down at the water for two or three days? Don't do it again, just as we are expecting a battle. Say, Doc, can't you pump me full of wind or sausage or something? I feel as hollow and empty as a beer barrel. I'll give you more capsicum to stop up your mouth. The regiments of our brigade were landing, and I started to go when the doctor stopped me. Where are you going, Orderly? I'm going down to the company. You can't. You're not able. You can't make the march. Well, Doc, I'll try, and I can make it. I must go. If you're bound to try it, I'll fix you up a dose. So he poured some brandy in a glass, put in some water, quinine, and capsicum, stirred it up, and got it down, but t'was an awful dose. I got on the ground as soon as possible, and although I felt weak, I felt well. The captain stayed on the boat, got a furlough, and started for home on the first steamer. We soon had our tents and camp equipage unloaded from the boat and piled up, and as they were to be left there, it was necessary to detail someone to guard them. We had three sick boys that I knew could not make the march, and one of them was Jim. I called them up to the goods and told them what I wanted, and Jim refused to remain. He was taken sick at Calhoun and had been sick all the way on the steamer. No, no, said Jim. I will not stay. I'm going with the boys. Jim, you can't go. You're not able. It's impossible for you to make the march. Stay here and take care of yourself. Why won't you stay? Because if the company goes, I'm going. The surgeon was close by, and I called him. Say, Doc, I wish you would persuade Jim to stay here. He's been sick for several weeks. Jim, my dear fellow, you're unable to make that march through the rain and thick mud. Doctor, said Jim, and he spoke slowly and calmly. You can put me under arrest and court-martial me for disobeying orders, but if Company A goes, I'm going. Jim, I don't like to see you go. I wish you'd stay, but God bless you, my boy, and if you will go, let me give you a good stimulant. And he fixed him the same that he did me, only a larger dose. The transports reached the landing while I was asleep, sometime in the forenoon, I judge. The gunboats had passed on up the river, and perhaps it was noon or after when the Carondelet tossed the first shell into the rebel works. The deep and heavy roar of the first gun echoed over the hills of Tennessee and down the valley of the Cumberland. It awakened the rebel hosts and gave inspiration to the Union Army. End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Roar and Smoke of Battle. Chapter 14 As the brigade formed, our regiment took its place on the extreme left, which threw us in the rear. For a short distance, our road ran to the west, then mostly south and southwest. We were all heavily loaded, knapsack with two blankets, haversack, canteen, cartridge box with sixty rounds, and gun. It had rained almost incessantly for the last two days and nights, and the clay road was soon mixed into thin mortar by the column in front, deep enough to go over the army shoe, and frequently one would plunge into the thin mud to the knees. 
We soon crossed a swampy ravine, then climbed along a steep hill, cut out by the heavy rains down which ran a strong current of thin slush and muddy water, then a level swampy tract of mire, another steep hill, a creek to wade, another and another hill to climb, and swamp bottoms to wade through, with little variation, till we reached the south branch of the Fort Henry Road, some nine miles or more from the landing. About 3 p.m., we passed a cleared field and a log house, on our right near the road, and near the base of a large hill on our left. The log house was General Grant's headquarters, and over and beyond the bluff on our left, the fort. We concluded from the heavy artillery firing, and just over the bluff not very far, was a constant roar of musketry, proceeding probably from our forces charging the enemy's entrenchments. We reached our position two or three miles southwest of Dover about dusk in a blinding snowstorm. I think I never saw it snow harder in Indiana. We were nearly exhausted carrying our heavy loads through the rain and mud. We were all wet through and hungry. Our feet were wet and our pants covered nearly to the hips with mud. We had just halted when Jim gave out entirely and would have fallen full length through the ground had not the boys caught him. They found a place for him to sit down, wrapped a blanket around him, and called Surgeon Martin. "'Jim, my boy,' said the doctor, "'I was afraid of this. I should have compelled you to stay on the steamer. Can you swallow this brandy and water?' "'I'll try.' said Jim feebly. Jim, continued the surgeon, you've done your whole duty. You'll die here before tomorrow night if you stay. I can't take care of you. You must go back to the landing. Who will you have go with you? Alan Dave, he replied. And while the boys were getting ready, the doctor wrote, quote, Dear Dr. Vincent, I send you the bravest and best boy I ever knew, a hero. Be very sure that he has immediate care and the best you can give. Save him if you can. He's worth a dozen ordinary men. Yours in haste, W. W. Martin, Surgery 44, Indiana Regiment, unquote. And this note he folded and handed to the boys as they started to take Jim back to the Baltic. We stacked arms and made a hasty lunch of raw bacon and hardtack, as we were now near the enemy's picket line. It was impossible to build fires to make coffee or dry our clothing, so we stood around in small groups, silently eating our dry lunch while the damp, fast-falling snow was spreading a cold, wet mantle over us. We had scarcely finished eating when the adjutant ordered me to divide the company into two reliefs, the first to go on picket immediately, and the second to relieve the first at midnight. This was a hard problem, I felt that I understood their condition and realized how they must suffer throughout the night from fatigue, their damp clothing, and wet, cold feet. And when the company was formed, I said, Boys, count off and divide equally. The half that desires from now till twelve follow me, and the half that remains shall relieve at midnight. The left of the company followed promptly. The officer of the day took us full a hundred rods to the base of Bald Knob Mountain. When we deployed and formed our line, we were instructed to do no firing unless attacked by the enemy. At midnight, the right of the company came out and relieved all but me. Our second lieutenant was unable to go on duty. Hence, I remained with the second relief. The night was long and tedious, and 
will never be forgotten by the boys that were there. Some cut a few bushes, lay down, and got a little rest, but in the morning they were covered with six inches of snow. Others sat down, leaned against a tree, or stood on their feet. They could choose their accommodations. Sleep was impossible. On the last round made by the officer of the day, we went back with him, hungry, wet, sleepy, exhausted, and shivering with the cold. Then we ate our little lunch of hardtack and raw bacon, and when scarcely through, an order came for each company to cord their knapsacks by the side of the road, nearby, and detail two men to guard them. I detailed Wright and two others, as those three were completely exhausted and sick. Sometime during the day, Wright was sent to the hospital boat at the landing and died soon after. Our long roll was beaten, which made cold shivers run up the back. The company formed, roll was called, the second lieutenant took command, and I went to my place with my gun, and our regiment dropped in on the left of the brigade. The wood was full of soldiers as far back as we could see, on either side of the road and thousands of men in front. As soon as our brigade began to move, all the men in front very kindly gave us the right of way and did not seem to envy us at all, as we passed on by them along the south branch of the Fort Henry Road towards the front, where the incessant and heavy roar of musketry and artillery sounded like an approaching tornado. Our brigade had marched a half mile when the front began to climb a long, steep hill, and when about halfway up, shell came thick and fast from a rebel battery on our left, screaming and screeching like a thousand mad demons through the air close over the road. The boys ducked their heads and ran across the exposed place, which was about ten rods. When Company A reached that point, we not only ducked our heads, but humped over and ran as close to the ground as possible. I felt that every shell was aimed at me. Passing to the top of the hill, we soon met ambulances and wagons loaded with wounded. From one, blood was dripping through the box. Wounded men were straggling along the road to the rear, with bandaged arms and hands and legs and heads, faces covered and beards loaded with clotted blood, men carrying a bandaged broken arm and others using their guns for crutches and sticks for canes, while only at a short distance to the front and right was the roar and smoke and rush of battle. End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Battle of Donelson, Chapter 15 As you sail up the Cumberland and approach the bend, you will pass a high bluff on the right at the crest of which is a high embankment built of earth, running all around it with many angles. Near the foot of the bluff are two embankments, one above the other, called the water batteries. They are manned by seventeen heavy guns. Two of them are large and will throw an iron bolt weighing 128 pounds, while most of the others are 32 pounders. The guns can be turned downstream and their fire concentrated on a single gunboat. Now pass up the river one mile and you reach the landing in the little village of Dover clustered around the bend at the foot of the bluff. First is an open space or public square, 
some sixty rods along the river, and perhaps thirty rods back. To your right is a large amount of army supplies piled up, which covers nearly one-tenth of the open space. Crossing the square to the south, you enter the only main street, the Clarksville Road, which runs in a southerly direction. Follow this road, please, up and over the long hill to the ridge for nearly a half mile, and you reach the rebel outworks. A trench, at this point twelve feet wide and four deep, with all the dirt thrown outward, and at this crossing is their drawbridge. This big trench describes a circle outside of which is the abatis, a thick growth of timber fallen outward, with every limb cut off and sharpened to a needle point. The Clarksville Road continues along this ridge in a southerly direction and is quite an important factor during the battle. Now, from the drawbridge, cast your eye to the south, the southwest, west, and northwest, and if it was not for the intervening swamps, bluffs, and patches of timber, your eye would cover much of the battlefield. To the right is a deep gulch leading to the south, and beyond another high ridge running parallel, which commands the road and drawbridge. As the front of the brigade reached the Clarksville Highway, it filed to the right along the road, and when the rear passed this point, our whole brigade line was under the fire of the rebel skirmish line, only a short distance to our left and covered by a dense growth of underbrush. Company A had just made the turn when I heard a ball strike John, who was next behind me. I turned around, took his gun, and asked, Are you badly hurt, John? Yes, he said. The ball has gone plumb through me. He was leaning forward with his hands over his bowels, but never lost a step, unbuttoned his clothing, ran his hand around him, felt no wound, looked on his hand for blood, discovered none, and said, No, orderly, I ain't hurt. I'm just scared a little, that's all. Give me my gun. He was hurt, however. The ball struck him a quarter of an inch forward of the hip bone on the left side following around the abdomen, burning the skin and coming out on the opposite side from where it entered. Had a coal of fire or red-hot iron been drawn around quickly, it would have hurt no more nor left a more positive mark. Under this fire, the brigade must have moved one hundred rods or more. The balls flew thick, but they flew high. Some were wounded, but none seriously. The brigade came to a halt and left face in the open, where there was only a few scattering trees. Here I looked for Gunsmith, but did not see him. Perhaps he had been wounded or killed by the skirmish fire. The enemy was in heavy force down the slope in front, covered by a thick growth of oak grubs, loaded with last season's yellow leaves, the color of the Confederate butternut uniform. We had just reached our position and fronted the enemy when, instantaneously, a heavy volley of musketry struck us. Where I stood at our feet, farther to the left and especially to the right about the middle. A few were killed by this volley, and Captain Cuppy was fatally wounded. Our brave flag-bearer dropped the flag and ran to the rear. The adjutant and major rode around him and drove him back under their drawn swords. 
the firing then became general and during some little confusion in his company jack slipped out and we never saw him again for thirty minutes or more we loaded and fired as fast as possible it seemed to me much longer time moves slowly when engaged in a deadly conflict even five minutes is a long time to stand under fire in our left we had no support and our right was driven back our regiment stood alone for ten minutes the enemy was coming around us on our right and extending their line to flank us on our left and our only course was to fall back to save our regiment from capture in falling back through the woods company a went straight back to the rear we were alone and quite confused as to where or which way to go looking off to the right we saw a body of cavalry dressed in blue overcoats they beckoned us to halt and as we did so they spurred their horses up to within fifteen rods and fired we gave them one round emptied a few saddles and then we scud like a flock of quails for a thick undergrowth nearby in reaching our covert we found that orange had received a very bad wound through the shoulder and that john had been hit again a spent ball struck him in the fleshy part of the hip and was buried under the skin he pressed his finger by the ball and forced it out we then followed the ridge to the southwest and soon passed down the bluff near our field hospital where we left orange then crossing bloody brook we discovered our regiment on a high elevation in an open field and hastened to them and here our second lieutenant being sick and exhausted left us for the field hospital from all that we could see and learn up to this hour two fifteen p m the enemy had been successful in forcing our whole line from right to left and so encouraged were they that general pillow telegraphed nashville quote, on the honor of a soldier the day is ours unquote. so flushed with success the enemy resolved to capture a battery just beyond the gulf that commanded the clarksville road at the drawbridge from our elevated position the battery was in plain sight and we could distinctly see the rebel column march up the gulch step over the brook form under the shelter of the bluff face to the right and commence the perilous charge we saw them plainly as they climbed the steep long hill with confident and magnificent bearing up and up sure of success and from our point of view i trembled for the result only twenty or thirty rods more and the battery would be lost the infantry rolled a volley of balls at their heads and shoulders as they rose above the crest then every piece of artillery seemed to leap high in the air as they belched forth great volumes of fire and smoke and canister through the advancing column the officers tried to rally their men while the guns were being reloaded and got within four rods of the battery when a more destructive fire of canister tore through their depleted staggering ranks and hurled them to the bottom of the gulch where under shelter they reorganized their line rested a few minutes and charged up the hill again into the very jaws of death and met a concentrated fire of musketry and artillery that swept them back over the crimsoned snow down the hill to the brook below the survivors tarried only a moment and moved down the cove leaving their dead wounded and dying on the ground a grand simultaneous charge is ordered on the whole rebel line 
and at 3.30 p.m. we take our place on the extreme left of our brigade, move forward down the hill, cross Bloody Brook, file left at the base of the long ridge occupied by the heavy rebel force, to a point about halfway between the two extremes of an impenetrable swamp filled with water on the left. Here we halt in right face. I look over the position with some concern, look back and behind us, at the swamp full of water, six or eight feet deep, a hedgerow of bush too thick for a rabbit to get through, a good place to put a regiment of cowards, but my oh my to put us in here with only one way to get out, and that by the front. It's do our duty or die, or do our duty and die. We wait. All is still. Oh, this awful suspense, this inexpressible dread that makes the heart sick and the blood chill in every artery in vain. What are my thoughts at this time, you ask? The same as one going down in the water the last time. Home. Friends, all those I love best, of him who died for me. Never faith and hope in him, so precious as now. Dave stands in close touch on my right, his gun in his right hand. With his left, he is resting a portion of his weight on a hickory grub that stands between us. A single gun and a ball cuts off the grub close below his hand. He partially drops to his knees. A rebel yell, a flame of fire along the crest, and blinding smoke leaps down the hill. A crash and roar, a rain of balls around and over us that hiss and sing and ping and thoo like great swarms of bees. They mow the grubs in front and over our heads as a scythe, while the little limbs, leaves, and bark cover our faces. We hear a command, loud, plain, and clear. Fix bayonets! Charge bayonets! Forward! Fire! March! We fire and struggle slowly up the hill against a storm of balls and load and fire rapidly and low. We try to keep our line that we may not shoot one another as we push our way over and between the rocks, through the grubs and fallen brush and thick choking smoke that rolls down the bluff and fire low and fast till we reach the crest and rebel line when the bayonets come in play. We reach it, but we find only a long line of dead, dying and wounded. We step carefully around and over them, follow closely the flying enemy down along the Clarksville Road nearly to their drawbridge, where, as a bunch here to cross, the battery which they failed to capture throws grape and canister through their ranks and fills the road with dead. Had they held their guns down as we did, not one of us could have reached the crest. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. After the Battle, Chapter 16. It would be very presumptuous for one in the ranks to attempt a description of the Battle of Fort Donelson farther than he could see for himself, then more than likely few, if any others in the line, no matter where located would be able to identify it with what they saw. I have read carefully our colonel's report of our engagement in the forenoon and our charge up the bluff in the afternoon, 
I must say that it is very difficult for me to reconcile his description with mine. But this is not his fault, nor mine. He saw from one standpoint, and I from another. He sat on his horse while I was actively engaged in the ranks. I have only tried to tell in the easiest, briefest, plainest, and most natural way possible what was real to me. What I saw then, and what I can see now, whenever I close my eyes. We knew from the heavy artillery fire and constant roar and crash of musketry that the whole line from one extreme to the other was engaged in the charge, but the forest, thick undergrowth, and powder smoke confined our vision to a very narrow limit. After driving the enemy inside their earthworks, we returned to our position on the ridge about dusk and took a few minutes' rest. We were all well-nigh exhausted from the intense nervous strain all day, loss of sleep and lack of food. Such had been the excitement and rush that we had eaten nothing since the early morning and then only a little hard tack and raw bacon. During the middle of the day, the sun cut the snow in the most exposed places, but as night approached, the northwest wind commenced to blow hard, and the night became intensely cold. Our blankets, which we needed very much, were back a mile or so with our knapsacks, and we were compelled to put in the night without them. We had rested perhaps ten or fifteen minutes when an orderly handed me an order which I read to the boys. Quote, company A for picket duty, one half the company from seven to twelve, and the other half from twelve to five a.m., an officer with each relief, signed by A.D.J.T., unquote. Boys, I said, all that prefer the first relief take your place on my right, and all that prefer the second take your place on the left. This divided the company so equally that no change was made. I then took the first relief and followed the officer of the day. He deployed and stationed us about ten steps back from the Clarksville Road where the timber was quite thick and a large and thick grove of undergrowth, which was a partial shelter from the cold northwest wind. Our orders were to stand still, make no noise to draw a fire, and not fire unless absolutely necessary. I took my place about midway between the two extremes of the company, by a large white oak tree, on the west side of which, and reclining against it, was a Confederate soldier who that day had fought his last battle. He might have been placed in that position by some comrade on the west side that he might watch out the going down of the sun while his life was going out. He looked to be about forty years of age. I wondered if he had a home, a wife, and children, if he really at heart endorsed the Confederate cause. Where did he live? What was his history? Were they anxiously awaiting his return? Will he be missed? And I wondered, too, if I was missed at home. Did they think and speak of my birthday, the 15th of February? Oh, yes, no doubt. It was spoken of in the morning at the breakfast table at noon, and at the evening meal. I struck a match in the shadow of my tree, and it was just 9.45, the time for Mother to retire, and she was thinking of me while on her knees, as she promised. Did they know that the anniversary was celebrated here by the roar of artillery, the crash of musketry, and the shedding of blood? Not yet. Neither did they know how much I suffered from the cold, exhaustion, loss of sleep, and hunger, 
and I'm glad they did not. Minutes seem like hours. How slowly they passed on that winter night. Though so tired and suffering, my thoughts were busy, and I frequently called to mind May's last words, especially this, quote, And if it will light your burdens and give you courage to bear patiently your hardships, privations, and sufferings, please remember that I shall follow you with deepest interest and sympathy through all your campaigns and battles. And do not forget that every morning and night I shall pray our Father to bless and keep you safe that you may return to us." Unquote. But notwithstanding the warmth of these words, the most noble unselfish, patriotic girl, and the firm belief that I was not forgotten by any of my friends at home, I would have given all the kingdoms and crowns of the earth, had I possessed them, for one undisturbed night's rest and sleep in a good warm bed. I looked at my watch again. It was just ten o'clock, and then I saw a flash, another, and another, and three monstrous shells came screaming through the air from a rebel battery inside the earthworks. Scarcely had they exploded in the forest close by, tearing, splintering, and crushing the limbs and trunks of trees, when more shells started out on their mission of death and destruction. Our picket line was immediately scattered, and as there was no safety or security in any one place, we rushed from one point to another to avoid the bursting shell. From 10 o'clock p.m. of the 15th till 5.30 a.m. of the 16th, we were kept on the constant run and well warmed up with our violent exercise. As soon as the firing stopped, our regiment collected and formed in line a few steps west of the Clarksville Road where we could take a little rest and eat a lunch of hardtack and raw bacon. What next, we wondered. A charge on the enemy's works was suggested by many, and discussed quite fully as we stood there patiently waiting. At seven, the long roll, and a sudden chill. Then the regiment lined up and was all ready to move. Again, we wait for the order, Forward, march, charge. And while we wait, the heart is on double duty, pumping blood and throbbing with anxious expectancy. But hark, listen to the sharp ring and clatter of a horse's feet coming rapidly over the frozen road from towards Dover, and within ten rods of the right of Company A, the orderly takes off his hat, swings it in the air, and shouts out as clear as the notes of a bugle. The fort has surrendered. Hurrah! Hurrah! And goes on by us at a furious speed along the line, which takes it up and shouts, The fort has surrendered. Hurrah! Hurrah! As the cheering reaches the further end of the column, it sounds like a mighty wind threshing the forest. When too hoarse to shout, the boys take off their hats, throw them in the air. Some laugh and some laugh till they cry. Others shake hands and hug and kiss each other. When all through and sobered down, we were all warm and quite rested from the nervous strain and formed our regiment again. Soon, General Grant rode up from the rear and gave the order to our Colonel Fulbert. Our regiment, being on the extreme left, threw us in front, and we followed closely. When we got within twenty rods of the drawbridge, our company was ordered to halt, and men were detailed to remove the dead Confederates out of the road that were cut down yesterday. Many had been trampled upon and their clothing frozen to the ground. Passing the earthworks were hundreds of cartridge boxes and broken guns on either side of the road that had been thrown away by the Confederates in their haste to reach the river. 
And as we entered the little village of Dover, we found on the public square next the river, and in the streets from thirteen to fifteen thousand prisoners, a haggard, disappointed, worn-out, homesick crowd of men, all more to be pitied than blamed, for they had been sorely deceived by their leaders. They had not the least idea of losing a battle, much less being made prisoners of war. They had been told by their leaders that the Yankees were cowards, and that a regiment of southern soldiers could easily whip a brigade of northern mudsills. But here at Donaldson they met their equals, men that were brave as they, physically and intellectually their superiors, much more cool and could shoot better by half than they, with all their boasting. Their clothing was all colors and make. Some were dressed in blue, some in gray, but mostly in butternut yellow and dirty brown. Many had their blankets wrapped around them, made from old and new quilts, and others made from old and new carpets. Our first business was to gather and cord the guns, and as the 44th Indiana was the first to enter the village, men were detailed from it to do this work, and while it was being done, I walked down to the lower end of the square, where I found a young confederate, all alone, reclining on some baled hay. Well, Johnny, I said, you look lonesome here all alone. Are you sick? Yes, I'm sick, worn out and homesick. Well, that's a good deal for one fellow, as young as you. Is there anything I can do to help you? Yes, very much. Can you tell me what will be done with us? I can, and will most cheerfully. You will be sent north and put in comfortable barracks, the same as we occupied, and draw the same rations and have the same care if sick. And then tried for treason and hung or shot? I cannot help but smile at the boy's sincerity and ask the question, Who told you that falsehood? Our officers told us that before the battle. And they told you the Yanks were cowards, too. Yes, and that you would run the first volley. Well, you found that to be a lie, which they told you, and to make you fight, that if captured you would all be shot or hung. Yes, they repeatedly told us that. Well, that's the bigger lie of the two, for we sometimes run the same as you and we can't do better. Your officers are liars. I have told you the honest truth, have seen a great many prisoners in our camps, and know that they have the same fare and treatment of our own boys. So don't be alarmed. You will be used well. What have you in this bundle, please? Our regimental flag. Our flag bearer was killed, and I was ordered to take his place. Will you give it to me, please? Yes, most certainly. I have no more use for it. Thank you, my boy. Now, may I ask you one question and answer, if you desire? I noticed your speech is so different from all these prisoners that I have talked with that I'd almost take you to be one of us, a Yank, as they call us. Well, I'm more of a Yank than a South Carolinian my mother was from Massachusetts and a graduate from one of her best colleges. I owe all my culture to her through discipline. Well, my dear boy, you ought not to be in the rebel army. Your mother certainly did not advise you to enlist. Oh, no. She did all she could to save me, but it was enlist or hang on the end of a rope. And I chose the former, which is... I find, but little better. Well, my boy, you are out now, honorably, and when you get up north, take the oath of allegiance and remain there till the war is over. And if you should find no other way to get out, 
enlist in a union regiment, and then you will have a government and not a slaveholder's aristocracy to fight for. And should you conclude to do this, your mother will be proud of a son that will defend the old flag. I know she would be glad, for she loves her country and her flag, and I will think over seriously what you have said. I would rather die than go back in the Confederate service. Well, my boy, I believe you can find some way to keep out, and now I will bid you goodbye. Goodbye, he said as he shook my hand at parting. As I started back to the landing, I met our colonel and handed him the flag, and a little further on met my old friend Simmons. Well, John, I see you got through all right. Yes, three balls passed through my clothing in that charge, but none of them touched the skin. You were lucky. Many a brave man went down in that charge, but not so very many in our regiment on account of their wild and high shooting. I have wondered how so few were hit, for we were within less than twenty feet when they fired the last volley. But further to our right, it was a terrible bloody contest, and many were killed with the bayonet on both sides, I learn. Yes, I heard the same, and have talked with several that were further down the line, and they said it was too horrible to talk about. But they said they finally broke through the rebel line, and then the rebels went down the road like a drove of sheep. Any news from home, John? I have received two more letters from March since I saw you last, and I begin to think that you're right in calling them frauds. And here they are. You may have them. By the way, do you hear from me? Yes, John, I get usually two letters a week. And she says nothing about the matter? Nothing, John. Neither have I to her. I will keep these two letters, and if I live to get home, we will find out who is responsible for this forgery. I looked them over carefully and found them about the same as the preceding ones. The writing a good imitation, but the folding, stamping, and dictation not Marge's. I wrote across them, Forged and place them with the others. End of chapter 16。Chapter 17 of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. THE VICTORY CHAPTER 17 On the third day, up to 4 or 4.30 p.m., immediate victory for us seemed very doubtful. Encouraged by their success in the forenoon, their resistance became more desperate. After twelve midnight, our whole right, left, and center, which had suffered so severely in the forenoon, were reorganized, and when all ready, a grand and simultaneous charge was made on the whole length of the Confederate lines and breastworks, and by dusk they were forced to yield their strong positions. All through the night our brave boys held the ground they had so nobly won, while the rebel batteries located on elevations above them hurled down shells and grape through the forest, ravines and gorges, so that there was no place of safety within our lines. The branches of the trees were torn from their trunks by solid shot, and the trunks often splintered from top to bottom. While we were being chased from one position to another to find shelter from bursting shell, the Confederate officers met in council at General Floyd's headquarters. Nearly all the officers were there. They had won a victory in the forenoon, as they supposed, and lost it in the last grand charge, and that made them sad and downhearted. 
It was reported here now that we had nearly 15,000 prisoners, 65 pieces of artillery, some of them of the largest caliber, 18,000 small arms, and quite a large amount of army supplies. But all of this is small compared with the importance of the positions acquired. The loss of the Tennessee and the Cumberland Rivers to the Confederacy was one of the most serious things to overcome. It was made up of hills and bluffs, narrow valleys and deep gorges, and impenetrable swamps, with here and there commanding heights that bristled with cannon constantly throwing shot and shell among our men, wherever assembled. All these commanding positions of the enemy were carried by storm. On the last grand charge, our brave, hungry, and exhausted regiments swept up the long, steep hills over and between the rocks, through the thick undergrowth in the face of sheets of flame and amid tempests of balls. When gaps were made in their ascending ranks, they were closed up, and stepping carefully over the dead and wounded, they pushed resistlessly on, keeping their lines as best they could, and with bayonets on, firing carefully, low, and as fast as possible, till they reached the crest, and then, with a reserve load, hurled the enemy from their positions. From the early morning of the last day till dusk, it was a struggle for supremacy. The enemy knew that they must gain their victory that day, if at all. Our boys that were engaged in this struggle were mostly young, inexperienced, not inured to the hardships of war, and to most of them it was their first battle. Up to the night of the 14th it had rained for several days continuously, and on the night of the 14th the snow fell to the depth of six inches. The lines were changed so often back and forth that scarcely any of the troops could reach their knapsacks to get their blankets, and hence there was great suffering from cold, hunger, and loss of sleep. Not a single tent did I see erected to break that wind and storm, nor a single fire to make coffee and cook a meal. No rations reached us from the landing as was anticipated, and all we had was the few hardtack in our haversacks and a very small supply of bacon. Only a few of the wounded could be removed from the field while the battle lasted. Many were frozen to death that, no doubt, except for the enemy's shells, would have been saved. On the morning of the 16th, many of the wounded with frozen hands and feet, were carried to the hospitals, but faint and weak from loss of blood and a long night of untold suffering. They soon died. Very few survived. If all of these could only have written in full their sufferings for just that night, it would help us to estimate the cost of this slaveholder's rebellion. All that could be moved were taken to the landing and put on board the hospital steamer. Not only were our wounded to be provided for, but the thousands that were taken sick from exposure and exhaustion, they too must be taken care of. The killed and fatally wounded are but a small fraction of the fatalities of a battle. Then add to what I have mentioned the wounded and sick of the Confederate army and the 13,000 prisoners left on our hands. Oh, a battle is expensive. It devastates and destroys. Its costs cannot be estimated in dollars and cents, but in pain and anguish. 
in dying groans, in precious blood, and in heart-rending shrieks from men, torn and lacerated with shell and grape and canister. As one goes over this battlefield and sees the dead and thinks how they may have suffered, then the sufferings of the wounded and sick, and then stops to think that perhaps this is only one of four or five hundred battles that may be fought, he will be better prepared to arrive at this war's stupendous cost. The surrender of Donelson gave the rebel government their first hard blow. It was really the first and most important victory of the Union Army had gained. The northwest portion of the Confederacy had received a severe puncture. General Johnston was forced to evacuate Bowling Green, and it compelled the surrender of Columbus and Middle Tennessee. Nashville could not stand alone, and hence fell into our hands. On Sunday morning, the 16th, while we were throwing our hats and hugging each other, rejoicing over the victory, the rebels of Nashville were having a jolly time, too. Pillow's message of Saturday noon, of which I have spoken, set them wild with delight. The newspapers threw out their bulletins with a freedom unparalleled. Quote, the enemy retreating! Glorious result! Our boys following and peppering their rear! A complete victory! Unquote. Just as the devout people were fairly seated in the churches and the choirs rendering their first anthem, a horseman dashed through the main streets of Nashville shouting, quote, Fort Donaldson has surrendered and the Yanks are coming, unquote. A panic seized them. The churches were emptied and men, women, and children rushed from their houses into the streets they looked for the Yankees to pour in upon them and murder, pillage, and burn. Strong men trembled. Women were wringing their hands, and children found relief in tears. It was nearly noon when Floyd and Pillow arrived on a steamer, and General Floyd soothed them with a speech, declaring that the enemy had 40,000 and they only 10,000 effective men. How strange that we should have captured from thirteen to 15,000, and some two brigades made their escape. As General Johnston's army retreated from Bowling Green, they went right on through the city. The people expected they would stop and defend them and the capital of the state, but they did not. It was a wild night in Nashville, Two unfinished gunboats were set on fire and destroyed. Rebel storehouses were thrown open to the poor people, and the Zollicoffer Bridge, that cost $250,000, was cut down and ruined. This bridge belonged to the daughters of the late General Zollicoffer, who was killed by Colonel Fry at Mill Springs. The daughters begged and prayed them to spare the bridge, but all of no avail. The people were seized with a panic and demented with fear. The farmers in the surrounding country, for miles, were frightened and bunched their slaves and sent the poor creatures farther south. Such was the condition that billions of dollars' worth of property belonging to the Confederacy and people were destroyed, including all the army supplies which were stored there to be drawn upon as needed. This victory, so expensive in blood and suffering, thrilled the hearts of all loyal people at home and gave our sick, wounded, and discouraged soldiers new inspiration. The gunboats and transports came up the river to the landing with bands of martial music and flags and banners flying. 
the gunboats and field artillery fired a grand salute that made the hills and forests of rebeldom tremble and cheered the hearts of the sick wounded and dying at four thirty p m our regiment marched back to the woods where our knapsacks were quartered built some fires and made coffee the first since we left the baltic after coffee and supper we cut bushes and made our beds and as i lay down that night upon my bed of bushes i felt for the first time in my life that i had passed the limit of my endurance at or about midnight it commenced to rain and soon began to pour down this compelled us to get up and roll our blankets and put them in our knapsacks to keep them dry at two a m the rain was pouring down in torrents i called the roll formed the company took our place in the regiment and brigade and moved along the fort henry road to the west dover and fort henry are twelve long miles apart and the road winds around over and between the clay hills and we necessarily mixed mud every step occasionally a solitary clearing and farmhouse greeted the eye but most of the country over which we passed was wild hilly and worthless and bore but few marks of civilization our column halted once to snatch a lunch and take a few minutes rest then struggled on and on through rain and mud till we reached a point about a mile from the fort about two p m the next day after reaching here i went down to the fort with almond and saw the destruction made by the gunboats gun carriages were overturned and knocked to splinters wheels riddled and scattered all over the enclosure and the ground inside and out ploughed over with shell the rebel camp must have been a scene of chaos for everything that belonged to officers and men were left in hot haste cooking utensils and rations were scattered over the ground officers clothing mattresses looking-glasses and musical instruments were abandoned had the brigade reached the dover road in time they would have bagged the eight thousand rebel troops and reduced the defense at donelson since the battle we had a large sick list in the company the weather was against us as it rained nearly every day and we were compelled to drink surface water i was excused from duty the third day after reaching here and ordered to the hospital tent for treatment where i remained till the fourth of march all the time getting worse my tongue was full of large cracks dry as a husk and so sore that i could eat little late in the afternoon of the fourth of march uncle john charlie george and i were sent to the river in an ambulance in order to go on board the ohio a hospital boat which was the third from the landing it was dark and when passing from the second boat to the ohio on the engine decks i fell between the two vessels but caught my right arm around a post and hung while the water was rushing through close under my feet in mad fury a fireman chanced to see me and caught and pulled me in he saved my life in a few seconds more i should have gone down into the rapid current and been listed among the unknown dead we found the boat loaded down with sick many very sick all crowded together on the floors covering all the space we were the last ones on and very fortunately for us that we were able to walk around and care for ourselves soon after four p m the ohio left the landing and moved down the river we found a good place on the engine deck out of the way and made ourselves quite comfortable we had no idea where we were going and 
were much surprised to find ourselves at the landing at Evansville at seven in the morning on the 6th. Charlie and I were at the stern of the steamer and seeing our surgeon, Dr. Rarick, we called to him and he came aboard, helped us off and took us to the hotel where he was stopping. George and Uncle John were at the front and were taken immediately to the Marine Hospital, where George died in three or four days. On reaching the hotel, Dr. Rarick examined us quite thoroughly and said, Boys, you should be in the hospital in bed under treatment now. Your tongue and whole appearance indicate typhoid. I'll see what can be done. Every building in the city is full of sick and wounded, and many have been quartered in private houses. Stay here till I return. He was gone full two hours, and on his return said he could find no place, and we must stay at the hotel till something could be done for us. I was just able to walk around and could not keep still, so I went to one of the convalescent hospitals, only a few rods away on the same street, and found Lewis and several others of the boys who were brought from South Carlton and Calhoun. I found the boys doing well and would be ready for duty soon. Lewis told me that Jim was in the Marine Hospital, and as it was only a short distance, I walked over, and as I entered the room, he greeted me with a smile. I took him by the hand and said, Jim, I'm glad to find you alive, for I hardly expected to see you again. I have been very sick, Marion. I came near dying before, and I reached here, and my recovery is by no means certain. Well, you are better now, are you not? Oh, yes, much better. I have had the best of care here, and gaining now, they tell me, but it seems so slow, and I get so lonesome. Oh, if I can only get back to the company. Every man is needed so much, and I have been able to do so little. How much I thought of you and all the boys while the battle was going on. And at noon that day, when we heard you were all driven back and defeated, hope almost died. But when the news reached here of the surrender, I wanted to get up and shout and throw my hat as I heard you all did. I may never be able to return, Marion. I sometimes feel in fear that I will not. If I never return, will you tell the boys that I tried very hard to do my whole duty? Will you surely tell them, Marion? Yes, Jim. God bless you. I will tell them, but they all know it now. You almost gave your life in trying to do what many stout and well men failed to endure. As I looked at his pale face and sunken eyes, the tears came so fast I could hardly restrain them, but succeeded in saying, Jim, you must not talk any more. You are tiring yourself out. I must go now. You are sick too, Marion. You look very poorly. You tried to keep me on the steamer when you should have stayed there yourself. I'm not sorry, Marion, that I tried, though it may cost me my life. Are you really sick? No, Jim, just worn out and exhausted. I will be better soon with rest and sleep. As I took his hand at parting, he said in his feeble voice, Goodbye, Marion, and don't forget my message to the boys, and tell them whether I live or die, I have gained the victory. As I left the hospital, my face was moist with tears, and I said to myself, Yes, Jim, you have. There are few such as you, but those few shall wear crowns, and yours will be rich with jewels. I felt that I should never see Jim again in this world, and I never did. He, like more than half a million noble boys, laid down his life for his country, and his only regret was that he had done so little. I managed but I hardly know how, to reach the hotel. I was not sick, oh no, but just so tired and weak, and I couldn't sit or lie still long enough to rest. End of chapter 17
Chapter 18 of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Home on Sick Furlough. Chapter 18. At this time, no man in this state or any of the loyal states was more earnest and devoted to the Union and, quote, the interests of the soldiers than our own war governor, unquote, Oliver P. Morton. Anticipating the needs of the army, in the event of a battle at Donaldson, he gathered hospital supplies, ordered transports, secured all the nurses he could find, and doctors, that he could press into the service, and while the battle was raging, his boats reached the landing five miles below, and immediately after the surrender, moved up to Dover. He ordered that all the Indiana soldiers must be looked after, and removed to points where the very best hospital accommodations could be provided, and all able to travel, of the sick and wounded that could not be accommodated should be sent to their homes. Dr. Rarick had just returned as Charlie and I entered the hotel and said, quote, Boys, I have been through every hospital in the city and find them all full of sick and wounded. There is no place here for cases like yours that need immediate treatment and care. Under Governor Morton's order, you will start for home tomorrow morning at... 9.10 a.m. from the depot. I secured your tickets at government rates, and here they are. We handed him the money and thanked him for his kindness. Charlie and I occupied the same bed, and neither of us slept but little. I know I must have had considerable fever, for I dreamed of carrying heavy loads through the deep mud and climbing long high hills where the rocks were so thick and large that I could not reach the top. My sleep gave me no rest, and as soon as it became light, I was glad to leave my bed and go downstairs. The doctor went with us to the station and in parting said, Now, boys, you must get home as quickly as possible. You ought to be in bed now. Our train was long and loaded with sick and wounded soldiers. I sat in the seat with one of our brigade a few minutes, who received six wounds from the last volley as we reached the top of the bluff. Another of our brigade in our car received a ball through the upper part of the nose, passing through under the brain, coming out on the left side of the neck, and as he turned, in falling, another ball entered the other side of his neck and came out through his mouth. He lay at the top of the bluff, that freezing cold night of the 15th, till past midnight when he came to himself, partially. In a semi-conscious condition, he found the road and followed it down to Dover, where the enemy put him in a building with some other prisoners. His head was well bandaged, nothing of his face being visible but his eyes. He was in a fair way to recover from his wounds. I was too stupid to pay much attention to the passengers in our car, and when we changed at Indianapolis and Salem Crossing, I did it quite mechanically. I remember, however, that I was very anxious to get home where all would be quiet, then I could rest and sleep. I was not conscious of being sick, suffered no pain, but so very tired and could not rest. We reached our station at 9.12 a.m., strangers, without money. No one knew or noticed us, and we were too proud to beg, or even ask anyone to trust us for a ride home. We walked over the main streets of Kendallville, 
hoping to see a familiar face or even one that would ask us who we were and how far we had to go. But we found none and started off on foot along the road to Indian Lake. At noon, we began to stagger and faint and stopped at a farmhouse to rest. After asking some questions as to our company and regiment, they told us that they had two cousins in Company B, that one died at Calhoun and the other was home on sick furlough. They kindly invited us to eat with them, and then one of the family drove us on our road three or four miles. We reached the Corona Road and could go no farther, sat down on a fallen log and rested till William Hayward came along, when we climbed in his wagon and rode within four miles of my home. At ten o'clock the next morning I opened the door. Mother was ironing, and as I stepped over the threshold she heard me and sprang to my side, threw her arms around my neck and exclaimed, Oh, Marion, what a surprise! But you're sick. You look sick. No, Mother, I'm not sick, just tired to death. I want to lie down. Just fix my bed here where I can see you iron. I took off my shoes, coat, and vest, and before lying down I said, Mother, if I should be much sick, will you send for me? Yes, Marion, we will surely send for her whether you are much sick or not. As soon as I felt the bed and soft flannel blanket over me, I yielded to the inevitable. I was at home. Oh, how good it seemed. There would be no noise or confusion now. I could rest and sleep. But my head was hot and my temples began to throb with pain. My tongue was dry, coated and very sore, and my eyes refused to close. Mother fixed my pillow and bathed my face and head in cold water. Prentice sent for the doctor, and at the best he could not reach me till well toward night. My mind began to wander and created strange delusions, and from this time on I was delirious for many days, at times not knowing my own mother or brother, and would frequently call for them when they were at my bed. If I slept at all, it only exhausted me, for I was carrying heavy loads through the deep mud, or making that awful climb up the bluff, and as I would nearly reach the top, a heavy cloud of smoke and flame of fire would roll over and hurl me to the bottom. Then, too, I worried over an immeasurable loss of some kind, though quite indefinite, in which May was in some way involved. My head was full of fantastic hallucinations. Everything seemed to have its duplicate, even if I myself was double. If my head throbbed with pain, it was the other fellow, and not I. I was sufficiently conscious to know that some skillful nurse took my head from the pillow and showered it with cold water, and then wiped it dry with a smooth towel, pressed and rubbed my temples with a soft hand, and so gently done that the pain would leave me, and I would get a few minutes refreshing sleep. The doctor came in the evening and found me very delirious, much excited and hard to manage. He watched me closely for some time, then felt my pulse, took my temperature, and gave me a dose of medicine. He went into the next room and said to Prentice and Mother, quote, His fever is very high. I never saw a worse tongue. He ought to have been in bed more than two weeks ago. It is a complete physical breakdown. I wonder that he ever reached home. You must indulge him as far as prudent, and if possible, he must be kept quiet or he will soon wear out. 
All these delusions are real to him, and he is simply living over and over in an intense degree the exciting scenes and hardships and sufferings endured during the battle. He was not one to give up till he had passed his limit. Continue the water when his fever runs high. I will be in tomorrow. Unquote. For some time, the medicine was given every half hour, and the water was used as ordered. On the next morning, the fever was down, and I was quite sane. I knew that Mother was by me, and I asked, Mother, did you send for May? We did send for her, Marion. She's here. She has been bathing your head and gave you the last dose of medicine. Perhaps you did not recognize her. Oh, yes, but there are two May Gordons. This one is engaged to Arthur Prescott. Why, no, Marion, said Mother. Why do you think so? You will find a large package of letters in my inside coat pocket written by Marge that will explain all. Give them to her and send her home and bring my little girl May. She wore short dresses and her rich dark brown hair and two long braids down her back. It's the one, Mother, I used to play with when we were children. The one I always called my little girl. Oh, yes, said Mother. I remember her. I had forgotten that there were two Mays in the same family. It's all my mistake. I will send this one home at once and have the other one brought. Just be patient, Marion. It will not take long. I must have dropped off to sleep, for it seemed that a long time passed, before I roused up sufficiently to ask, Mother, did you send, and hasn't she come yet? For an answer, the door opened gently, and in glided my May. She kneeled down by my pillow, and pressed a kiss on my forehead, and I felt a tear fall on my face. For just a moment she could not speak. Marion, and her voice trembled some, I told you I'd come. I'm here now, and I'll stay till you get well. Won't you try to sleep and rest? Won't you try to get well? Put down your head, May. I ran my hand down over the long braids that hung down her back. Yes, I said. Let me see your eyes, May. The same dark blue, and when you laugh, they're black. This is the little girl that followed me down to the gate and said so shyly, I came here to bid you goodbye, for I'll not be here when you call again. Is it the same little girl, May? Yes, the same, the very same, Marian. And you'll not take wings and fly away and leave me? No, Marian, I'll stay until you get well. Then, if you stay here, I'll live and get well. Never fear. Then she put two fingers on my lips and said, No more talking. Now you must go to sleep and rest. Delicious tyranny, I said, but made no more effort to talk. As she got up to get my medicine, I noticed she was in short dress, and then I closed my eyes and was satisfied. She gave me my medicine, bathed my head in cold water, used a soft towel, and then, with her hands, rubbed my forehead and temples till I fell asleep. There must have been something very potent in those soft hands, for I slept nearly all night and was only conscious when someone gave me medicine and occasionally a spoonful of nourishment. I did not hear any rebel guns nor climbed the bluff. The doctor came about 9 a.m. the third day and brought counsel and assured me he was a union man and asked if he should bring him in. Oh, yes, I said, if he's loyal, but I want no rebels here while I'm sick. They both sat down by my bed and asked some questions as to the location of pain, looked at my tongue and took my temperature. They then passed into the next room and talked over my case, and asked Mother many questions. After dealing out the medicine, my doctor sat down by my bed, and after watching me closely, said, Marion, you can help me in your treatment. 
Keep your mind, if possible, off from everything exciting. Don't worry or fret. Try to sleep and rest all you can. Will you try? Yes, doctor, I will try. But in a few hours, my fever rose very rapidly, and I became almost unmanageable. I rose up in the bed and declared that Prescott should not marry my wife. I would protest at the very altar. That May Gordon would never consent, and he must not coerce her into such an alliance. Exhausted, I lay down, and May placed her hands on my hot forehead, commenced to rub my temples. Then the pitcher of water was brought, and she showered my head till the throbbing seized, and while pressing and rubbing my head and temples with her hands, she told me in her low, musical voice that Marge never wrote those letters. They were all forged, and May will never marry Prescott. She has told him she could not, and putting her hand in her pocket, she took out the letters and showed them to me one by one, how I had endorsed them with pen and ink as being all forgery. Do you remember, Marion, telling May at the gate long ago that you'd never forget your little girl, and that you, on another time, long time after, asked her to promise you that she would make no engagement without letting you know? May has kept that promise and will never violate it. And thus she talked on and on in her way, in her naturally musical voice, till the pain left my head and I fell into luxurious sleep, and my last conscious thought was that God's best angel was hovering over me. End of chapter 18Chapter 19 of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. At Home Chapter 19 From this time on for nearly thirty days, I took little note of time. The doctor came to see me every day, and the neighbors were very good and kind. Sometimes my fever would run very high, and my head would be full of fanciful delusions. I was wading through the deep mud, carrying heavy loads, climbing long steep hills, or fretting or worrying over May's engagement. I spoke to the May that was present, kindly, but denounced her duplicate and false. These delirious spells were made brief by someone who gently showered my head in water and rubbed my temples till I'd dropped to sleep. At last the fever left me and the crisis came. It was then a question of vitality. Could I rally? All was still inside the house and out. No one from outside was admitted except the doctor. Mother... May and Prentice were my watchers and nurses. I lay for days in a dead calm, in perfect painless rest, and wholly indifferent to recovery. There was no response to food or stimulants. I felt that to live required an effort and that I had no incentive. During my delirium, the false statements in those letters were, to me, a reality. The delirium had gone, but the delusion remained. As I did not refer to them after my fever left me, May and the rest of the family had no idea that I believed them. May's labor of love for me, I supposed, was actuated by gratitude. I felt then I could not live if she left me, and I could not wound her by protesting against her engagement. So, with my brain fogged with that delusion, I barely existed. I did not live. The days passed, and there was no improvement. One day, Mother and May were both in my room. Mother looked sad and worn and pale, and May's eyes showed plainly that she had been weeping. 
the doctor entered very quietly into my room and sat down by my bed he looked at me a long time before asking any questions mother told him that i had no pain and slept well and seemed to rest but that they had to force me to eat and take stimulants then he spoke to may and she followed him into the next room may do you notice there has been no improvement in our patient since his fever left him we know it said may it's killing his mother prentice and and me i have done all i can with medicine there's no disease now he'll simply lie there and die unless we can rouse him i cannot keep him alive many days have you those letters may that he referred to so often yes here they are i have kept them in my pocket read them doctor he sketched the material portion through and then turned to me and said i ought to have read these letters before i see the trouble now you remember his delusion may what he said when he was delirious oh yes i remember well "'Twas this. Oh, May, how could you engage yourself to Arthur and not let me know? Then i get the letters and show him his own writing on the back, and he'd read it and smile and say, "'Oh, yes, I'd forgotten, or I remember now, but in a short time the same delusion would return. Then I'd say, "'Marion, I'm not engaged to Arthur.' These letters are forged. My sister never wrote them. She told me so. Then he'd make the same reply. Oh, yes, May, I'd forgotten. And so hour after hour, while his fever was high, I would work with him. But when his fever left him, as he did not repeat it, I suppose the delusion had left him entirely. May, you know that he loves you better than his own life, and... If your heart responds to his love, you only can make him live. Oh, tell me what I can do, doctor. I would willingly die to save him. The letters and his own words convince me that I am correct. You see, May, when he made those endorsements on the back of the letters, he was sane, and it shows that he had perfect confidence in you. But when the fever came on, the statements in those letters induced the delusion. And when his fever left him, the delusion remained. And with him, it is a reality. And only you can break the spell and make him live. Tell me what to do, doctor. My heart is full and almost breaking. I will go in with you and ask the mother to step out. I will give him a strong stimulant and have a short talk with him. And when I step out, do just what your heart prompts. Don't be afraid if you love him to tell him so plainly. Let him know that if he makes no effort to live, he will destroy your happiness and don't smother your feelings. I will be in the next room and wait and watch the results. As the doctor and May entered, the doctor administered the stimulant and then said, Marion, don't you know that it is wicked? Suicide for you to lie here and die? You can get well. There's no disease now. It all depends on you. Will you not make the effort? May is here and will give you the incentive. Don't answer me, please. Save your strength. You can and must live. The doctor had scarcely closed the door when May sprang to the bed, dropped on her knees, and sobbed as though her heart would break. Her whole frame shook with emotion, and she was bathing my face with her tears. I succeeded in getting my right hand out from under the blanket, and placed it on her head, and mustered strength to say, 
Don't, May. Oh, don't cry so. You frighten me. What can I do? I would rather that every tear was a drop of my own blood than have you suffer. She made several attempts before she could speak, and then said, Oh, Marion, don't you know that I love you more than my own life, that I would die for you if that would make you live? Why will you lie here and die when the doctor says you can live and get well? Oh, Marion, why will you break my heart and destroy my happiness? And her tears were flowing like rain down her face and over mine. The spell that bound me was breaking away. The delusion was gone, and hope revived. Don't, May, don't cry so. I can't bear to see you suffer. Tell me what to do. Live for me, your mother and Prentice. Does it matter so much to you, May? Yes, it does matter. I shall never know another hour of happiness. It would kill me. It would kill me. But your engagement, Arthur, how can you? Oh, Marion, I'm not engaged to Arthur. You cannot believe that. Those letters. I got those letters from your pocket, and when I saw that you had written across them these words, all forged, I didn't suppose you'd believe them after your fever left you. Let me see them, May. Yes, that's my writing, all forged. May? Yes, Marge never, never wrote them. She has told me so. Then, May, you're not engaged to Arthur? Oh, Marion, no. How could you think so, and I not tell you, the best friend I ever had, save my own dear mother? Then you do not love him, May? No, Marion, I had to tell him that I could not love him, that my heart and all I had to give was given to another, unasked. I pitied him and honor him, but I can never love him. I was very, very sorry for him and told him so. You say, May, that you had given your heart to another unasked? To whom, May? Oh, must I tell you again, Marion? Yes, May, I must hear it again from your own lips. It will give me an incentive to live for you, and that means life for me. Then I'll tell you again, Marion, but you must listen and keep still, not a question or a word. It is you, you, Marion. Oh, so long since I was a child. I thought you knew, had read it in my face. No, you must keep still and listen. I was in the arbor when you had that talk with father. I remember every word you said. I thought I loved you before, but then I resolved to fill the measure you made for me. I have studied, toiled and worked and tried so hard to grow into such a girl and woman as you would love and honor. And you, Marion, have been my inspiration. Won't you try to live for me since you compel this confession and since I worked so hard to win you? Yes, May, I'll live now. Your words would put life in me if I were a mummy. All those letters, Marion, were forged by Arthur's sister. He knew nothing of it. He would have scorned so mean an act. I can't tell you how grateful I was after I'd read those letters to find your endorsement on the back. Your faith in me increased my love more than I can tell, for they were a very clever imitation. Marion, you have been very blind, or you would have known that I loved you from a little girl ever since you saved my life. But it is too bad, though, since I have worked so hard and so long to win you that you compelled this confession. 
but I'm glad and happy over the result. Well, May, I guess I'm glad and happy too. My heart's at rest now, and I'll get well, never fear. If I had been twice dead, your words would have put new life in me. Not another word, Marion. You must rest and have some nourishment. No, no, no more talk from you. The doctor has given me absolute power, and you must obey. I slept like a child all night. A few times I was awakened and given a little stimulant and food. The sun was shining through the window when I woke. I heard the spring birds. They had gathered near my window to give me a serenade. Their music was enchanting. Then I heard a ringing laugh. That's May, I said. The first laugh I've heard from her since she came. Tis richer, sweeter, and more assuring than the music of the birds. My heart was full of gratitude, and I said to myself, God bless May Gordon. Soon, Mother, Prentice, and his wife and May came in. I greeted them with a smile. How bright and encouraged they looked. What a difference in their appearance in so short a time. How stupid in me to relax all effort to live, I thought, when to live gives others so much joy and happiness. End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Convalescing Chapter Twenty May was my constant companion and nurse now. I watched her with keen interest as she tripped in and out of my room, but, oh, how imperative in her orders! A real autocrat she was. I called her a little tyrant. No talking, Marion, she'd say. Absolute rest and quiet. The windows were let down from the top, and the soft spring air floated into the room. I filled my lungs to the utmost that I might get more and richer blood. It was nearly 5 p.m. May had just brought me in a small bowl of broth and crackers, and while I was eating, the doctor slipped in the room unobserved for several minutes until he spoke. "'Well, well, I declare,' said the doctor. "'I never saw such a change in so short a time. "'The last tonic I administered did wonders for you, my boy. "'You should be grateful to me all your life.' "'Oh, I'll be grateful to you, doctor, for your kindness and skill. "'But as to that last tonic you gave me, you are all at sea. "'It was too thin.' too thin. I would have died on such dope as that. Yes, I know. You tried to die and were so determined that I became alarmed. I was afraid it would ruin my practice, so I called in our little friend here. Yours was a heart trouble I couldn't control with my remedies, and your delusions stuck to you like grim death." Yes, doctor, those delusions seemed very real to me, and even now they do. Oh, how tired I get wading through the thick mud, carrying heavy loads and climbing the bluff. And then the roar of musketry so near and the thick choking smoke and the hot flash of the rebel guns almost in our faces seem to go through my head and make me wild with pain. It was your fever, Marion. You were burning up with fever when you reached home. Your system was th so thoroughly charged with malaria, and you were so completely worn out and exhausted that your recovery was quite a doubtful problem to me for many days. 
but now if you are careful you'll get out of this bed soon doctor i said i want the best tonics you've got something that will give me strength the doctor smiled and dealt out more medicine and gave may strict directions as to my diet be careful he said that he don't overeat now and keep out callers i see he is inclined to talk too much don't admit anyone at present then he turned to me and said marion i want you to keep quiet and obey orders if you fail to obey your nurse here i'll give you the bitterest dose you ever took the days and nights pass by in luxurious sleep and pleasant dreams and hope grew strong every day i would note some little gain in strength i'd use my arms and limbs all i could in bed for they seemed almost useless the doctor missed one day and as he came in was much pleased with my appearance well doctor it seems good to see you again and i'm really glad to see you're here i wish to suggest a more tolerant administration i have always lived in a republic and generally had my own way but now i find myself a subject of a despotic government my little autocrat here will let me speak only when i say please and then only a few words don't think sir that i shall make any change you are doing so well now that in a few days i shall turn the case over to may entirely and you mind and obey orders no mutiny here sir my orders are no company no excitement no war talks very little talking even with your own attendants absolute rest quiet and sleep nourishing food and fresh air may can read to you something light a few minutes at a time but mind you nothing of the war so i yielded gracefully to the discipline and may read to me short light sketches in poetry which broke the monotony and kept me from talking her voice was soft and musical and would frequently put me to sleep one day after i had gained considerable strength i said miss autocrat will your highness please let me say just a few words and i will promise to stop when i feel the least bit tired yes my lord if you will not tire yourself and let me do most of the talking will you forgive me may i see now that i doubted the promise you made me i did not when sane but i had read those letters over and over and knew them all by heart and while i did not believe the statement as to your engagement as you already know yet it did worry me for i couldn't understand who could or would do such a mean thing my fevered brain did not reason after your fever left you marion you never alluded to the letters oh why did you not ask me feeling so certain that you were engaged to arthur i could not muster the strength to mention the subject to you it was a real fact to me remember oh marion i thought you knew how strange i tried so hard to hide my love but the day you met me at mr prescott's i was off my guard it was a surprise to me and i thought you saw my love so plainly that you concluded best not to see me again before you went away i feared that was the reason and spent some sleepless nights but you said you would explain if you ever reached home and i trusted you and waited i'll tell you now may you were young and i was afraid that perhaps your gratitude might influence you then 
It was your love, May, and not gratitude, that my heart demanded, and, too, my life was uncertain, and I felt it would be wrong to tie you. Tie me, Marion. You tied me when I was a child with a cord I never could have broken when you saved my life and almost lost your own. Oh, I was but a child then, but I remember how I laid awake nights and cried and prayed as a child can pray that if you died, I might die too and be buried by your side. It was a child's love then, as I grew up, I loved you as a girl, and now, Marion, I love you as a woman. Now you'll be good and try to live, won't you? Yes, May. God helping me, I'll live, and if he spares me till this cruel war is over, I'll dedicate my life to you, and now to him who has given you to me. I never told you, May, that when I took that risk to save your life, that it seemed to me you were clinging around my heart, and though boy as I was, I felt that in some way I didn't understand then, that you were a part of my destiny. And you remember how I called you my little girl from that time on. Oh, yes, and I remember how I liked that name, even when I was a big girl. And now, Marion, as we dedicate our lives to each other, let us also dedicate ourselves and all we have and are to him, who has so richly blessed us. It was not necessary to talk more. We understood each other. May indicated that I must rest. She brought me some quail broth, a little milk, a little tender meat of the quail, and I ate all she would let me, and then she sat down and read to me till I fell asleep. When I awoke in the morning, the sun was shining in my window, and I heard another clear musical laugh such as only can be indulged in when the heart is free and happy. And soon May came quietly in and asked, How's my invalid this morning? Hungry as a bear. What will your lordship have? Tell Prentice to kill a fat ox. I must have more than toast, crackers, and broth, and I'm going to sit up today, so get the big rocker ready. One morning, a week or so later, as I was resting in my big rocking chair, May came in from the field. Her face flushed and beautiful, with her hands full of wild flowers, and held them up before me. See, Marion, aren't they beautiful? She noticed soon that I was looking at her and not the flowers. Here, Marion, look at these. I'm not a posy. Yes, May, more lovely to me than even the Garden of Eden. Why, Marion, she said, blushing, don't you recollect that I told you once that it was very wicked to flatter? Yes, but it's not wicked to tell the truth. Oh, how naughty you are. If you don't behave better, I'll take you out riding Saturday. Oh, but you'll take me out tomorrow. I said. I'm afraid not. We'll see. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. RECOVERY AND RETURN TO DUTY CHAPTER Twenty One. The whole family were consulted and finally gave their consent, and at eight o'clock a.m. we started on our ride. Well, May, this bracing spring air and you are doing me good, I said, after riding a half mile, 
You must do the driving, singing, and laughing, and I'll do the talking. That morning after you all thought me better, I heard you laugh in the dining room, and it fairly made my nerves tingle. Well, Marion, there was no laughing in your home for many weeks. The last few days before the change, we were in the very depths of despair. I am sure your mother spent most of several nights on her knees, and I tried to pray but could only sob and weep. The desire of your heart was answered, May. How stupid of me to harbor that delusion. No, Marion, I'm the one that was stupid and all to blame. When the doctor, in a few words, made it so plain, I saw it clearly, and I am thankful that it was not altogether too late. Could you have detected that forgery, May? No, I could not. I have Marge's writing at the house, and I have compared them several times, and I'm not able to comprehend how you detected the fraud so quickly. In the first place, May, to help me, I had confidence in you. The writing was so perfect in its imitation that I could hardly detect any difference. I had received two letters from Marge. The difference was more in the folding and placing the stamps. I knew Marge was very methodical. She had just one way to do a thing, and that is always the best way. There was also a decided difference in the method of expression. This I caught at a glance, but when I read the paragraph in the first letter which said, I have tried to get May to write Marion and tell him of her engagement, but she seems perfectly indifferent, I confess I was staggered. Only my faith in you may cause me to make that endorsement on that first letter. I knew Marge was truthful and would not make that statement unless actually true. I knew Arthur to be a noble young man and soon to come into possession of a nice property, and I knew, too, that ever so much wealth would have no influence over my little girl. Altogether, I was in a serious muddle. It worried me a good deal, May, though I did not believe it. You know, I never mentioned it in my letters. And that seems so strange to me. How quickly I could have relieved your mind and saved you that worry, at least. I thought of that, May, and then I thought that to write you would almost be an acknowledgment that I believed it, and I just said to myself, no, my little girl never deceived me, and she never will. I know I can trust her. You know now, Marion, that I had no heart to give him. I had to tell him so before he would yield the suit, but it was with tears in my eyes and sorrow in my heart. I treated him with such delicate and kindly consideration that he said that he would respect and honor me as long as he lived. His sister was the author of those letters, while she at the same time was pretending to be such a warm friend of mine. I don't know yet how she managed to get John's letters when they were addressed to Marge, for she never received a single letter from him and never wrote him. This ride did me so much good that we rode out every day when Pleasant's I gained rapidly in flesh and strength and had no need of a doctor in medicine. Fresh air, exercise, and nutritious food was all I needed. May was my constant companion in all my rides and walks, and we enjoyed to the fullest extent the last of the May days as they passed so rapidly by. On the 1st of June, I took May to her home. She had been with us since the evening of the day I reached home. As she got ready to leave the house, Mother said to her, I shall miss you, May. It will be lonesome here, 
you seem very near to me. May I love you as a daughter? Oh, I'm so glad if you can love me, said May. You remember I lost my mother when a child, and I have often felt the need of one so much. And as she gave her parting kiss, she said, Goodbye, mother. During my sickness and delirium, the Battle of Shiloh was fought. But as the doctor insisted that all war news should be kept from me, I knew but very little of the battle until I was able to ride out. Our regiment was engaged two days, the 6th and 7th of April, and our loss in killed and wounded was very heavy. Lewis received a bad wound in the hand and reached home about the 14th. Soon fever set in, and he, too, was in a critical condition. His sickness was kept from me till I was able to be around. After May left me and Lewis and I were able to leave home, we drove over the county and visited all the boys that were home on furlough and had gotten within four miles of Jim's home when we learned that he was dead and buried. He was brought home from the Marine Hospital while I was sick. He was taken down again with fever and lived only a few weeks. I now had only about thirty days to recruit my strength, and it was quite necessary to toughen myself and develop all the muscle possible, for I knew there were many hardships yet for me. So I walked or rode in the saddle every day when not actually needed at home. Strange as it may seem, I was anxious to get back to the company. I felt that I was needed and that it was my duty to return as soon as I could safely do so. I will not tire the reader with an extended account of my home leaving this time. My folks and the doctor were afraid I had not sufficiently recovered my strength to endure the service, but I assured them that I would try and be more careful. I had called on May often since she left us, and the last day but one before I started back, I gave her the whole day. As I was about to bid her goodbye, she placed both her hands in mine and said, Nothing can come between us now, Marion. No, May, nothing but death, and that can separate us but a short time. Then she added, whether you live to return or fall in battle or die in hospital, you're mine, and I feel that I shall have a right to carry your image in my heart every day while I live. And the knowledge that I love you and that we all love you and are praying for you may compel you to live when to die would seem gain to you. Mother was cheerful and hopeful. And when she said goodbye, there was hardly a tremor in her voice. Mother, I said, I shall carry the little Bible you gave me, and if I should never return, remember that your last message will be found within that book in my pocket. I left home at 8 a.m. on the 9th of July, and parted with Prentice at the station from which Charlie and I started home on foot burning up with fever and more or less delirious. I reached Indianapolis at 5 a.m. on the 10th and reported immediately at the adjutant general's office, where a squad of 15 convalescents were put in my charge with orders to report at Louisville, Kentucky, which place we reached at 2 a.m. on the 11th with our train quite heavily loaded with returning soldiers. On reaching the depot at such an early hour, we quartered ourselves in and around the building on bales of cotton and soon dropped to sleep. Soon a large police force came in and drove us out. We then went into some empty cars on a side track off some distance and locked the doors. The police followed us and again ordered us out. 
We asked them kindly to excuse us and told them that we had concluded to stay. They still persisted with threats of arrest. Then two or three very wicked boys in our squad finally ordered them to go to... I didn't put down the name of the place in my diary for a good many people choose to go there every year and it might give offense. No doubt most of those police were on their way too, for they left us and we secured a few hours rest and a little sleep. End of chapter 21「Chapter Twenty Two of My Story of the Civil War in the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gorillas, Chapter Twenty Two. Our train, loaded with soldiers returning to their respective regiments, left Louisville for Nashville at 8 a.m. on the 12th of the month, and ran 20 miles without interruption to Union Junction, a station only. Surrounding this station was an old cleared field which had been abandoned for many years and had grown up to a dense growth of blackberry bushes, and while the conductor and operator were busy receiving and sending out dispatches, all our boys left the cars and busied themselves picking and eating this fruit. This was a lucky hit for us. The berries were dead ripe and the largest and sweetest I ever tasted." The rumor was quite current among the boys that John Morgan was approaching Louisville with a heavy force of cavalry, and that all the troops congregated there would be held for the protection of the city, which had given the boys such a cool and unfriendly reception the night before. None were anxious to be held here to protect rebels and their property." Our train left the junction about dusk and ran back to the Louisville Arsenal, where we were all armed with Belgian rifles. We had very few commissioned officers with us, and I was ordered to take command of all the men in our car. It was about 9.30 p.m. when the train moved out of the station and went back on the same road to the junction. I had had very little sleep since leaving home, and, being tired, I lay down on a bench and soon dropped asleep. I was enjoying pleasant dreams when suddenly awakened by a heavy volley of musketry. The train, I found, had been stopped in a deep cut. All the soldiers in the front cars had been ordered out and were engaged with a bloodthirsty gang of guerrillas nearby who made it their business to tear up railroad tracks, burn bridges, kill and torture men with Union sentiments, and prey on small bodies of our troops. They never took a prisoner, nor showed any mercy to their victims. Soon, as we heard the volley, we threw back the door of our cattle car, and leaping to the ground with our Belgians ready loaded, went back to the end of the cut and formed our company. We climbed up the steep hill on the left of the train, then marched over on the other side across the bridge, spanning the cut, till we reached the rear of the battalion that was then engaged, then filed to the left and took our position as ordered on the left. It was quite dark. We could see nothing in front but a line of fire, and could keep our own positions only by observing the sheet of flames on our right. It was no easy job for me to keep our boys in line. They were so eager to finish the disagreeable job as soon as possible. It is difficult to hold men to a fixed line in a skirmish, even in daylight but much more difficult in the dark. I was more afraid the boys would shoot one another 
than I was of the enemy's guns, for I soon perceived that they were shooting high. I walked along the rear of the line and told the boys to be sure and hold down their guns and shoot low, and while I was trying to keep the line, one fellow sprang out of ranks and started for the rear. Halt, I said. Oh, I'm wounded, sir. I feel the blood. Where? I asked and I put my hand where he indicated and could feel the warm blood. Go to the train, I said, and bandage it. It's only a flesh wound. I perceived in a few minutes we were moving forward. Every time a man would load and fire, he would take a step or two forward, and some were so much more eager than others that I found to keep forty or fifty men in line during a skirmish on a dark night was all the business I wanted without using my own Belgian. As we advanced, the enemy seemed to fall back, and when we reached the farther side of the field, about sixty rods from where we started, the enemy ceased firing. The captain, commanding, then ordered us to hurry back to the train fearing that the enemy might cut us off. On entering our car, I discovered our wounded boy reclining on a bench looking quite pale from loss of blood. Well, my boy, I asked, are you much hurt? Not seriously. I've lost quite a bit of blood and feel a little faint. Just then the surgeon came in and made an examination. The ball had passed through the coat, vest, and shirt, and cut a gash about three inches long through the flesh, just below the nipple. "'Well, my boy,' said the surgeon, "'a miss is as good as a mile, but that was a close call. Had you stood square to the front, that shot would have finished you.' The doctor closed the wound with three strips of adhesive plaster then put a strong bandage around his chest and advised him to keep still. As near as I could learn, eight or ten of our men were wounded, but none of them seriously, and I could not find that any were killed. A battle in the dark is for some reason a dread to me. I'm willing that anyone may have all the fun and adventure, if they will excuse me. When all the wounded were cared for, it was just one o'clock a.m. Then an order came for me to select five men from our car and precede the train on the track through a dense woods for three or four miles. This was no doubt to prevent an ambush. A very good idea for those on the train, but it was a little like taking the cat's paw to poke chestnuts out from a pile of hot coals. I asked for five volunteers, and if I had accepted them, I could have had all in the car except our wounded boy. We started on, and when we reached the timber, it was intensely dark and continued so until we reached the open country. Then we halted till the train caught up, and then climbed in. The train ran back to the junction took on some more soldiers, and started back. Just before reaching the little village of New Albany, while looking out the window, I lost my hat, and as the train came to a full stop in the village, I jumped off, went into a store, and while fitting myself with a new hat, the train started on and left me in a thoroughly rebel country. I could see at once that they were by no means friendly, but I was well armed. I had a good six-shooter in my belt and my Belgian loaded with bayonet on. I sat down close to a store building on the main street, where none could get behind me, and kept a close watch of all in front. I could hear them occasionally speak contemptuously of the Yanks, that were invading their state, and of Lincoln as a tyrant and usurper. When spoken to, I answered them courteously and paid no attention to their treasonable utterances. 
About three o'clock p.m. the train came back from the scene of the night's skirmish. They found the guerrillas' camp abandoned and several dead horses, and brought back one bushwhacker that was mortally wounded and left on the field. He was a citizen of this same village, and four of our boys took a stretcher and carried him to his own home. Our train ran back to Louisville, where we marched to the barracks, got our dinner, and then marched through the southern part of the city to Preston's Grove, about two miles east of the depot. Here, in this beautiful grove, we went into camp about 1,000 soldiers, if one can call it camping. We had no tents, no blankets, no cooking utensils. The days were hot, but the nights were damp to lie on the ground. Our meals were easily and quickly gotten. A piece of bacon stuck on a stick held over the fire, till well toasted. A ten cup of coffee and hardtack was all we wanted, as it was all we could get. I did not feel all alone, for Tom of our company was with me, and I selected a tree with a thick, heavy top to lie under to protect ourselves from the heavy dew. Close by us every night, two Irish Catholics bunked, and toward morning their legs would cramp, and then they would jump up and dance around and swear that the witches and devil had gotten into their legs. I tried to tell them that it was the damp ground and damp air that caused the cramp, but they knew it was the devil. I was glad I was not the priest that had to pardon their sin of profanity, for in that they were proficient. Tom and I would usually get up at four o'clock and walk around and get warm, for neither of us were dressed for lying on the bare ground. Today, the 16th of July, I wrote three letters, but said nothing to my friends as to our camp accommodations, for I knew they would only worry, for fear I would get sick again. On the 17th, we moved our quarters from Preston's Woods to the old fairground buildings, where we were under shelter from rain and dew, and could sleep on a floor, which is a real luxury for a soldier. We also had a good well of water, plenty of shade, and withal a beautiful place. July 20th. Sabbath at home, but not regarded here by a great many. After attending to my duties, which kept me quite busy as I was captain, first and second lieutenant, over one hundred men, I spent the balance of the time in reading and writing letters. The commissioned officers had all left us but one captain, who commanded the convalescent regiment. This fairground was occupied by General Buckner's army for a long time, and the Preston, whose part we occupied, is a wealthy citizen of Louisville, and now commands a brigade in Buckner's army. And right here I made my first acquaintance with the Greyback. I saw a small squad holding skirmish drill on a soldier's coat as he stood with his back to the sun. They look something like a mud turtle, only not so large. They have a sharp prod on the end of their tail to push with, and forty or fifty feelers to tickle with, just to let one know where they are. They are very unstable and fickle and much inclined to malicious trespass. They are tropical in their natures, always hunting for the hottest place and some of our boys say they wish they were in it. Fifteen hundred are as many as one soldier is able to pasture at the same time. While they are not profane themselves, yet they do make the boys swear more than any other animal. Sabbath again, and I feel somewhat lonesome, though surrounded by a thousand men, but I find a multitude is not always company. On the 31st, we were ordered to the city arsenal, where we turned over our Belgians, then to barrack number one, where we got a good supper, then to barrack number two, for lodging. The night was intensely hot, the barrack crowded, and the air 
vicious. I much prefer the open air to a bunk in an oven with a large crowd. August 1st, 1862 We went back to number one for breakfast, then to the arsenal and drew Belgian rifles, then boarded a train, bade Louisville goodbye, and started for Nashville at 7 a.m., 186 miles, reaching there at 6 p.m. We remained there till Sunday the 3rd, and then took a train on the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad and reached Stevenson, Alabama, 112 miles, at 8 o'clock p.m. Climbing and riding over the Cumberland Mountains was a rich experience to me. I had never seen any mountains before. All the hills, knolls, and bluffs along the rivers were mere molehills compared with the Cumberlands. Our train was loaded inside and out, and as the day was very hot, I took my place on top with twenty others. After passing Murfreesboro, fifteen or twenty miles, our car uncoupled from the train, and we were left for a full half hour in a thick wood. Here was a good chance for the guerrillas, but lucky for us, none happened to be near. On a little farther, the tender jumped the rail, and all the cars up to ours followed. Oh, what a bumping and jumping! Scarcely one of our boys was left on the train when it stopped. From Murfreesboro on to Stevenson, I counted seventeen wrecked trains and parts of trains piled up along the sides of the railroad, and every car in our train had been well riddled with bullets, showing plainly the work of the guerrillas. End of chapter 22「My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad」by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. With Company A. Chapter 23 Stevenson, Alabama, is an old town, and before the Civil War laid its blighting hand upon it, might have been a business center. One large building, a hotel, stood out quite prominently on a slight elevation some twenty rods north of the station. Not many months since, there had been some good residences with beautiful lawns, gardens, shrubbery, and shade trees. Most of the dwellings were now used for officers and soldiers' quarters and for stabling horses. The shade trees were being cut and used in building fortifications. Wide, deep trenches had been cut through gardens and yards where flowers once bloomed and shrubbery and lawns flourished. Streets and sidewalks once tread by master and slaves and mistress and maid were now crowded with army wagons, artillery, cavalry, and battalions of armed soldiers. The church, so quietly nestling at the foot of the hill, surrounded by a few evergreens where the people assembled on the Sabbath day, but a short time ago to listen to treasonable sermons of advocating war as a patriotic duty, was now empty with broken windows and doors gone. The bell still hung in the steeple. Its tongue spoke no language. Its musical tones had been succeeded by the fife and drum, the rattle of musketry, and the roar of artillery. A large army was quartered in and around the town, and in every direction I went or looked were preparations for war. Cruel, relentless war. The prayers of the succeeders were being answered. Tired with my wandering around the town, I came back to the station and began to write. But seeing an old paper lying under my seat, 
I picked it up and found it to be the Southern Presbyterian Review of January 14th, 1861, and on the first page was a sermon from Rev. Dr. Thornwell, professor of theology in the Presbyterian Seminary of Columbus, South Carolina, from which I took the time to copy one paragraph only. He says, quote, our slaves are our solemn trust, and while we have a right to use and direct their labors, we are bound to feed, clothe, and protect them, to give them the comforts of this life, and to introduce them to the hopes of a blessed immortality. They are moral beings, and it will be found that in the culture of their moral natures, we reap the largest reward from their service. The relation itself is moral, and in the tender affections and endearing sympathies it evokes, it gives scope for the most attractive graces of human character. Strange as it may sound to those who are not familiar with the system, slavery is a school of virtue, and no class of men have furnished sublimer instances of heroic devotion than slaves in their loyalty and love to their masters. We have seen them rejoice at the cradle of the infant and weep at the bier of the dead, and there are few among us who have not drawn their nourishment from their generous breasts." Unquote. If such was the teaching from those who called themselves appointed of God, to preach, quote, the gospel of peace on earth and goodwill to men, unquote. Was it at all surprising that so many people of these slave states tore down the old flag and rushed like a mad torrent into the rebellion? That secession was inaugurated without cause must ever be the verdict of history and history will forever hold John C. Calhoun, R. Barnwell Reet, Right Rev. Bishop Elliot, Rev. Dr. Thornwell, Davis, Toombs, Breckenridge, and many other statesmen, editors, ministers, members of the slaveholding forum, bar and pulpit, responsible for all the suffering, bloodshed, devastation and desolation which have come to our country. We received lodging on the first floor of the station and left Stevenson on the 6 a.m. train for Bridgeport, Alabama, where we found some of our regimental teams loaded down with supplies for camp. We followed along on foot and reached Company A in time to eat dinner with the boys who greeted us so warmly that I felt no longer among strangers, but almost among my own kindred and at home. Nearly all the company looked well, and all seemed to be well pleased with the location, which was certainly very pleasant and healthful. The company had now sixty-one present, and an aggregate membership of seventy-nine, some being recruits that had come since I left. In the afternoon, I called on the 29th Indiana and found the two Sabin boys, the two McGowan boys, Melitus and Irenus, and Captain and E.G. Melendy. Our camp was located on a gentle slope one mile west of the Tennessee and one and a half miles south of Battle Creek and about five miles north of the Alabama line at the base of what was called here the Blue Hills. About thirty rods up, quite an incline, was a small cave which would permit a person to enter for ten or twelve feet, which was as cold as an ice house and out from which poured a fountain of ice-cold water some three feet wide and several inches deep. The current was very strong, and the brook went dancing and sparkling and singing down across the valley to the Tennessee. What a beautiful place for a model home! 
Here we have a steep, rocky mountain on the west, reaching to the clouds, bold and precipitous to protect from heavy winds, a prodigal supply of pure water that could be piped to the top of the buildings, a rich and fertile valley for a mile to the front, reaching down to the river and magnificent mountain scenery beyond. Our tent was only a few rods from the house of a planter who had quite a number of slaves, and early on, my first morning there, I watched some of them as they came out of their quarters and started to their unpaid toil. There were five in this gang, three women and two men. One was a girl, about fifteen, quite tall, from all appearance purely white, straight as an arrow, and who walked with a grace and dignity not excelled by our own girls up north. Each garment worn by the three women probably cost the planter thirty cents, and the men were dressed as cheaply, all being barefooted, and all working from early morning till late at night for a bare existence, with no apparent motive, encouragement, or inspiration." Well, I thought to myself as they passed by, you can now begin to sing on the sly that good old Methodist hymn, quote, Our bondage here shall end by and by, by and by, unquote. I found our captain there with the company, the only commissioned officer present. I had not seen him since we parted on the Baltic at the landing below Donaldson. He and the first lieutenant reached the company at Shiloh a day or two after the battle and made the march with the boys from Corinth to our present camp, where the first lieutenant, while on picket, in front of the enemy was wounded by a mysterious discharge from his own revolver, the ball passing through his left hand. His resignation was immediately handed in and accepted, this time without hesitancy. On the morning I left for Nashville, he left camp for home. Our second lieutenant, though delicate in health, was with us at Donaldson and in action two days with the boys at Shiloh, but being physically unequal to the hardships and exposure, yielded to the inevitable. After the battle, he went to the hospital and was compelled to tender his resignation. The next day, but one after reaching the company, the captain informed me that a vacancy would occur in the regiment in a short time, and by date of commission and rank he would be entitled to fill the place, and in that case he must leave the company and the one now recommended for a first lieutenant would soon be commissioned captain. How shall we arrange this matter, orderly, between you and Nelson? You will have to fill out and send on the recommendation of the governor, will you not? I ask. Yes, that will be my duty. Very well, captain. Just suit yourself and the company, and I will be satisfied. I did not enlist for a commission or salary. Nelson and I will have no trouble over this matter. So a thing that had worried the captain for some time was very easily adjusted. He was able to make his promise good to Nelson and maintain his friendly relations with me. Our picket duty was now heavy, as General Bragg, commanding a large force, occupied Chattanooga, and his picket line commanded the river on the opposite side in plain view of our line. Every day men were detailed to work on the fortifications commenced by General Mitchell, and frequently the whole regiment would be ordered across the Alabama line for picket duty. From 9 a.m. until 4 p.m., the days were excessively hot. The sun poured down into the valley, and it was so shut in by the mountains that scarcely any breeze could be felt. 
On the 17th of August, 1862, our company was ordered on picket duty close to the river, opposite the enemy's reserve. About 10 a.m., a large sealed package from General Buell, directed to General Bragg, was handed to our captain by an orderly, with orders to deliver the same to the officer in command on the enemy's side. As soon as the skiff reached our landing, Almond and I stepped in with the captain, and under the protection of our white handkerchief, we reached the enemy's lines, and handed the officer our package, which was immediately forwarded to Bragg. We visited with the Johnnies some two hours. They spoke of Buell very highly as being a fine gentleman and a good general, and seemed well pleased with his manner of conducting the war. But Grant and Sherman, and, in fact, all the rest of our best and most successful generals, were butchers and brutal. However, they did concede that McClelland was equally as pacific and considerate of their rights as Buell. When the orderly returned, we were handed another large sealed package from Bragg directed to General Buell. We then bade them goodbye and returned to our reserve, forwarding the package as directed. This was on the 17th of August, 1862, remember, and on the 19th, most of Bragg's army was on our side of the river, five or six miles above. On the morning of the 20th, quite early, we received an order to pack our knapsacks, keeping out our blanket and rubber, and be ready to move on notice, in light marching order. Everything packed in our knapsacks was to be left. At 10 p.m. of this same day, we were ordered to form our company, very quietly, and take our place in the regiment and brigade. The night was very dark, and it was with great difficulty that we could find our position, and as we moved to the north and reached the bridge that crosses Battle Creek, we found it covered with green corn stalks. Then we surmised a retreat. At 2 a.m. on the 21st, we went in camp in a thick wood near Jasper, and about 8 a.m. passed through the little town to the north and soon discovered that the whole rebel army had crossed the river to our side since the 17th, and what the sealed packages that passed between Buell and Bragg had to do with this move, we were not prepared to express an opinion, or why Buell did not use his artillery and sink the whole rebel army in the river while crossing is a problem for the historian. End of chapter 23《Chapter 24 of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Buell Campaign. Chapter 24 After passing through Jasper some three miles, the front, McCook's Corps, caught up with the enemy's rear, and a lively skirmish ensued. It was now about 12 p.m., when the whole column came to a halt, giving us a chance to eat our lunch, fill our canteens, and lay down under the shade. When I first reached the regiment, the army was on half rations. Now we drew only quarter with very strict orders not to forage from the enemy. But notwithstanding the orders, we had a nice fat mutton for supper. I said to Gilbert, Be careful, the orders are very strict. If caught, it will be a serious matter. We can't save you. Well, said Gilbert, 
I think a soldier ought to have the right to defend his own life. We were just crossing the field and molesting nothing when this sheep started after me on a full run and chased me into a fence corner with her mouth wide open, and I knew from her actions she was going to bite and I struck her with my gun and accidentally killed her. But wasn't that choice mutton orderly? Did you like it? Yes, very fine, but be careful and don't let any officer see you violate the commands of General Buell. As night approached, the firing increased for an hour or so, and then subsided to ordinary skirmish and picket firing all night. From 6 a.m. on the morning of the 22nd, for two or three hours, there were rather exciting times in front, and judging from the strictness of the orders that came back to us, a general engagement seemed imminent. But towards noon, the firing quieted down, and at 1 p.m., the head of our column, McCook's command, came counter-marching back by us, and at 7 p.m. we dropped in the column and moved back through Jasper and bivouacked in the same woods that we occupied the night before. On the morning of the 23rd, our column left the Battle Creek and Jasper Road and took another leading southwest and west and northwest and reached the extreme of the valley on Sunday evening the 24th. This valley, from the pass down for four or five miles, will average a quarter to a mile wide with very productive soil and quite thickly settled. Very few, if any, slaves were owned by these people, and I was told by a very intelligent refugee, who walked along with me nearly all day, that the people of these valleys and mountains were intensely loyal. All the men, he said, had been compelled to leave their homes, to keep out of the rebel army, and were now hiding and secreting themselves in the mountains. They had signal stations where they signaled their families in the valleys, and communicated with them nearly every day. He further stated that he had not slept in a house or bed since the war began, and was now a member of the Grapevine Telegraph Company, organized for the protection of these people against squads of rebel cavalry and murderous gangs of guerrillas. All along our march up the valley, hundreds of these people came into our column for protection. We reached the extreme of the valley at the foot of the mountain a little before sundown, and soon Company A was ordered on picket duty. Here I remained on duty until 2 a.m., close by a mountain stream which, during the rainy season, might be called a river, but now only a small brook. On one side of the stream, at a bend, Tons of small cobblestone had been washed up on the bank. I felt of them, and found them to be very warm, for they had been exposed to the sun all day. So, having no blanket with me, I concluded to dig out some of the cobble and make my bed for the balance of the night. I fixed a stone for a pillow and lay down in the trough I had formed, and it was a very warm and comfortable bed though not quite as soft as mine at home. When we got back to the company, Nelson and I went to a cabin and bought a corn pone. I ate of it quite freely for my breakfast, and in a couple of hours it made me very sick. At daylight, the front of our column began to climb the mountain. At 9 a.m. our regiment started. We soon came to a field on our left, about five acres covered with army supplies, which had been set on fire and was well-nigh consumed. Army wagons and tents and everything that could be dispensed with to lighten the wagons and relieve the teams. It took two and sometimes three teams to one wagon to raise the grade 
and then frequently one man to each wheel. Occasionally there would be a level place of ten, twenty, or thirty rods, then a rocky stairway to climb with a perpendicular rise every four, six, or eight feet of from eight to twenty-four inches. This condition confronted us continually until we reached the summit about dusk, and then we moved on over a tolerably good road until twelve midnight. It was called three miles from the base to the summit on the east side, and we were from 10 a.m. till dusk making the climb. The summit was a little rolling, covered with scattering timber and clean from undergrowth. It looked to me as though the vegetable deposit had been burned off for the last hundred years, leaving the soil thin and poor. We reached the foot of the mountain on the west side at noon, and found the descent much easier, not so rocky and steep. It was called twenty-two miles over by this pass. And there, near the road, was another stream of ice-cold water pouring out from under the rock, nearly as large as the one mentioned at our camp. The country here near the mountains was level, quite thinly settled and poorly farmed, but as we moved on a few miles it was much better and quite rich, especially in stock and poultry. Our boys were all partial to fat poultry, and I don't believe that one of them was ever a Methodist preacher. Our captain was now acting lieutenant colonel and riding a horse. Nelson, acting captain, in command of the company, and I, first lieutenant. We were still getting but one-fourth rations, and forbidden to forage from the enemy under a heavy penalty, but our boys had keen appetites. We had thirty or forty expert foragers, and they were organized in reliefs of three and five, taking their regular turns with strict rules that must be observed with passwords and signals. Orders from Buell were very strict and were read to us every other day. The following is a copy of the one Nelson read to us that morning at roll call. Quote, Order number 44. Company officers will be held strictly responsible for the conduct of the men under their command and under no circumstances will they be allowed to loiter, and if any soldier is found foraging from the enemy, the officer or officers in command shall immediately put such soldier under arrest and report him to the general commanding. Signed by the adjutant. By order of Don Carlos Buell, general, commissioned. Unquote. After reading, all were still for a minute. Then one of the boys spoke, quote, By Jiminy, ain't that a corker? Unquote. The order was surely a corker and had a very salutary effect on the boys the fore part of the day. But along toward night, the poultry began to show, and when we went in camp, there were some thirty chickens. The boys were a little more prudent and careful than usual to keep them quiet. The poultry was dressed and cooked in places not visited by Buell's orderlies, and divided up among the boys so that none went hungry. We had some boys in our company with wonderful endurance. They could march all day and at night convass the country for two miles round camp bring in a small beef, mutton, or hog, which was dressed and cut up before they came in. Each mess got a share, and Nelson and I were careful not to offend by refusing. They all enjoyed the adventures, as well as the diet. The third day, after leaving the mountains, toward evening, every third man was carrying one or two chickens, and occasionally a nice turkey. Buell's orderly rode along from the rear to the front, and as he passed us, the poultry 
then a little noisy, attracted his notice. He took out his passbook and asked Nelson the company and regiment. Nelson responded promptly, Company G, 13th Kentucky, which, by the way, was the 3rd Regiment to the front. In a half hour, the front filed to the right, and we went in camp, and some of our boys took all the poultry and ran to a thick grove close by. Neither Nelson nor I wore straps, nor carried a sword at this time. Soon we saw the same orderly coming, and Nelson skipped out. "'Who commands this company?' he asked. "'Captain S. I. Do,' was answered. "'Where is he now?' "'Has just gone to Buell's headquarters.' Off he rode and soon returned and asked, "'Has your captain returned?' "'Not yet, sir,' said Hutchins. "'Say, young man, you're just the fellow I saw carrying one turkey and two chickens.' "'I don't know how he could,' said Bence. "'He carried a sick man's gun, cartridge box, and gun besides his own load. "'Where is the sick man? I want to see him.' "'Miller, a thin, pale-looking fellow,' But all muscle, good for a mile run after a sheep or hog, got up very feebly and replied in a faint minor tone, I'm the sick fellow, sir, and I'm played out. Can't you give me a furlough and let me go home? Where is your first lieutenant? He's just gone out on picket. Where's your second lieutenant? Ain't got any. One of you boys told me that this was company... G, 13th Kentucky. No, sir, said Nick. That was one of Company G's boys that happened to be with us then. Why didn't you make the correction then? Thunder, suppose you wanted him. Now, look here, boys. This is a serious matter. I know that you are the very boys that had 38 chickens and one turkey less than one hour before we went into camp. "'Well, by thunder, orderly,' said Mike. "'Get off your horse and search our quarters, "'and I'll agree to eat all you'll find. "'We haven't seen a chicken today "'except those carried by the 13th Kentucky and 6th Ohio.' "'The orderly turned to Hutchins and said, "'You are the fellow that had the turkey, "'and this company had the chickens.' but I must say that you are the slickest lot of liars in the Army of Ohio. He put spurs to his horse and rode off. I took no part in the controversy. It was a delicate matter, but I was completely stunned by the prompt answer to every question by a lot of boys who would scorn to tell a lie or do anyone a personal injury. The play could not have been better acted out if it had been all committed and planned in advance. And Miller, who could run like a greyhound, played his part so well. I turned and walked off, for my face would betray them. End of chapter 24《My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad》by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Buell Campaign Chapter 25 The next evening, after a long, hard, dusty day's march, we went in camp on the right, in a nice, thick grove of young timber, the boys were all tired and glad to lie down. I had made all my details for guard and picket duty, and while I was resting, the planter, living on the opposite side of the road and a little to the east, came into camp and asked the guards to guard his bees. We referred him to the adjutant who was nearby. Our adjutant had been detailing guards to protect rebels and their property until protection to men in open rebellion against the government seemed no longer to be wise or prudent. He said to the planter, Stranger, 
Our boys have had a hard march through the deep dust with scarcely any water this hot day. I don't like to compel this extra duty. I hardly think your bees will be disturbed. I can't risk them, sir. If you can't send them, I'll see the general. The adjutant turned to Nelson and asked if he could furnish men to guard this man's bees. Yes, perhaps if they will volunteer, but I don't feel like compelling men as tired as ours are now to guard the property of rebels. He then spoke to the boys and asked them if four would volunteer to guard this planter's bees. Yes, they said, and John, Josh, Benz, and Lou stepped out. We'll go. We ain't tired. How many swarms of bees have you, Mr. Planter? I have forty, sir. All right, I'll see that they are there in time. Thank you, sir, said the planter. At 8 p.m., I went with the guards and found the forty hives as the planter represented, sitting close to a tight board fence covered with a narrow board roof and open on the east side, in plain view of the house. As I left, I said, Boys, arrange the time to suit yourselves. From 8 to 4 a.m. is only eight hours, just two hours each. But that's rather tough after such a hard day's march. But, said John, we don't mind it. We rather like this job. Be careful, boys, I said. Don't let anyone, not even the owner, come inside this park. All right, said John. We'll take good care of these bees, you bet. I was up early the next morning and found the woods full of bees and was puzzled to know what it meant. I thought I saw a part of a wrecked hive up towards the generals and followed along the path through the grove and found a portion of a hive and kept on and there seemed to be more and more and the air was full of bees. Within two rods of the general's horses were two wrecked hives, and his horses were in perfect panic. Four darkies were fighting bees and trying to quiet the horses. I hurried back to our quarters and waked up Nelson. Nelson, I'm afraid our boys have got their foot in it this time. I feel uneasy. See, the bees and broken hives are scattered all along the path to the general's horses, and it takes four darkies to hold them. Well, said Nelson, you watch. They'll slip out, never fear. Don't be alarmed. The boys came in in a few minutes, and close upon their heels was the old planter, puffing and almost out of breath. He was too excited to talk plain, but was yet able to swear profusely. Good morning, I said, but he paid no attention to my salutation, but just kept on with the most absurd and malignant profanity that he knew how to use. Hold on, stranger, just cool off, if you please. I wish to inform you, sir, that such profanity is not allowed here. You are talking to gentlemen. Now, please don't forget who you are addressing. Well, your guard stole ten swarms of my bees last night. Excuse me, but I'm so mad I can't help it, and I want my bees. You can have your bees, said Nelson. All you have to do is catch them. I want my pay for them. Will you take the oath of allegiance? Nelson asked. Then you both of allegiance. I spoke to Nelson in a low tone, but loud enough for him to hear. I think we had better arrest and take him along. Oh, no, I beg your pardon. I'll cool down and quit swearing. The guards, who had all the time been listening, came up close, and Nelson asked, John, do you know anything about this honey being taken last night? Not until I came in camp and saw the bees. My trick came off first. Josh, do you know anything about it? Only what I've heard here, my trick was second. 
Gilbert, what have you to say, sir? I was on from twelve to two, and I know a heap. Well, out with it. The beat, he is about fifteen rods long, and I walk slowly up and down, and when on about half an hour, I thought I heard something down at the lower end of the hives. I found two of the general's hostlers and drove them away and shut the gate. I suppose that would end it. Well, Lou, when were you on and what did you see? I was on from two to four, and the first time I went down, I found four hives gone and three of the general's hostlers after some more. I drove them off with my bayonet and told them if they came there again, I'd blow a hole through them, and I suppose they were gone for good. But just before I left, I discovered that ten hives were gone. Well, Mr. Planter, I think it's quite plain where your honey has gone, and now, if you will go along with me, I'll show you. And then I took him along the path to near the general's tent and counted ten hives that had been wrecked. Well, well, Colonel, said the planter. I was sure those guards stole my honey. Tell them I beg pardon. You know where they went now, and you can tell the general you want your pay. We had no evidence who took the honey, but we do know that Company A had honey to throw at the birds. As I returned, Nelson said, We had sharp ones at West Point, but none that could equal our boys in getting out of a tight place. I don't blame the boys. I wish they had taken more from the old rebel. The old man has two sons and a guerrilla gang, so one of his darkies told me while you were gone. This was a great country for choice peaches, and the trees were loaded down with delicious fruit. The next morning we were passing by a large orchard in which were guards stationed inside of the enclosure. The front of the column had filed to the right on another road running due north. Ten of our boys, when they noticed the guards, very quietly slipped on their bayonets and before Nelson or I noticed the move, leaped the fence and started after the guards who had their haversacks full and ran across to the opposite side. Our boys had saved some travel and brought in all the peaches we wanted. After we left the mountains, the boys had lived high, notwithstanding the orders of Buell. The next day, about 4 p.m., Company A was well loaded with poultry. Buell's orderly came along and ordered Colonel Stoughton to put every man under arrest that had any poultry. All the boys, except Lou, heard the order and dropped their birds, and when the colonel rode back, he found none. But Lou, not hearing the order, held on to his turkey, and the colonel ordered him under arrest and then said to him privately, You go back and settle the whole bill with the planter. It's making a dangerous muss. The boys went in a little heavy. Have you got any money? The colonel asked. Yes, said Lou. I have a twenty-dollar bill. That's plenty. Make the planter give you a receipt in full before you pay a cent. Settle the best you can and report to me, and we'll all chip in. So Lou went back to the planter's house under guard. The guard stood at the door with bayonets fixed while he went in the house to settle. After considerable figuring and sparring as to the amount of damage, Lou offered to pay fourteen dollars and no more, and laid down his twenty-dollar bill on the table, while a cavalry officer was present, wrote out the receipt, and the planter made his ex witnessed by the officer. Then the planter counted out the change in Confederate script, which Lou refused. But the planter insisted that it was all he had, and that it was worth more than our money. Lou parleyed with him until he got tired, 
picked up his $20 bill and receipt and leaped through the open door, followed by the guards yelling, Halt! Halt! Or we'll shoot! Lou knew they wouldn't and slipped in the 26th Kentucky, where he remained till the planter got tired hunting for him. The next day, Lou made his report to the colonel, and after telling him how he settled for the whole company and got a receipt in full, the colonel enjoyed a hearty laugh. End of chapter 25Chapter 26 of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Buell Campaign. Chapter 26. On the morning of the 2nd of September, 1862, I was quite sick and remained in the ambulance all day. We went in camp within four miles of Murfreesboro, and the next day made the march through the town and beyond a mile or so where we went in camp for the night. Going to our surgeon for medicine soon after, he said, I shall send you and two of your boys downtown to the hospital, you're not fit to make a march tomorrow. In a day or two, when you get rested, get transportation and meet the regiment in Nashville. The boys and I had a good supper and each a good bed and night's rest and a splendid breakfast. In the morning, we felt so much better that we concluded to go to Nashville that day. I went to the post quartermaster for transportation. He gave me a card directed to Colonel Hayes, commanding the post. I crossed the railroad, then climbed the elevation to the officer's tent, saluted the guard, showed him my order, and he passed me in. As I entered the tent, the colonel turned around from his desk. I took off my hat with my left hand and saluted him with my right, then I told him that two others and myself were left at the hospital last night with orders to procure transportation and report at Nashville as soon as able. He looked at me in a savage manner and said, Young man, take your hand off that chair and stand up in the position of a soldier. I obeyed most promptly but was somewhat confused. Now go on and tell me what you want, the colonel commanded. I repeated the same thing again, but in my confusion placed my left hand on the chair. Take your hand off that chair, sir, and stand, as I told you, in the position of a soldier. Of course I obeyed. I was there alone, sick and nearly exhausted, by many days' march through excessive heat and thick, choking dust. I repeated for the third time what I wanted, and was warm enough to stand up in the position of a soldier. He then wrote an order on the post-commissary for transportation for three. When I reached Captain Brown, the commissary, I found him a jolly man. As he returned my salute, he said, Sit down. You look tired and sick. What can I do for you? I handed him the order, and he handed me three tickets. I then related my experience with Colonel Hayes. Nothing new. Just like him, he said. He is a regular and acts as if a volunteer was entitled to no more consideration than a mule. I have been hoping for some time that some soldier would slap his face or knock him down. I have frequently had all I could do to keep from it and would walk away for fear that I might do so. I succeeded in getting my two sick boys on the 10 a.m. train, and we reached the city at 2 p.m., where we found some 60 boys of our regiment who, being unable to march, 
were sent through on the train from Battle Creek, all quartered quite near the station. Clark, our quartermaster sergeant, was in command of the squad. Here I had a good chance to rest until the 7th of September, when our teams reached us at 11 a.m. We then loaded everything belonging to the regiment and drove out to the northeast about two miles, where we met the army and fell into our respective places, marched back through the city, crossed the Cumberland on the Trestle Bridge, and marched about five miles on the Louisville and Nashville Pike and went in camp. For many days the weather had been extremely hot, no rain to even lay the dust, and water was difficult to get, except from artificial pools made by the planters for their stock, and this was warm and filthy. The limestone pike was ground into fine flour by cavalry, artillery, and army wagons. This dust was light, covering the army shoe, and in ten minutes after the army began to move, a thick, heavy cloud of limestone dust, which we all had to breathe, enveloped our column from front to rear, while our tongues and lips were parched with thirst. Those having weak lungs were the first to suffer seriously. William McMinn was the first. On the 10th we reached Michaelville, and on the 11th about sunrise crossed the Kentucky line and camped in a nice walnut grove where we remained till the morning of the 13th. The country here was full of gorillas, very rich, beautiful, and fertile, but entirely destitute of hogs, sheep, cattle, and poultry so our boys subsisted on quarter rations, and Buell's order, number 44, was wholly unnecessary. On the 13th the heat was oppressive, with not a particle of wind to move the dust, which was like a thick, dark cloud through which we were compelled to move, while suffering intensely all the time from thirst. Looking off to the right, over the level country, was another cloud of dust. The rebel army was now up even with us, only one or one and a half miles to the east. They, too, were raising dust on the road, running parallel with ours. We marched only twelve miles and went in camp on the bank of, quote, blind, sinking, or lost river. Unquote, within three miles of Bowling Green. This stream at this place came out with great force into a deep gulch full forty feet below the surface and ran rapidly down the gulch full fifty rods and then entered a cave some three rods wide at the base and twenty or more feet to the arch above. There was now the old ruins of a still built under the cave many years ago. The water was very cold and delicious and a luxury to us after marching so many days through the dust with parched tongues and burning thirst. While here I called on the 29th Indiana and found the McGowans, the Sabins, and several others from Steuben County. I was quite anxious to see Bowling Green for I had heard it described very minutely some five years ago by a Miss Quincy, a slave woman who stopped with us four days while making a race for liberty. With her was a Miss Florence Belmont, about eighteen years of age, a white slave, beautiful and cultured, whose sufferings until she made her escape would soften a heart of stone. We remained in camp here till 4 p.m. on the 16th, when we marched down through the city, and with no trouble I located the home where Miss Quincy was born, 
and where she served her master faithfully till he died. But when she learned that she must soon be sold at a public sale with her master's estate, she started for Canada. Yes, there stood the mansion in the same direction and at about the same distance she described. Ten rods back from the street, the horse barn, the poultry park, the well-kept lawn, the maple trees in front, all filled the description she gave. I was not surprised that when she left, she left in tears. It was a beautiful place, a model home. We encamped on the opposite side of Barren River and left very early without rations for breakfast, dinner, or supper, and had nothing to eat till 3 a.m. on the 18th when our wagon train caught up with us. On the morning of the 18th, we began to move at sunrise, and when we reached Bell's Tavern, we discovered we were only a few hours behind the rear of Bragg's army. He came in from the east at the tavern, and our column came to a halt, and our front began skirmishing with the enemy's rear. We probably moved about ten miles in all day, and at night lay down on our arms, ready for action any minute. On the 19th, it was, Forward by column, halt, form line of battle, throw out a skirmish line. Forward by the front, halt for skirmishers to drive back the enemy's line. Forward by the front, and at dusk, halt for the night and lay on our arms. All day of the 20th, we were held in line of battle and ordered to draw three days' rations on a one-quarter issue, while we could hear the heavy cannonading at Murfordsville, where nearly all of Bragg's army was compelling the surrender of 6,000 men who were trying to hold the fort till Buell would rescue them. Lou was excused from the line about 9 p.m., it was very dark. He went to the left and rear some eighty rods and found a cow yard built of railroad ties, climbed the fence, felt around, and found a cow tied. He was hungry. Milk was good enough for him, so with one hand he held his canteen and with the other reached under the cow and instead of getting hold of the milk depository, grabbed another man's hand that at that instant was reached in under from the other side. The other fellow jumped and yelled murder and climbed over the fence, and when he came to the line declared he had seen a ghost. Lou got his canteen full of milk and declared that the other fellow was Johnny Newman of Company H. End of chapter 26。Chapter 27 of My Story of the Civil War and the Underground Railroad by Marvin Benjamin Butler this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Underground Railroad Chapter 27 As the Underground Railroad, and a very few of its passengers will be mentioned in two or three of the succeeding chapters in this volume, it will perhaps be well to give a brief description of that singular secret, and to many mysterious mode of transportation. It is very certain that this company was not a formal organization with officers of different rank, a regular membership, and a treasury from which to meet expenses. A terminology, it is true, sprang up in connection with the work of the road, and one could hear of stations, keepers, agents, and even presidents, but these titles were all figurative terms with other expressions from the convenient vocabulary of steam railways, and while they were useful to save circumlocution, 
They commended themselves to the friends of the slave by helping to satisfy the minds of the public. The work and expense was all voluntary, and on every line there was a clear understanding between the operators that nothing, not even sickness and death, should interfere with transportation. Each family had near friends, who, in an emergency, could immediately give the aid and cheerfully bear a portion of the burden in this labor. The system was organized in an early day and grew as rapidly as the public sentiment became educated on the subject of slavery. For more than sixty years preceding the Great Civil War, all the legislation touching this question was dictated and controlled by the slave states. Such was the agitation and discussion of all these issues then, compromises and fugitive slave laws, that the slaves, though apparently dumb, heard much and understood more than their masters knew, and while their chains were being more tightly riveted, they were patiently listening to the mad talk of their masters as they were constantly demanding laws that would compel the return of their property and punish more surely and severely all those who assisted in any way in their escape. So as more stringent laws were passed, forbidding one from giving food, clothing, and warmth, to a poor, oppressed, shivering soul at the door, or even a cup of cold water, in the name of Jesus, these underground lines grew and multiplied, starting out from every border slave state. The Ohio was no impediment, for in secret coves and bends were canoes and skiffs owned and used by free Negroes to aid the more unfortunate. As the lines extended, the number of operators increased until more than 5,000 families were engaged in this labor of love. Considering the kind of labor performed, the expense incurred and the danger involved, one must be impressed with the unselfish devotion to principle of these men and women thus engaged. There was for them no outward honor, no material recompense, but instead such contumely and seeming disgrace as can now scarcely be comprehended. Nevertheless, they were rich in faith and courage, and their hospitality was equal to every emergency. They cheerfully gave aid and comfort to the downtrodden, and despised and oppressed, expecting no honor, reward, or favor from the unfriendly and prejudiced. As we now recollect, they were often treated with contempt and denounced by the pro-slavery party here in the North as black abolitionists and nigger thieves, while it was verily true that not one percent of the operators ever crossed the line of a slave state, or conversed with a slave while in the service of his master. Neither did they all belong to the abolition party. Only a small minority in the Middle West and West, and you would be very much surprised if now you should learn that some of your oldest and best neighbors and friends who were once operators of the Underground Railroad who respected your opinions so much that they never broached the subject to you, while you denounced the humanitarian work in which they were engaged as more reprehensible than horse-stealing. Yes, it was nigger-stealing. Are we now satisfied with the verdict of history? It was not deemed wise or prudent by the operators on these secret lines to meddle with slavery, where it existed, or entice or abduct slaves from their masters. This was generally done by free Negroes and slaves, and quite frequently by the sons of slaveholders 
who had been educated in the free states. Such was John Fairfield, born in Virginia, the son of a very wealthy slaveholder who piloted away many hundred slaves to Canada. This same John Fairfield came to our station late in the fall of 1856, with twenty men, four women, and four children. They were hotly pursued for many days, and finally reached a cave in the mountains, familiar to him, where he kept them secreted while the pursuers fired the forest and searched the country for weeks. Neither Whittier in his poems nor Harriet Beecher Stowe in her novels imagined a more picturesque incident than the crossing of the Detroit River by Fairfield with his gang of twenty-eight rescued souls, singing, quote, I'm on my way to Canada where colored men are free, unquote. And when they reached the promised land and all kneeled down and thanked God for their deliverance from bondage, Fairfield exclaimed, quote, Now this one scene has doubly paid me for risking my life, my liberty, and my fortune for God's very poorest of the poor, unquote. The first slaves that he abducted belonged to his father, the next lot to his uncle, and after that he traveled all over the slave states, and when he found a cruel and brutal master, he relieved him of his slaves. No abolitionist raised and living in the North could equal him in his hatred and denunciation of slavery. At his majority, he inherited a fortune from his mother, which he assured us he had dedicated with his life to his master. He regarded the fortune as blood money, as it came from the sale of a large plantation of slaves. He had been shot at several times, and at that time there was a reward of five hundred dollars offered for his body. Up to that time, he assured me that he had never lost one fugitive. Running north through the state of Indiana from the Ohio River, we had three main lines with many cross-sections, joining them together so that either could be selected or, if headed off on one, the engineer could cross over to another. The eastern line on which our station was located started from Cincinnati, passing through Richmond, Winchester, Portland, Decatur, Fort Wayne, Kendallville, Salem Station, Orland, Coldwater, ending at Battle Creek, Michigan. The middle route started from four different points on the Ohio, Lawrenceburg, Madison, New Albany, and Leavenworth, converging at Indianapolis, then on through Westfield, Logansport, Plymouth, South Bend, Niles, Michigan, to Battle Creek. The western route started from Evansville, passing through Vincennes, Terre Haute, Bloomingdale, Crawfordsville, Darlington, Lafayette, Rensselaer, South Bend, here converging with the middle line and ending at Battle Creek. From Battle Creek, Michigan, there were two main lines used, one leading northeast through Lansing to Flint, Michigan, and from thence directly east, crossing the St. Clair River at Port Huron to Sarna, Canada. The other more frequently used ran directly east through Jackson, Ann Arbor, to the Detroit River, crossing at Windsor, Canada. Not one of all these operators or families that I ever met or knew was in any sense disloyal to the government. None that I ever heard of joined the, quote, the Knights of the Golden Circle, unquote, and none, I am sure, gave aid and encouragement to the rebellion, but on the contrary, 
they were among the first to rush to arms to save our Union from disruption and our flag from disgrace. Of the lines in other states I have little knowledge, but have been told that they were run on the same plan as ours. The stations in our state were, if convenient, placed from ten to fifteen miles apart, so that when the roads were good, thirty miles could be driven in one night. If bad, the conductor would stop at a by station. The conveyance was a double carriage or two-horse wagon, whichever was the most convenient. End of chapter 27